Welcome to Old Time Rewind. I'm your host, Raven. Get comfy, get cozy. Tonight's Rewind is... Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Clay Richards. Clay Richards. Age 31. 31. Height 6 feet. Eyes brown. Hair red. Eyes brown, hair red. Hey, how'd you like me to print his picture on these notices? I got a woodcut. Well, let me show you. Ernie! Yeah? That's your marshal a copy of that front page. Interviewing Clay's wife yesterday, I noticed a tintype on the mantle. Their wedding photograph. So, first thing you know, I snitched it. It's very thoughtful. Yeah. Oh, I'll take it, Ernie. Yeah, here. And then I propped it up in front of me and carved me this woodcut. Ain't she prime? Ain't she just elegant? Real elegant. Good likeness, don't you think? Of course, he was seven or eight years younger with us. Yeah, it's a good likeness. Cuts his hair short and Doesn't hard. show what makes a law-abiding man like him try to rob a bank. Doesn't look like a man who murdered an old cashier and a Chinese cook who just happened to be there. But it's a good likeness. Yes, sir, it is. A picture like this sure dresses up the front page, don't it? Yeah, it's a little masterpiece, Mr. Hightower. A notable contribution to the culture of Dodge City. Well, thank you, Marshal. Does fetch the eye, don't it? I'm printing an extra 500 copies of the weekly, and I bet I sell them all. Too bad the cashier's shot went wild. If he'd managed to kill Clay or even wing him, why, I bet I could sell a thousand extra copies. We must be thankful for the blessings we do receive, Mr. Hightower. Oh, I am, Marshal, I am. Why, just before it happened yesterday afternoon, I didn't know what I was going to fill my columns with. And then, like manna from heaven... Two murders and a bank robbery. Attempted bank robbery, Mr. Hightower. He turned and ran for he got his hands on so much as a dollar. Yes. Still as you say, like man. Dylan, I... I I'm talking to... business. What is it, Chester? Well, it can wait, I guess, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, print Clay's picture on those notices, Mr. Hightower. Oh, where were we? Uh, eyes brown, hair red. Oh, yes. Also known as Red, Bricktop, and Sorrow. He uh, didn't answer to no other nicknames, did he? No, that's what they called him. All right, then in big letters, $400 reward. Dead or alive. And at the bottom, apply Matt Dillon, Marshall, Dodge City. Mm -hmm. Uh, Print 200 copies. How soon can I send Chester over for him? This afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Hightower. Chester. Think those posters will do any good? Richards is probably over the line into Oklahoma or Colorado by now. And Strawberry Roan, his is the fastest in the county. He has no money. He panicked and ran out of the bank before he got a penny. I think he'll try to get help from his wife or brother or friend the first chance he has, maybe tonight. I say he's around here somewhere. I, uh, I'm sorry I turned on you like that, Chester. Why, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. Out all night with a posse, no sleep, man's bound to touch it. No, it's not that. It's, it's the, the way, it's the way people use a thing like this. The men riding posse last night, they enjoyed it as though they were hunting fox or possum. High tower back there, he acts like it was a birthday treat, specially gotten up for him. Everybody finds a way to use it. Uh, what, what was it you wanted to tell me? Hmm? Oh, I, I got a kid, a, a little boy, locked up in the cell. Oh. He run away from home, back in Cottonwood. Ed Slade turned him over to me when he come through on the stagecoach just now. Kid about 12 years old. Who's is he? Widow woman, Miss Bonnie. She runs a boarding house in Cottonwood. Ed says the kid's always running away a little while, I guess. 
He flagged Ed for a ride on the road halfway between there and here. Soon as Ed seen him stand there with his bundle on his shoulder, he knowed what he was up to. So he told Kid he'd help him and then turn him over to us when he got here. All right, we'll send a telegram to the mother to come fetch him. Well, come on in, Chester, and shut the door. Mr. Dillon? You're letting in every horse fly in Kansas. Mr. Dillon, I think you better cancel the order for them notices. What? The Dutchman's coming up the street, and he's leading a strawberry roan, and Clay Richards is draped across his back. Like a sack of wheat across the saddle. Last time I saw him, two days ago. He was standing at the bar laughing his head off. A sack of wheat across the saddle. And followed by half the saloon bums and loafers in town. All right, Chester, make him keep back. All right, now stand back, you fellas. Come on now, back. Stand back. Ziegler. How did it happen, Ziegler? My goat, my old billy goat, he pushes open the fence last night and runs away. Forget your goat. What about Clay? Yeah, I, I tell you. This morning, I go to look for the gold. I walk here, there, from near the river. I see Clay. He sits there. I say, hello, Clay. The gate. You I'm dirty here. Dutchman. You know the dog? Clay was your best friend. He helped you buy your farm, so you kill him for me. All right, all of you. Keep back, everybody. Clay? Me? No, no. My brother, he was like... We was in the war together. Peter, listen. You kill him for the war. Not so. I kill nobody. Not, not since Gettysburg. Clay is dead already when I find him. I don't even own a pistol. Ziegler, inside, quick. Yeah, yeah. Chester, give me a hand with Clay. All right, all of you. Listen up. Shut up! I will not tolerate a disturbance. You know me. I got him, Chester. Take his leg. All right, kick the door shut. Marshal, I don't kill Clay. On this table, Chester. What'd you do with Clay's gun? His holster's empty. Gun? Clay's? I ain't got it. I don't even own one. Just to see if it slipped out. While His we holster were... was empty coming up the street. First thing I noticed. Maybe it's yeah. over on the... Another customer? Why, oh, that's three in less than a day. Oh, bountiful harvest. My fees this month will keep me in luxury. In luxury. Doc, I uh, want to have an inquest as soon as possible. Well, as soon as I finish the autopsy. Shouldn't take long with the practice I've had this week. Huh? <laughs> no. Uh, late afternoon all right with you? I'll take him up to my office right now. No, thank you, Chester. I can carry him all by myself here. You just open the door there like a good fella. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Marshal, tell the city fathers I'd like to make a deal when the corpses are as famous as this one. <laughs> Back in 53 in San Francisco, a fellow I knew earned a fortune, exhibiting the head of Joaquin Marietta. Tell them if they let me keep the remains... I'll do the autopsies for nothing. Shut the door, Chester. Ziegler, where is it you met Clay on the river? By the fort. This side, by the fort. Right out there, Chester, and see if you can find Clay's gun. Maybe he dropped it when he was shot. I did not shoot Clay. Sure. I did not. I had no reason to. I did not. I did not. Now, you listen to me. Maybe you think Dodge has got so big, I don't know about everything that goes on here. Well, if you do, you're wrong. If you think I don't know about the bank having an overdue mortgage on your farm, you're wrong. $400 is reason enough for a struggling farmer like you. No. I could not do such a thing. I, I am a human being. To a peace officer, Ziegler, that's enough grounds for suspicion. But whether you did it or not, will be decided at your trial. In the meantime, you just stop yammering about it. Trial? Me? Even when I shoot somebody, I stand trial. If they find it's justifiable homicide, and they probably will, Clay being a wanted man, then he'll let you off. And if not... Please, I am permitted to go now. Go? Are you crazy? I found this stock. I, I must look after it. You sit right down. Do you want to be lynched? You're trying to get yourself murdered? Have you forgotten about Clay's brother, Adam? Adam would not believe I shot him. What difference does it make whether he believes it or not? His brother's been killed. Everybody's looking to him to do something about it, and he knows it. 
You want me to guess where he is right this minute? He's in one of them saloons lapping up courage to come in here and ask me to give you to him for a present. You want to know who's with him? Ever loafer, ever bum, ever slob in town. Slapping him on the back and telling him what a shame it is. Taking him on to kill you so that they can have some excitement and some fun. Well, maybe you deserve killing, but it's my job to uphold the law, and I'm not letting you out of here. What? I tell you, you might must... spend your time trying to think up a better story. That is, if you intend to stay in this town. All right, now think back. Didn't Clay go for his gun before you shot him? I tell you, I didn't. If I'm not under arrest, you have no right to keep me here. I got to look after my farm. I go. All right, Chester, lock him up. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Come on now, Ziggy. Help me, senior. Help me, senior. Step out, Sonny. This cage is bespoke. Who's in there, Chester? Yeah, that little old runaway from Cottonwood. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Come over here, son. Come over here to me. I know who you are. <laughs> you do, do you? You bet. You're Matt Dillon. <laughs> Guilty. I know you right off. He just pointed out to me one day back home. Killer says you was the fastest gun thrower in Kansas. <laughs> Wyatt Earp wouldn't be awful interested to hear that, I'm afraid. Killer says you was faster than older. Faster than Wild Bill Hickok and Hay City and Bat Masterson or any of them. How many fellas have you killed? You don't keep score, son. It's something you try to forget. Not me. Someday I'll be famous like you. And for every feller I kill, I'll, I'll put a notch on my gun. People see those notches and they'll know they better not try. Why'd you run away from home, bub? Don't you know your mother's likely to worry about you? Oh, she won't worry. She's too busy working. You ain't gonna make me go back, are you? You wouldn't do that, would you? Well... Because it wouldn't stop me for long. I'd only run away again. Oh, where are you off to in such a sweat? Oh, Texas, California, Mexico. Fella can accomplish things there, not like living in old cottonwood. If you let me go, someday when I'm famous, you can tell people you helped get me started. Well, well, that's that's a pretty strong inducement. Um, I'll have to think about it for a while. And uh, look, uh, while I'm making up my mind, I I want you to give me your word. Word of a man who'll be famous someday that uh, he won't try to run away from me. (laughs) Otherwise, I'll have to have Chester lock you up again. I'll shake on that. (laughs) Good, good. Uh, Chester... I want you to go look for Clay's gun. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. And uh, on the way, stop off and send that uh, telegram. You know? Hmm? Oh, that telegram. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'll Where's that Ziegler? Line. It's all right, Chester. Go ahead. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Where's that murdering dog? Oh, there you are, you... Not a for... single step further, Adam. I want him, Dillon. He murdered Clay, shot him down without giving him a chance. How do you know? Because Clay wouldn't have let anyone catch him off guard except a friend. A friend. Now, Dylan, give me that Dutchman. Try to take him. It's like that? It's like that. And it's true what the fellas say. You made a deal with the Dutchman to give him the reward and protect him if he'd kill Clay for you. That was the deal, was it? Yeah. The fellas say why I'd make such a deal? Dylan, it ain't no longer a secret around town that you and Francie want each other. But Clay was in the way. You had him killed so you could get his wife. Do you deny it? No. No. It'll serve as well as any other crazy story to work you up. You think you're safe behind that star, don't you? Well, Clay had friends, lots of them. I'm coming back with them, friends, and we'll get the Dutchman and you and anyone else who tries to stop us. All right, Adam. I'll be waiting. Yeah. You wait. I almost seen something pretty just then, didn't I, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, almost. About another pint of whiskey ought to do it. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, many radio shows win high popularity with the prizes and cash they give away. But there's one show that's tops because the head man gives away as little as possible. What other radio program could it be but 
the Jack Benny Show, so be listening. Here's the second act of Gunsmoke. Son? You say something, Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, open my drawer in front of you there. You'll find a small bottle of oil in there. No, no, the one to the right. Yeah, that's it. Now, bring a little brush, too, huh? Here it is. Thanks, bub. It's the right nice gun you have. Yeah, it's not bad, but a little stiff. Just a little stiff. Don't it have a trigger? I never seen no gun without a trigger before. Oh, you remove a trigger or a tie it back against a guard. And all you have to do is, uh, thumb a hammer. Yeah, like that. It's faster. <laughs> yeah, that's better now. Remove the trigger. I remember that. What in the world for? Well, oh, I remember everything you told me. About the Texas holster and the spring holster and the double roll and filing off the site. It's just me, Mr. Dillon. Oh, any luck, Chester? No, sir, not any. I went to the store first and asked Mr. Denton what kind of ammunition Clay Richard used to buy, and he told me Clay had a double action forty-four. I scarred that riverbank a half mile each way from the ford and not a sign of it. I got that telegram off. You know who ought to be here pretty soon. It's only seven, eight miles from... Is that fire in town? Funeral services for Mr. Grinnell, the cashier. So soon? It's awful hot weather. Yeah. Um, any of your guns need oiling? Just I don't think so. You sure? When Adam left, he said he'd be coming back. With some friends. I know. I stopped at the Olive Organza just now to rinse out my mouth. Adam was there talking mighty ugly and mighty big. He's got a sizable following. Uh, when do you think? Any minute now, Mr. Dillon. It want me to take Bob out of here to one of the hotels, maybe? I want to see no, him. No, I think you'll be safer here, Chester, behind stone walls and dodging about the streets rubbernecking. You keep your head down, sonny. You hear? There's a... Matt! Matt, i got to talk to you. She ought to be in mourning. If she cared for Clay at all anymore, she ought to be in black. Matt. Oh, Lord, I find her more beautiful all the time. Matt, have you heard what they're saying? What are they saying, Francie? That you and me, that, that you made Pete Ziegler kill him because of... I'm sorry that got back to you, Francie. It's all over Dodge. Adam almost strangled me before they dragged him off. Francie, I didn't shoot Clay. Francie, I beg you, believe me. Now it's the... Shut up, Ziegler. Please, Shut up, or I'll cook you to death. Francis, just one of those crazy stories. They needed one, and they made one up. But, Matt, everyone believes it. On my way down here, people were pointing, whispering. Old women clucking their tongues at me. They believe it. They'll forget it as soon as this is over. They'll remember that even if we once did go with each other, it was finished and done with even before the war ended, before you even met Clay. No, they won't forget it. For the rest of my life, as long as I stay here, oh, I'll... Hold it a minute, Francie. Yeah, Doc, what is it? Oh, uh, am I interrupting? What is it, Doc? Uh, our topsy's finished. I examined his liver and lights. His this story. is Mrs. Richards, Doc. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I'm sure I have meant no disrespect for the departed. Well? Well, Clay was shot, all right, but from the nature of the wound and the coagulation of the blood, I'd say it happened sometime yesterday. I'd say the cashier's bullet didn't go wild after all. How could a dead man gallop away? Well, the wound wasn't what killed Clay. The ball hit the rib case and it bounced off. Twenty-two caliber it was. And what did kill him was the stab in the back, right through the spine. Inflicted sometime this morning. Now, near as I can judge, by a small blade, oh, two or three inches long. It could have been a Barlow knife. Thanks, Doc. Yeah, please accept my condolences, Mr. Richard. You call the inquest any time you're ready, Marshal. Chester... Close the door. You see? You see, I didn't do it. I didn't shoot him. All right, then you stabbed him, maybe. You said you never carried a gun. Look, Francie, go home and give matters a chance to simmer down. Matt, I'm going to ask you for something. Yeah? Turn Pete Ziegler out into the street. What? Francie, they're itching to get their hands on him. Let him have him. It'll prove that story's a lie, that you didn't make a deal with him. Please, Matt, I have to live here. Sammy, I have to live here. Matt? Matt? 
Don't look at me like that. Go home, Francie. Go home or leave town or hang yourself or anything you like. Just go away. Pat. Away. Right now. I bought me a bottle at the Alifagans, Mr. Dillon. Would you care for a drink? No. Mm, guess the funeral's over. There'll be others. Funny. No, I miss that bell. Awful quiet, ain't it? It's just what? Just about on schedule. Are you ready, Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'd use a shotgun if I were you. It's more effective when there's a mob to be dealt with. Oh, yes, sir, I am. Ziegler, and you too, son. If trouble starts, lie down flat on the floor and keep your head down all the time. Don't go out to see what's happening. You understand me? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right. Dillon! Dillon! Come out, Dillon! Chester, I want you to stand here in the doorway after I go out, where you can cover the back door and me at the same time. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Open the door. It's my duty to warn all of you that you're in the breach of the peace. I've sworn to uphold the law. I've killed men in order to do it, and I'm prepared to do so again. Give us a Dutchman, Dylan. I ask you to be sensible and to leave quietly. But if you refuse to listen to reason, if you insist upon being fools, if you've already decided to act like wolves instead of humans, then there's nothing I can say to make you change your minds. All right, you want Peter Ziegler? Well, he's not more than 20 feet behind me, so come on and get him, any of you. One at a time or all at once. Come on. Which one of you wants to die first? You? You? You, Adam? Well, what do you say, Adam? You let him here. Don't let this star on my coat stop you. Come on. There, I'm not wearing it now. Well, come on, draw, Adam, draw. You all right, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Get his gun. Man, alive, I couldn't even see your hand move. Uh, uh, Marshal, oh, don't tell me. Don't tell Doc, me. Doc, you make one single funny remark and I'll knock you down. You just take him to your office and get to work. Well, I, I never do mean to offend, Marshal. In my line of work, well, bodies, they're just so much lumber. Make all the jokes about them you please, but not to me and not in my hearing. In my line of work, there's nothing humorous about death. Give him a hand, Chester. No, 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 I can handle the marshal. Thank you. Thank you. Just the same. Can you direct me to the marshal's office? Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. I'm Marshal Dillon. Well, I left Cottonwood as soon as I got your telegram. I'm Miss Bonnie. Where's my boy? Oh, we have him, ma'am. Safe and sound. Here, let me help you down. Thank you. It's a horse, Chester. Right this way, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry he put you to all that trouble, Marshal. The truth of the matter is he is a wild one and no mistake. Takes after his father, one scrape after another. Uh, he was no trouble at all. I enjoy children. I like to have them around. Bob? Bob, your ma's here. Son? Chester, where's the boy? Did you let him slip past you? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. He never got past me. Look, the back door's open. He seen me and he hightailed it, the devil. <laughs> we'll round him up for you, ma'am. Don't worry. Oh, I don't know why I bother hauling him back. If he's run away once, he's run away a thousand times. This time he ran because I wouldn't buy him a gun. He wanted a real one. That boy's just gun crazy, I swear. I got him a nice Barlow knife instead. Barlow knife. I reckon it didn't signify and off he runs. Barlow knife? A kid. Chester finds a kid. Marshal, has he done something bad with it? Told him to use it careful. He promised he'd use Wait, it careful. No, no, never mind, Chester. He's got Clay's strawberry ruin. We'd never catch up to him. Oh, I try to bring him up right. I tell him to be good, but he don't listen. He just don't listen. Now, calm yourself, ma'am. Just calm yourself. Here's your little bundle, Mr. Dillon. What? Yeah, give it to me. 
That's pretty heavy. <laughs> Here, you're better at knots than I am. Open it, will you? The moment he was born, he'd been nothing but tribulation to me. Now, please, ma'am. <laughs> What's he got in it, Chester? A shirt, stockings, a piece of sausage, and this. Forty-four double action. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. That's Clay's gun. Sonny didn't manage to keep it long, did he? Well, if he wants a gun that bad, he's bound to get hold of another one somewhere, somehow. Chester, call Mr. Hightower over. Hey! Hey, Mr. Hightower! Oh. Come on over. Mr. Dillon wants you. Marshal, could I have this a drink of water? What? Oh, Ziegler, I forgot all about you. Uh, uh, Chester, where are the keys? Yeah, right there on the desk. Oh. Oh, there we are. It'll be safe for you to go home now. I, I can go back by the phone. Yeah, that's right. I'll send for you for the trial. Oh, Duncan should. Duncan should. Watch where you're going, you dumb. Excuse me. Yes, Marshal. Mr. Hightower, it appears that we can do business after all. Get some paper and a pencil. I want some notices printed. Fire away. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Uh, what's the boy's name? Bonnie. William Bonney. William Bonney. William Bonney. Age 12. Height about five feet. Hair light, eyes blue. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose he's known by any other name. I know. Everybody just called him Billy. Or the kid. Also known as Billy. The kid. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Walter Newman, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Don Diamond, Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, and Howard McNair, with Richard Beals, Paul Dubov, Georgia Ellis, and Mary Lansing. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West. In Gunsmoke. Those longtime favorites, Amos and Andy, are rising to new heights in their CBS radio series on Sunday nights. Heard on most of these same stations, Amos and Andy find trouble as constantly as ever and make it just as funny and as human as they have for more than 20 years. Be sure to hear Amos and Andy this Sunday, won't you? Right after the Jack Benny Show. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, there's fast, funny quizzing on the Bob Hawk Show every Monday evening. This is the CBS Radio Network. city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Why, 
Marshal. Marshal Dillon. Over here, son. What's the trouble? Marshal. Why, uh, that's Will Thompson's young and Mr. Dillon. What is it, kid? What's wrong? Yeah. Mom. They burned our house. Got the fences. Four of them. My sister. My sister. They, they, they rode in and shot. They, been shot. Hold that lamp down here, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, blood all over the back of his shirt. Will Thompson, he's a homesteader, isn't he? That's right. Came to Dodge City about three months ago. Took up a section over on Mulberry Creek. Yeah. Mr. Dillon, you want me to go get the doctor? No. Boy doesn't need a doctor now. <laughs> Burned the house is right, Mr. Dillon. It's still burning. Yeah, what's left of it is. Watch yourself now, Chester. Yes, sir. No sign of life, though. Whoever did it's probably long gone by now. Mm. No reason to hang around. Now, let's tie up here and look around on foot. Bring up your carbine, Chester. I got it, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, they even fired the corn crib. Now, why would anybody want it? What's there? What is it? It's a dog. Shot. A dog? Doesn't even shoot the dogs. It's a... You see something? Yes, sir. It's Will Thompson. I think it's Will. What do you mean you think it's what? Galp. You was Indians, Mr. Dillon. They couldn't have been Indians. Only tribe reported in 20 miles the Kiowas, and they wouldn't do anything like this. They've been peaceful for years. Yeah, I don't know, but... Come on. Like... Let's find out what happened to the rest of the family. Yeah. Besides Will and the boy who rode into town, there's Ms. Thompson and a daughter. Girl about 17, pretty as a picture. Yeah, there's something lying over there by that cottonwood. Yeah, I see. Well, I guess we found Will's wife. She's alive. Yeah, if you can call it that. Scott her on. Take a look for the daughter, Chester. Yes, Mr. Young. Uh, uh, it's all right, Miss Thompson. It's all right. It's all right. Mary. My, my daughter... Took her and dragged her away. <laughs> Easy, man. Easy. Now. I, I, I tried to stop them. I held on to one of them. He kicked me loose. And his, his spur came off. It's here, somewhere. It's on the ground, somewhere. On the ground. Yeah, I see it. And my daughter. I took the her away. My baby. There now. My baby. There now. It's all right. We'll find her, ma'am. We'll find her and then... Miss Thompson... Well, you're better off, man. Dylan? Yeah. Over here in the willows. I found her. All right, Chester. Is 
What is it? Seen her in Dodge. Walking down the front street. Pretty as a picture. Yeah. All right, let's ride. We'll look in the Long Branch first, and if the Lisco Pete's not there, we'll try the other saloon. I bet his boss is here. He's here every night. Yeah, I know. Follow me in, Chester. Just keep him off my back. I'll take care of the rest of it. Yes, sir. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, thanks. Well, look who's here. Matt Dillon. Hiya, Kitty. What brings you in, Sadie? Business? Or pleasure? It's not pleasure. Ah. Plenty of other men in Dodge, Kitty. Are them? They come in here, don't they? Sure. They come in. I talk to them, and I drink with them. That's my job. You follow me, Matt? I follow you. I'm off at two every night. Kitty, have you seen Holisco tonight? No. He hasn't been in, Matt. Ben Rourke's sitting over there at a door table, though. Good. I'll talk to him. I'll see you, Kitty. Sure, Matt. Sure you will. All right, boys, here's where money talks. I'm raising another hundred, and I'll stand pat. Ben? Huh? Well, it's the marshal himself. I'd like to talk to you, Ben. All right, Matt, talk. Not here. We'll go over there by the bar. I'm sorry. I'm busy. I got a pat hand and a cinch bat. Maybe. This is official, Ben. Me? Ben and I want to talk to you. Now, come on. Take over my hand, Donnelly. I'll be right back. All right, Matt, let's have it. What do you want to talk about? One of your cowboys, Ben, Holisco Pete. What about him? Know where he is? I'm around somewhere, I guess. Why? I'd like to know if he lost his spur recently. Tonight, in fact. It's pretty, ain't it? Mexican silver, needlepoint, raw, gold, and late. Pete's the only man I know in Dodge who's got a pair like this. All right, I'll see that Pete gets it. He'll appreciate your finding. I doubt that. I found it lying beside a woman he just kicked to death. Will Thompson and his whole family were wiped out a few hours ago by four night riders. You know anything about it? How would I know about it? Your boys call you King Rourke, don't they? Never heard of one of them pulling anything without being sure you back him up. Matt. Are you claiming I was in on this? You're a cattle rancher, Ben, an open range man. You boys all hate the homesteaders coming in with their plows and fences. Been a lot of fences cut by night riders. No, it's murder. You haven't named me yet, Matt. A couple of months ago, here in the Long Branch, I heard you say you'd get the homesteaders out of Ford County if you had to burn them out. Well, did you? Sometimes a man gets known as a fast gunslinger and it goes to his head. I asked you a question, Ben. Then he gets himself a tin star and goes around bothering people. Then if you're figuring to draw on me, don't. Why not, Matt? I've seen you in action. You're not fast enough. Well, I asked you a question. And maybe I don't feel like... What's going on in here? Nothing. Oh, there you are, Marshal. How are you? <clears throat> Marshal, what's this I hear about an Indian uprising? There's been none that I've heard about. Whole family massacre, the way I hear it, sir. Murdered and scalped. Scalped? Two of them were. So it was Indians. What game are you playing, Matt? Indians don't cut fences, Ben. That's a cattleman's trick. Scalping, too? Could have been an afterthought. It wasn't an Indian who lost that spur. Well, we'll soon find out about it. I'm riding into the Kiowa country with Troop C tonight. I hope you won't do that, Colonel Blake. You know the Kiowas are peaceable enough when you let them alone, but if you push them, they'll fight. True enough, Marshal. We can't let them get away with it. The Indians weren't responsible, Colonel. I got evidence to the contrary. Give me 24 hours and I'll prove it. Well, I certainly don't relish stirring up a tribal war, but... Just 24 hours. Well, 
All right. Ben, if you know where Jalisco is, you better turn him in. It'll save trouble. When any of my boys need discipline, I take care of it. Not this time. Other people are involved. Homesteaders. Squatting on a measly 320 acres apiece. Ruining the whole country. They got rights, Ben. Who says so? I do. Good morning. Any luck, Chester? No, sir. I just stopped by the jail here to see if you'd found it. I wish I had. I'll head out again in a few minutes. Oh, this fellow's been waiting for you all morning, Mr. Dillon. Is that so? My name's Ezra Hawkins, Marshal. We ain't met before. I got a homestead up the river. Don't leave me much time to get to town. I see. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Hawkins? Well, it's about what happened to the Thompson family last night. The other homesteader sort of appointed me to speak for the whole bunch. All right, speak. Well, we want to know what you aim to do about it, Mr. Dillon. I aim to get the killers. When? Mr. Hawkins, I've been up all night trying to get an answer to that question. If you've got any information to offer, fine. If you haven't, the... What's up, Chester? A trail herd hit town, I guess. Damn, pull up, boys. Pretty nice. Dodge City Jail. Come on, let's decorate it. Let's go, Chester. Yes, sir. All right. Hold it there. Hold it. My, my. Jail is occupied, boys. You men just blow into town. You ain't talking to men, Sheriff. These are curly wolves from the circle far be the roughest, toughest outfit in the pan. And you're not talking to the sheriff. I'm the U.S. Marshal. You the range boss? That's right. Red Dudley. What about it? Dudley, we got a new law here against shooting off firearms inside the city limits. Yeah? You mean like this? <laughs> no, Dudley, I mean more like this. Hey! Right now, come on down off that horse. Sure, I'll come down. Roger, Mr. Dillon, he's got a knife. Yeah, so I see. Well, nice work, Mr. Dillon. Drag him in and lock him up, Chester. Throw some water on him. Yes, sir. All right, curly wolves. Your boss is jailed and fined $50. You can get him out tomorrow morning. We got the money for that. I'll take him now. I said tomorrow. Now on the move. All of you, get! You handle things right fine, Marshal, once you get started. Thanks, Hawkins. Only trouble is some of us homesteaders are getting kind of impatient. The cattle ranch has been treating us pretty bad for too long. The boys are all meeting at my place today. I reckon I can hold them back till tonight. You know what I mean, Marshal. Yeah. I saw it happen in Abilene. Dirty and bloody. I'd hate to see it happen here. Sure, I know what you mean. Range war. <laughs> We can hold an inquest any time now. I'm all finished with the autopsy. All right, Doc. It goes pretty fast when you can line them that away, four in a row. Makes the job a lot easier. Yeah, I imagine. Doc, have you ever seen a range war? No, but I hear there's one boo. There is. Plus Indian trouble. If I don't bring in Jalisco Pete before tonight and find out who his three partners were, you're going to have bodies lined up 20 in a row. Well, it sure bring in a lot of fees. I could retire and buy myself a ranch. Sure, Doc. Oh, boy. Oh, oh that sounds like Chester, Marshal. Yeah, he's been scouting those thickets along the river bottom. Mr. Dillon, I brought in Jalisco. 
Where is he, Chester? Outside, tied on a pack mule. Good. No, sir. I'm afraid it ain't so good. He's dead. Been shot in the back and scalped. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first, CBS Radio, in cooperation with Time Magazine, makes available to you, free of charge, a valuable convention handbook, packed with facts and sidelights about American national political conventions. This convention handbook, containing a convention map and box score of interesting pictures and a complete history of this old American custom, will be yours if you send a postcard with your name and address to Time, CBS, Chicago 90, Illinois. That's Time, CBS, Chicago 90, Illinois. And now, with William Conrad starred as Matt Dillon, here's the second act of Gunsmoke. Just a second now, Martian. Here, here, here it comes now. Ah, 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 there's the bullet. If it'll do you any good. It won't, Doc. Uh, the slugs I dig out of the bodies all look alike. Someday, though, they may figure a way to tell them apart. Maybe even tell which gun fired which bullet. Oh, no, not a chance of it, Marshal. Well, I guess that's all I can do for the... Late lamented. Oh, you see he's only wearing one spur. Yeah, I know. I got the mate to it here. That's what I wanted to talk to him about. Uh, it's too bad, Marshal. His talking days are over. Yeah, somebody made sure of that, all right. Then tried to cover the trail by scalping him. Well, I can tell you one thing. It wasn't done by Indians. That's my guess, too. I've seen how Indians do it. Down in the territory, up in the Dakotas. Slick and clean. Nothing like this. Well, I could do a better job with my eyes closed. Yeah, I bet you could. Well, I guess I'd better get ready for the rush. Looks like a showdown, Martian. And I don't see any way that you can stop it. Neither do I. <laughs> Oh, hiya, Kitty. Business again, Matt? Well, I was looking for Ben Rourke. He isn't here. He left about an hour ago. Some of his boys came after him. Matt, I... I waited for you last night. I worked, Kitty. All night? Yeah. There's a bad feeling in the air, Matt. What is it? What's going to happen? I wish I knew. They called all the soldiers from Sea Troop back to Fort Dodge this afternoon. I hear they're planning to move out tonight. I hope not. There's been a lot of homesteaders in here drinking today. That's unusual for them. What's going to happen, Matt? <laughs> the bloodiest mess you've ever seen. And I don't know any way of stopping it. If I'd only found Halisco Pete before they killed him, now I got nothing to go on. Halisco came in here last night, late, after you'd gone. Huh? Well, why didn't you let me know? There wasn't time. He heard he was wanted, and he left right away. His friends with him. Friends? What friends? Oh, I'd never seen him before. I think Pete had known him in the Pecos country. They're all pretty drunk. How many were with him, Kitty? Three, I guess. One of them was named Red Dudley. Red Dudley. And one called himself Tulsa Jim. He kept talking about the Circle Bar yeah, B brand. it might be. It might be. They could have ridden in last night ahead of the herd to look up Pete and then they... Oh, Marshal. Say, so you better come on outside here if you want to stop a lynching. Come in, Doc. Be careful, Matt. Be careful. What is it, Doc? It's Ben Rourke and some of the cattle ranchers. They caught themselves an Indian and they're going to string him up. I doubt it. That is pretty clear of this, Matt. We know what we're doing. I hope so, Ben. Who have you got here? One of the murdering skunks who wiped out the Thompsons. Any objections? I might work up some, Ben. 
What's your name, fella? He won't talk to you. He hasn't opened his mouth. Look, fella, as an Indian, you're a ward of the government. I'm a U.S. Marshal. I represent the government. I'm here to protect you. Now, what's your name? He talks well. Work hard. Good man. No kill. What makes them think you did? Say kill people. No kill. He pleads not guilty, Ben. Sure he does. And maybe he can explain why we caught him two miles from my ranch house. Is that reservation? What was he doing there? Yeah. Well, ask him. Ask him. Mr. Roark? Yeah. Maybe I can tell you what he was doing. What? Ezra Hawkins. One side, if you don't mind. You let me through here, please. Let him, let him Thank you. We got tired of waiting, Marshal. We come on into town. Maybe that was a mistake, Hawkins. Maybe. You have to play it the way you see it. Look, mister, let's have it. What's this all about? I'm a homesteader, Mr. Rourke. Well, I accept your apology. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't no apology. I just wanted you to know who those hundred men across the street were. And they all got guns. A hundred, huh? Well, there's 30 of us, so the odds aren't bad. What's on your mind? This Indian's been working for us, Mr. Rourke. Tracking down fence cutter. Maybe that's why you caught him within two miles of your house. Got the nerve to come out and say what you mean, homesteader? You bet I have, fence cutter. All right, hold it. Now, you're covered, Ben, and you too, Hawkins. This play's gone far enough. Not giving a man a chance to draw, Matt? Not this time, Ben. All right, Katoxa, climb off that horse and get over here behind me. Move slow and stay out of the line of fire. You men, if either side makes a move, Ben and Hawkins will be the first to get it. You understand? Doc, take us in into your office. We shoot, we shoot right away, Matt. Well, Matt, what's the next step? You can't keep us here with our hands in the air forever. I don't intend to. I got one of the murderers locked up in jail. I want you two to come along and listen to his statement, but leave the questions to me, all right? It's just fine with me, Marshal. Sure show, Matt. Good. Come on. Chester? Chester? Looks kind of deserted, Matt. He may have gone back to the cells to see. Chester? Move on, Joe. Ben Hawkins. What's the matter, Matt? Here, I'll get that gag off of him. You cut the ropes, Ben. Right. All right, Chester, here we go. Easy now. There. What happened, Chester? Oh, they slipped in and got the drop on me, Mr. Dillon. Took Red Dudley with him. There was two of them, not more than 20 minutes ago. Who were they? Did you know them? Nope. Circle Bar B boys, I think. They slugged me and thought I was out, but I heard them talking. They were all in with Pete on the Thompson killing. Yeah, I know. And they killed Pete, too. They was afraid you'd make him talk. The question now is, where are they? I know where. The Arkansas rooms. The Arkansas, huh? They planned to hole up there till it got dark. Maybe they've gone by now, though. Maybe not. Want some help, Matt? No, thanks, Ben. It's my job. Mine and Chester's. Come on, Chester. Let's go. The room and house is all dark, Mr. Dillon. That doesn't mean a thing. Watch the windows. Is that you, and... Dillon? Drop behind that water trough here. Use your carbine, it's more accurate. Yes, sir. All right, Dudley. Come on out. You're under arrest. Come and get it. Fire at the flashes, Chester. That came from the side window, Mr. Dillon. And tend to one, there's somebody behind the other corner. So... Yeah, there was. Break the front of the building, Chester. Yes. I got one. He's hanging out the window. Yeah, it's two down. And Dillon, one... hold your fire. I give up. All right, come on out. Be careful, Mr. Dillon. It may be a trick. It's up to him. Come on out, Dudley. Well, hurry it up. I'm coming. I got a, I got a bullet in my leg. I can't hurry very fast. You, you got me all wrong. Walk it, he's drawing. 
Wrong, Chester. He started to. See if you can find the doc and get him to help you pack these things over to the jail. Yes. Right away, Mr. Dillon. Matt? We all right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right, Ben. Had a clean sweep, huh? Looks that way. Well, bullets are cheaper than rope. I guess so. Ben, you and your boys aren't murderers like Red Dudley, but this business of fence cutting can lead to a range war, too. Like it or not, Homesteading's here to stay. There's more of them coming in on every train. I know all that. Those cattlemen built this country, Matt. A few more years now, they'll have us fenced out of it. Times change, Ben. There's range still left out west, New Mexico, Arizona. Yes, I know. Some of us have been thinking about it. Matt, they'll fence you out too, you know. Yeah, I guess they will. <laughs> well, when that time comes, I'll move on. If I'm still around. Farms and families. Next thing they'll do is set up courts and bring the law in here. Law's here now, Ben. In Dodge City, I'm the law. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Lou Krugman, and Georgia Ellis, with Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Vivi Janis, and Johnny McGovern. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNair is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Jungle Legacy is the name of tonight's adventure with Tarzan. Listen as Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, faces a band of unscrupulous men who seek a uranium deposit in Tarzan's realm, through which they hope to rule the world. Don't miss Jungle Legacy tonight, when most of these same CBS radio stations bring you Tarzan. It's packed with thrills, packed with action, packed with tense atmosphere. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Remember... Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Well, Chester? It's another one, Mr. Dillon. Laying near his wagon. The horse was still hitched and was grazing. Another stabbing? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Two buffalo hunters found him early this morning on the road leading out to Cimarron Crossing. We just brought him back. Who was he? His name was Jones. Les Jones. Been in town a couple of days buying supplies and food. Where'd he come from? Well, some of the boys told me he's got a little farm on up the Arkansas piece. Got a wife, too. Poor little thing, they tell me. Yeah. You know anything more about it? He was at Tab Slade's saloon last night playing faro. Drunk? Oh, we'd had a belt or two, but not drunk. Did all right at the faro table. Pretty much had $50,000. 
$3,000 and a widow woman on the Arkansas River. Beg pardon, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, nothing, Chester. The money's gone, of course. Yes, sir. Ask Doc to come down when he can with you, Chester. All right. Doc, come down a minute. Mr. Dillon wants you. Coming. I'm coming. Did Jones have a gun on him, Chester? We found a sharp special in his spring wagon. Uh -huh. He wasn't carrying anything on him. It's outside. you want to see it? Had it been fired? No, sir. Oh, well, good morning, Marshal. Want to see me? I want to ask you a question, Doc. Yeah? There have been two stabbings in two months. Jones makes the third. You think the same person killed the other two? Well, there's no way to be sure, but from the position of the wound and the body, and from the angle of the knife thrust, I doubt the killer or killers use the same... Doc, time. I just wanted a simple answer. Yes. I think the same person murdered all three men. Yeah. Any way of telling how long Jones has been dead? <laughs> well, I'm not a Pinkerton man, but I'd say sometime after midnight. Between three or four in the morning, maybe. And I'd also say from the amount of bleeding... Okay, Doc. Chester? Yes, Mr. Dillon? Get my horse. I'm going to ride out to the Jones place. I figure Miss Jones will want to know. <laughs> Howdy, bub. I live here. Where are you from? I'm from Dodge. Dodge? You, you ride all the way from Dodge? Sure. Get down and I'll water your horse. All right. Yeah, here you are. What's your name, son? Alvin Jones. My dad is Les Jones. I, I guess you know him, huh? Yeah, sure. I guess most everybody knows him. Uh, your mother in the house? Are you going to stay for dinner? Well, I don't think so. Is she in the house? Yeah, she's there. Just go on up. Don't worry about your horse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Alvin, Alvin, stop that. Don't be It's not, not Alvin, Miss Jones. Oh, I am sorry. I thought it was my son. My name is Dylan, Miss Jones. Marshal Dylan at Dodge. Come in, Marshal. Thank you, ma'am. You care for some buttermilk? Or maybe out here men don't drink buttermilk like they do at home. <laughs> Thank you, but nothing for me. Uh, Miss Jones, I got some unpleasantness for you. Yes? It's about your husband. He's in trouble? I left Dodge four hours ago. I thought I should be the one to tell you. He's hurt bad. More than bad, Miss Jones. I pulled the saddle off your horse, mister. Makes me a good one. Well, thank you, son. Alvin, this is Marshal Dillon from Dodge. The Marshal? Uh, Alvin... Your pa won't be home for a while, the marshal says. Well, not for how long? Well, I... Well, not for how long, Ma? Uh, not for quite a time, son, so uh, you will have to run things a while longer. Makes I can take care of Ma, all right? Sure you can, Ellen. Uh, would you stay to eat? No, 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 thank you, ma'am. I, I gotta get back to Dodge. Uh... Ms. Jones, could I... Yes, Mr. Dillon. Talk to the boy, Ms. Jones. Explain it so he won't be bitter. Too many gunfighters got their start from a killing like him. I'll try, Mr. Dillon. I'll try. Good afternoon, ma'am. <laughs> sure you got enough whiskey to finish tonight this Thursday weather. Oh, we've got plenty, Mr. Slade. If no fight starts that... Oh, Mr. Slade. Huh? There's company coming. Marshal Dillon just walked in. Oh, set that bottle of rye up on the bar. Yes, you. Got him, Matt. Join me in a drink? Oh, thank you. I will. What kind of drive? Been traveling? <sighs> yeah, I've been up the river a bit to the Jones place. Jones? Tell his wife she's a widow. 
Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Too bad. He was in here last night, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, he was. You wouldn't know anything about his being killed. Uh, what are you asking me, Dylan? Straight question. Are you saying I killed him? Just ask the question, Slate. I don't know anything. Someone knifed that man after he left here. He was taking a lot of money out of your place. You had a reason. I, mean, I wasn't even here last night. My partner, Ben Ramirez, was running the place. Where were you? I was with his sister. All evening? Still late enough? Where's Ben and his sister now? I don't know. Home, I guess. Well, I think I'll ride out and have a talk with him. And Slade. Yeah? If you have any big winners tonight, make sure they get home safe. Not at home. Or his sister. <laughs> I am his sister. <laughs> What's the matter? You don't believe me? Well, yes, I'm not, but I thought... You that... thought I would be in the house? Why, when the night is so beautiful? You want to talk with me? I want to talk with your brother. But he's not here. So why not talk with me? My name's Matt Dillon. I, I'm Marshall with Dodge. I know. And want him to meet you. Yeah, I've come on business. I like business. Talk with me. Last night, maybe after midnight, a man was killed on the river road. Killed? By a knife stabbed in the chest. Why do you tell me this? He was carrying $3,000. He wanted Slade's. And so? Uh, Tab Slade told me he spent last evening with you. He came for dinner. He often does. He thinks he loves me. Uh, your brother, was he here? Tab Slade and Ben own the saloon together. They're partners. They think at least one should be there all the time. Ben went down after we ate. Did Slade... Uh, uh, was he here long? Yes. He's my fiancé. So it's all that. Isn't this, Marshal? Well, that's your business, Miss Ramirez. My name is Evelita. You could call me Eve. Well, when do you expect your brother? I don't know what my brother does. He may be home soon. He may be late. I don't know. I seen you when I was in town, Matt Dillon. Yeah? I don't ride in often. Played such a fool. He and my brother don't like me to come to town. Well, Dodge is rough, Miss Ramirez. Always he has to protect me. <laughs> Men are such fools. But Matt Dillon is not so. I... You wouldn't keep me out of town? Well, I, that's not my affair, Miss Ramirez. It'd be for your brother and Tab Slade to say. Tab Slade thinks we will marry. But well, we won't. Because I don't love him. I don't love anybody. Uh, Miss Ramirez, Don't I... you find me attractive? Well, well, yes, I'm... Oh, why don't you kiss me? Well, well no, I didn't mean no. to... No. Be... Dylan? I've got a gun pointed at the back of your head. Ben, I want to... Fooling with another man's fiance isn't smart, Dylan. Ben, please. You go inside. All right. Aren't you going to say anything, Dylan? What do you want me to say, Ben? Uh, by this time, most men will be crawling. You're a hard one, Dylan. I can't fight a man who's behind me in the dark with his gun drawn.
Yeah, is that better? You can see me now. Takes a small man to make love to another man's woman. You can't haze me into a draw. I'm not trying to. I don't want a gunfight. I just want to talk, Dylan. Well, you're calling it. I saw Slay just a few minutes after you left this place. He told me you were trying to tie us with a murder. I said he was wrong and came up here to get the straight of things. From what I saw a minute ago, he might have been right after all. You'd like his woman, so it'd be handy to have him out of the way. Is that the way you figure it, Ramirez? Yeah, that's the way I figure the it. The only reason I came to your place was to talk to you. I want to find the killer, Mr. Jones, and thought you might be able to help. Well, you're not going to get any information sniffing around Eve. What's your plan, Maria? Now, to give you some advice, Marshal. Tab Slade's been a good friend of me, and I'll help him protect anything that's his. Eve's his, so stay away. You're not going to find a killer while you're... Saying pretty things. Are you through? All right, then listen to me. You say Slade had nothing to do with those killings. I won't say he did because I don't know, but I'm going to find out who did it, and if it was Slade, I'll get him. Now, do I ride back to town? Yeah, ride back to Dodge, Marshal, and uh, between here and where your horse is tied, don't so much as twitch a finger. <laughs> I don't know whether you're a fool or a brave man, Ramirez, but just let me give you one bit of advice. Don't tie to the wrong brand. It's easy to do. Just walk away, Marshal. Your horse. And walk easy. Yeah? If you find out who killed Jones, let me know. I'll do that, Ben. I sure will. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... Hello, I'm Kathy Lewis, the girl who plays Jane on My Friend Irma. Irma, tie this string around your finger to remind you that starting Sunday, we go on the air at 9.30 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. All right, Jane. Good girl. Now, what's that string to remind you of? To buy some more string? That's My Friend Irma, whom you can now hear on Sundays, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Remember, My Friend Irma is now heard at a new later time on Sundays. Check your local schedules. Now... The second act of Gunsmoke. I'm sorry to have to wake you, but you better get dressed and come right away. They've got Tab Slade. Slade? Who's got Slade? Some of the ranchers. They're going to lynch him right in front of his saloon. Well, go and try and hold him for a minute. I'll be right along. Yes, sir. Sorry, Marshal, I can't do that. Slade killed another man tonight, and he's going to pay for it. All right, now listen to me, all of you. If Tab Slade killed a man tonight, I'm going to... He did. If you can prove Tab Slade killed a man tonight, I'll take him to jail and hold him there for trial. Marshal, Tab ain't going to be alive to stand trial. Do you know Slade killed anybody? If one of these men lays a hand on Tab Slade, I'll start shooting There'll be a lot of men dead. How about you, Marshal? Might be you could get hurt, too. That's right, John. You could kill me, all right. 
But which of you is going to shoot first? And die first? Huh? Well, which one? Chester? Yes, sir. Go pull Slade off that horse. Cut the ropes and take a gag out of his mouth. Yes, Mr. Dillon. And you men, don't anybody make a mistake. Don't you move a shadow. I just... All right, Slade, get down off there. All right, Chester. Now, you and Slade walk back to the far side of the street. Slow. Yes, The rest of you just stand where you are, looking right here at me. First man so much as moves his eyes will be in real trouble. We're across the street, Mr. Dillon. Good, Chester. Now, walk Slade down to the jail and put him in a cell for safekeeping. Now, Harrison, you and your boys head for home. And if you got any sense at all, forget to tell your families what you were almost a party to. Uh, good night, gentlemen. Chester, what happened tonight? A man named Olson, a rancher, was at Slade's place. Gambling? Yes, sir, and he did pretty fair. He left around midnight and was found about two hours later. He'd been stabbed. His money was gone. Uh, did you talk with him? Yes, sir. He just mumbled about having tried to be friendly. He said that several times, Mr. Dillon. Just being friendly. And then he said, I fired a couple of times. I think it hit. You mean he hit whoever stabbed him? I think that's what he meant. Yeah. He say anything else? Nothing. Well, then, there's not much help in just that. He can't tell us any more. And I'll talk with Slade and I'll bring him out. Huh? Yes, sir. Dylan wants to play. Matt, Matt, you gotta believe me. I don't know anything about the killing. This one or any of the others. I don't have to believe anything, Slade. I'll find out. But I didn't do it, Matt. Why is everybody sure you did? Why are they so sure that they're trying to lynch you? Does a lynch mob have to be sure of anything? Slade, before you came here to Dodge, you were a gunfighter. You had a bad reputation. You were in with the Kansas Raiders, sure, that's too. Right. The Raiders were killers and thieves. Some were. Now, when a man with your background goes straight, he's always suspect. Matt, I didn't have anything to do with the killing. What about this partner of yours, this Ramirez? I met him in Kansas. Him and his sister, we joined up and came out here. So we'd make good a team. Where's Ramirez now? I don't know. Matt, please listen you to me. You're going to marry his me. sister? No. Yeah, Matt, I don't know. Why isn't Ramirez around now that you're in trouble? <laughs> please, maybe he doesn't know. I don't know. He'd know by now. The news is all over Dodge. Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Put Slade back in his cell, then load your shotgun and keep a close watch on it. Well, where are you going, Mr. Dillon? I'm going to take a ride out to the Ramirez place. I want to have a talk with Mr. Ben Ramirez and his sister, Eve. Don't move. Just stay where you are, Ramirez. It's late for a social call, Dylan. Why? You're still dressed? I was just going to turn in. Last time we talked, you had a gun in my back. Now your gun's on your hip, and it'd be smart to keep it there. I'm not going to try a shootout with you, Dylan. I wouldn't chance it, especially in this lamplight. There'll be no reason for anyone to draw. I just want the answer to some questions. What questions? Where's Eve? What do you want her for? I ask you a question, Ramirez. I want an answer. Where's Eve? She's in bed. Where was she around three this morning? Here, I suppose, asleep. I think you better get her out here, Ramirez. What's so important about Eve? A man was killed this morning, and I think she might have done it. You know what you're saying? Yeah, I know. You're calling my sister a murderer. That's right. If you're going for your gun, Ramirez, make sure you're ready to die. I told you before, I'm not a fool. But if I can trick you, I'll kill you. Don't try, Ramirez. Why do you say my sister killed a man? No hand around these parts would stop for anyone on the road at night. Not unless it was someone they knew or someone they didn't have to fear, like a woman. Like your sister. You don't know anything, Dylan. You're guessing wrong. I didn't know when I got here, but now I'm sure. 
What do you mean? The man who died tonight shot at and hit the person who stabbed him. There's no blood on you, but there's blood on the floor over there by the door. Blood that could have come from a gunshot wound. That doesn't prove anything. And there's blood on the table by you there. It's not blood, it's just a shadow from the lamp. <laughs> Does it hurt, Ramirez? I hurt inside. Bad? I won't be around for the trial. Did she do it, Ramirez? Did your sister kill those men? She's not my sister. She's my wife. Wife? Yeah, that's why she didn't marry Slate. She's in the other room. Hurt bad. Get a doctor for me. <laughs> Ramirez? She's no good. But I will love her. <laughs> She's got a horse. grazing when I topped that slope. Matt, what are you going to do with me? Take you back to Dodge. Have you up for trial? There's no point. I wouldn't live long on the horse, but I've bled too much already. Yeah. Is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable? No. Nothing. Eve, can you tell me why? Why you killed four men? For a very simple reason. I wanted the money they had. I wanted it very much. Matt, I've been thinking about my husband. Is he dead, Matt? Did you kill him? He went for his gun, Eve. I, I killed him. He was kind to me. I tried to love him, but I couldn't. I didn't love anything but money. He didn't that I could have loved. Now I'm sorry for everything. Huh? Yeah. It's very lonely. Would you do something for me? Sure. Would you hold my hand? Good. That's good. Very good. I'll just rest here a minute longer. Perhaps I can. She lay there, her dark hair framing her face, the spring grass crushed by her body, a red stain across her silk blouse. The morning sun warmed the soft wind that moved across the land. Later that day, Eve Ramirez and her husband were buried on the outskirts of Dodge City. Not far from the banks of the Arkansas River. And later that night, Dodge City was alive with saddle bums, ranchers, cattlemen. Searching the dark of the Kansas night for 
are excitement and life. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Special music for tonight's story was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Georgia Ellis, Ty Everback, and Jack Crucian, with Richard Beals, Ann Morrison, and Herb Ellis. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in... Gun smoke. Don't miss Gangbusters and the Case of the Variable Blonde later tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking, and this is the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Chester. Chester. Chester, where are you? Back here, Mr. Dillon. Well, come on out. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. As soon as I get my boots on. Your boots on? What are you doing? Sleeping? No, sir. Just washing my feet. <laughs> well, now, I hope you didn't have any plans for tonight. Uh, what did you want me to do, Mr. Dillon? God, I want you to stay on Front Street for a few hours while I go up and have a toddy with Big Kate. But if you're going to oh, be busy... Oh, no, sir. Well... I haven't got anything to do. I'd be proud to stay here. Just look at the dust in that street. Uh oh, Mr. Dillon. Huh? Looks like Major Randall from Fort Dodge crossing over here. Ah, open the door for him, Chester. <laughs> Major will like that. Come in, Major Randall. Come in, sir. Marshal Dillon. Hello, Major. Marshal, I want to talk to you about last Saturday's affair. Well, Saturday was a pretty lively day around here, Major. Which affair do you mean? You surprised me, Marshal. Two United States Army soldiers were murdered while driving a supply wagon from here to Fort Dodge. A government payroll was stolen, and you seem to have taken no interest in the matter. Well, now, Major, protecting the Army isn't exactly... The Army can protect much. itself, Marshal. That isn't the point at all. Well, if that's true, Major, how come there are only two soldiers carrying your payroll? you got plenty of men out there and plenty of guns. Where were they? On maneuvers. On maneuvers? In my command, Marshal, troops remain in garrison as little as possible. Well, then you were asking for trouble, Major, knowing that there was a payroll coming in. The arrival of the payroll was secret. Even the two men carrying it didn't know what it was. Well, the word must have got out somehow. It seems to me, Major, like somebody out at the fort must have told him. There are no traitors in my command, Sheriff. Uh, Major, I'm not a sheriff. You, you see it? Never mind. Got... Marshal, I demand to know what you intend doing about this crime. 
All right, I'll tell you, Major. Nothing. What? If I knew who did it, I'd make the arrest, but I don't, so there's nothing I can do. I see. Well, Marshal, I regard this crime as a demonstration of your inability to control these Dodge City ruffians, and therefore I shall do it myself. How's that, Major? If no arrests are made in this matter, I'll give these bad men of yours a taste of martial law. We'll see how they like that. I wouldn't try that, Major. These streets will be patrolled 24 hours. Now listen to me, Major. You don't know these men. Sure, there are some bad ones here, but most of them are just wild. Free and wild. But you run the army in here and they'll all fight. Hmm. Let them. You've been stationed at Fort Dodge two months now, haven't you, Major? How long you been out on the frontier? This is my first tour, thank heaven. Well, then I advise you to take it easy. You get to know the ways of this land. You may save your advice, Marshal. There'll be trouble, Major, bad trouble. If necessary. Nonetheless, the army will take over within the week, or before, if there are any more of these crimes committed against it. Good day, gentlemen. My. You think he'll do it, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, he made a mistake, and he's a hot-headed fool, Chester. You try it. Well, can't you stop him? I don't know. Well, I'll be at Big Kate's later on. You can find me there if you need me. All right, Mr. Dillon. Hey, Marshal, come here. What is it, Shiloh? There's talk of Dodge being run by the Army, Marshal. So? So I don't like it. I and most of the men around here got out back in 65. We've had all the Army we need. Yeah, I know. But maybe things will work out. And if they don't work out, which side are you fighting on, Dylan? Where do you stand? I'm hired to keep the peace, Shiloh, not to answer fool questions. You calling me a fool? Well, say it. No, you're drunk, Shiloh. You saying I'm drunk, Marshal? Is that it? All right, Shiloh, I'll show you how drunk you are. Now, when he comes around, tell him I took his gun. He can get it back in the morning. And if he objects to that, tell him to look me up and I'll throw him in jail. It's Matt, Kate. Well, come on in. Well, sit down, Matt. I'll get you a toddy. Thank you, Kate. You could drink me best by buying a drink at the bar downstairs once in a while. Well, why should I? I get better whiskey for free up here. <laughs> at least you're honest. Well, what's in the wind, Marshal Dillon? Or do you just come up here because you're tired of sitting with your back to a wall? <laughs> you're right, Kate. The only place in Dodge where I can relax. That's probably just because you don't consider me worth killing. Uh, how old am I, Matt? <coughs> what? You heard me. Well, uh, I never thought much about it, Kate. You sure didn't. What are you getting at, anyway? Just that if I was 20 years younger, you probably wouldn't come here at all. No? And <laughs> why? Here's your toddy. Forget it. <laughs> Anything you say, Kate. You know, Matt, you ought to get yourself a girl. Oh, no, Kate, don't say that. I mean that. it, Please. sure. Somebody like, well, say Connie Dell. There's a real pretty girl. A lot of fire. <laughs> oh, you're sure a conniving old woman, Kate. You're just no good at all, you are. <laughs> you say worse than that. I told Connie she'd come up and have a drink with us the next time you show me. All right, Kate, if it pleases you. It does. Now, there's fresh cigars in that box by your chair, Matt. Well, now. Uh, Had them brought in by the Santa Fe Railroad all the way from St. Louis. Evening, Miss Kate. Oh, come on in, Connie. I've corralled the marshal for you. Sit down, honey. I'll fix you a dress. Uh, don't let her talk bother you, Connie. <laughs> well, I, I did ask to meet you, Marshal. Oh? Why? Why'd you want to meet me? Maybe just to see if you're really as cold and cruel as you seem downstairs. And? I can't tell yet. But I don't think you are. 
Yeah, a profession like mine leaves its mark on a man. There's always trouble of some kind, isn't there? Most always. Like this army business now. Yeah. Will it be bad, Marshal? Yeah, it could be. Well, I'll figure it this way, Matt. The Major's in trouble, and he's trying to cover it up by threatening to take over Dodge. Well, any more difficulties, and he will do it. Blasted green. Uh, say, Connie, your corporal been in? He left a while ago. Well, what's he say? How do the soldiers feel about all this? Well, I don't think they want to mix it with all these gunmen and buffalo hunters and the like. Yeah. The Major will wish he were back on maneuvers if it starts. Maneuvers? So well, that's where they've all been. No wonder it's been so quiet. But that corporal of yours, Connie, how come he didn't go out? He's not my corporal in this case. He's, he's just a lonely kid. <laughs> All right. Seems like he spends more time here than at the fort. How's he managed that? Oh, they made him a clerk, a sort of bookkeeper. Sounds pretty much his own. Uh-huh. Well, he's lucky. He's got a good, safe job, too. I suppose it is. Well, I'd better get back. Now that we've met, Marshal, you might stop and buy me a drink next time you're around. I'm afraid not, Connie. No? You're too distracted, I... Might get careless and shot at. I take that as a compliment, Marshal. It is. Good night, Marshal. Thank you. Don't you mention it, honey. Well, Matt? You said her name's Connie Dell, Kate. Where's she from? I never ask the girls anything. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but you always find out. Now, come on, tell me. Hey, City, last. Uh-huh. Uh, what's the name of this corporal who's been sniffing around? Bowers, Corporal Bowers. Oh, here, let me sweeten that toddy for you. All right. You put me in mind of a man I knew back in Wichita. Yeah? He was the slipperiest, sidewind, <laughs> and the stubbornest man I ever knew. Even Mr. Dillon. Everything quiet, Chester? Yes, sir. But it's like everybody's holding his juice for the army if it comes. It's quiet and mean, Mr. Dillon. That's it, just, just quiet and mean. Yeah. All right, Chester, you can go to bed. I'll stay around for a little while longer. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Oh, uh, the first thing in the morning, I want you to go to the depot and have him send a message to the sheriff in Hayes City. That'd be Mr. Hickok? Yeah, ask Bill to send me all the information he can about a dance hall girl named Connie Dell. She left there about a month ago. Connie Dell. I'll do it, Mr. Dell. And uh, bring me the answer as soon as it comes in, huh? Well, we ought to have it by tomorrow evening. Yeah, I hope so. Well, good night, Chester. Good night, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Hightower down at the railroad depot, Mr. Dillon, he'd come in at 7 o'clock. Oh, good. Let me see it, Chester. Here. Uh, Connie Dell worked Golden Horn Bar here. Left about a month ago. A stranger and called Billy Grounds. Nothing against girl, but believe Grounds a wild one. Has anybody shot you yet? <laughs> Regards, Hickok. Um, what's up, Mr. Dillon? Well, I don't know, Chester. I don't quite know. Uh, look, you go over and ask Big Kate if she's heard anything about this Billy Grounds. All right, Mr. Grounds. Marshal? Huh? What is it, Shiloh? I want you to smell my gun. Here. Here. What? And go on, smell it. Uh, all right. It hasn't been fired. What are you worried about? Well, uh, I've been talking a lot lately, and uh, a man was just shot out behind the long branch. A soldier. Any witnesses to this? Well, who saw it? I, I, I just heard the shot. I want to know who killed this soldier. Maybe nobody did see it, Marshal. And maybe nobody cares much about it anyway. Just a soldier. <laughs> we didn't ask you. All right, you men, I'm going to tell you something. If I don't find who shot this man, the army will move in here for sure. Not the whole army, Marshal. They won't all move in. Why not? 
My sharp's rifle can kill buffalo at 200 yards. I reckon it'll kill soldiers at three. <laughs> hey, let me through here. Let me through. Let me through here. Hello, Marshal. What have we got this time? Uh-oh. Uh Soldier. Yeah. Well, he needs an autopsy just like anybody else. That was the man that shot him. He get hurt, maybe? Take a good look, Doc. He isn't even armed. This isn't a shooting. This is a murder. Hey, you're right, Marshal. Oh, well, I'll get him up to my office. Here, now give me a hand, somebody. You may have a better day tomorrow, Doc, but I hope I can spoil it for you. I'm riding out to Fort Dodge right now. Well, Marshal, what brings you here? Trouble, Major. What sort of trouble? Murder. A soldier? Yeah. Who? I don't know. Some private. Why haven't I been informed of this? It just happened about an hour ago. In Dodge City, of course. In Dodge City. Have you arrested the murderer? Nobody saw it happen. I see. Well, Marshal, you leave me no choice. I shall have now, to... hold it, Major. I didn't ride out here just to carry news for you. I want something from you. From me, Marshal? Yeah. I want you to keep all soldiers out of Dodge for the next 48 hours. Put it off limits. <laughs> That's not exactly what I had in mind, Marshal. But you're going to do it anyway. What? Now listen, Major. Dodge City's an armed camp. It's full of men who fought Indians, who fought the war between the states, and who fought each other ever since they could spit. They'll fight you next. They'll make you hate it. Marshal Dillon, I shall report your treasonable talk. Report what you like, but stay out of Dodge. Now, I'll make you a deal, Major. Give me 48 hours and I'll find your killers. You better take it. All right. But I want the criminals delivered here. Sure, Major. And I might have to kill them to get them here. Hello, Doc. You drinking up the profits you made off of that soldier? Oh, that's, uh, oh, oh, oh hello, Marshal. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, boy's name was Bone, according to the letter I found on him. Uh huh. Anything else? Yes. Dug a couple of slugs out of him. It's a funny thing, Marshal. I haven't happened on lead like that since '65. What do you mean, Doc? Well, I'd swear that boy was shot with a. Calvary pistol. I'll see you later, Doc. And mind you, can't prove it. Not exactly, but I would swear. Come in. Hello, Kate. Did Chester see you? He did. Well? Matt, I get my information through the girl. Some of it's true, some is bound to be just talk. I'll weed it out. Carly's been seen riding out at night toward the Arkansas down by Brandy Bend. What for? Well, I don't know. Could be this feller Billy Grounds. Yeah. His name's never been mentioned around here. My guess is he's never been in town. Anything else? One thing. Corporal Bowers and Connie went for a ride one night. When? Night before that payroll was robbed. Yeah, figures. Where's Connie now? Over at the Longhorn, eating a steak. It's kind of late for supper, isn't it? She works late. Matt. Yeah? Next girl I steer you into, I'll pull her fangs first. <laughs> no, thank you, Kate. I like them better this way. <laughs> Good evening, Connie. Well, this is a surprise, Marsha. May I sit down? Of course. Thank you. You sure Corporal Bowers won't mind? Don't be silly. Anyway, he's away at the fort. Uh huh? 
What time did he leave, Connie? I don't know, about seven, I think. Why? Anyone with him? Yeah, Private Brown. Marshal, you think Bauer shot him, is that it? You know any reason why he would, Connie? They were friends. They worked together in the bookkeeping office. I see. Tell me, Connie, Bauer say much about his job there or what he does and all? No, Marshal. He never talked about it. Handled expenses for supplies and the like? Figured out the payroll? I don't know. Bars would be in a good spot to know when to expect the payroll money in, wouldn't he? Even when it was kept a secret? You'd have to ask him, Marshal. I don't know anything about the Army. But this isn't why you found me here, is it? <laughs> of course not, Connie. I'm, I'm sorry. Hey, you look real pretty tonight. Why, thank you, Marshal. You really mean it? Sure. Sure I do. I have to work late tonight, but I can get off tomorrow evening. Marshal, would you go for a ride with me? There'll be a moon. Where would we ride to, Connie? Well, I don't know. Anywhere, maybe. Maybe along the Arkansas. Oh, I know. Let's let's ride down toward Brandy Bend. All right, okay. Connie. We ride down to Brandy Bend. <laughs> Dressed up, Mr. Dillon. You going somewhere? Yeah, after supper, I am, Chester. Got me an engagement. Going riding with Connie Dell in the moonlight along the river. Is she a nice girl, Mr. Dillon? All girls are nice, Chester. Some fall in with bad company, that's all. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Who'd this one fall in with? Me. Oh, now, Mr. Dillon, that's not so. Then who'd you think, Chester? Come on, tell me. Billy Grounds. You don't give me much credit for romance, Chester. No, sir. <laughs> well, don't look so worried about it. Yeah. I, I was thinking, would you like me to follow you tonight, Indian style? Uh, thanks, Chester, but it wouldn't help. You see, I'm riding into an ambush. It'll be over fast, real fast. Well, all right, Mr. Dillon, if that's where you want it. That's the way it's got to be. Uh, and as soon as I leave, I want you to ride up to Fort Dodge and see the major. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, about... Tell him to arrest Corporal Bowers for the murder of Private Bone. I think Bone found out where the leak about that payroll money came from, and Bowers had to shut him up. The major won't like that, will he? Well, tell him I'll prove it. And anyway, I think Bowers will confess fast enough when the time comes. When will that be, Mr. Dillon? When I get back to town with Billy Grounds. What about the girl? Well, it's like I told you, Chester. Nice girl. Bad company. You know, I had me a girl once. Huh? Well, well you never told me about that, Chester. What happened? It was over in Abilene. I gave her my money to go to St. Louis and buy some wedding clothes. She wanted that. So? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. I guess she just liked it there in St. Louis. I'm going down the street, Chester. You better get started for the fort soon. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones. Good evening, Marshal. Uh, hello, Shiloh. I feel another drunk coming on, Marshal. Well, then check your guns back there with Chester. Well, what if the army comes tonight? I'll need my gun. And stay sober. Uh, but uh, if the army doesn't come, I'll have stayed sober for nothing. Every man's got his problem, Shiloh. But uh, if I see you drunk and wearing your gun, you'll wake up brokenhearted in jail tomorrow. Tonight I'm going to get drunk enough to draw on you, Marshal. That's so, Shiloh? And some night you're gonna die. Marshal? Oh, hello, Connie. I got off a little early. Shall we go now? Any time. I keep my horse at the National. I'll meet you at the edge of town. Oh? You ashamed to be seen with me? Oh. 
I'm like, no, Marshall. But well, you know how people talk. Sure, Connie. I'll wait for you just down the trail. I'll hurry. <laughs> Yeah, we come pretty fast, Connie. You want to get on for a minute? I'm all right. All right. We'll let the horses blow a little and then move on, huh? You nervous, Connie? No. Why? Well, then sit down and relax. All right. Is this better? Yeah. Ah, sure is a nice night. Yeah, it's beautiful. You're not even looking at it, Connie. Is something on your mind? No, of course not. Why should there be? I don't know. You tell me. It, it's nothing, Marshal, really. Connie, let me ask you something. You ever see a man killed? What? Why'd you say that? Well, did you? Yes. Once in the saloon. Ah. Tell me. Do you have a fair chance? Yeah, he even drew first. Then you never saw a man shot in the back. Or ambushed. What do you mean, Marshal? I think it sort of goes against your grain, Connie, the idea of a man being killed without a fair chance. I get it, Marshal. All right. Go ahead. Down by the river near Brandy Bend, Billy Grounds is waiting to shoot me in the back. Then why did you come, Marshal? It's my job. I suppose you know about everything. I think so. What are you going to do? Connie, unless I made a mistake about you, I I think you're going to let me have a fair chance at him. Somehow. Why should I? What does it mean to me? I don't know, Connie. I, I don't know. But you think about it. You think about it all the way to Brandy Bend. Now, come on. Let's ride. Make a nice camp down here. Plenty of wood. Get your own water right out of the Arkansas. Don't you think, Connie? A man could hide out for a long time down here. Marshal. You could be safe here, even while the army was trying to move into Dodge. A lot of men were being killed back there. It's peaceful here. Quiet. Marshal, I can't do it. Tell me, Connie. That, that big cottonwood up ahead, uh, on the left. All right. Keep moving. When we get there, I'm going to ride fast. I'll hang on to the offside of my horse for cover. When I start, you turn around. Get back out of gunfire. Yeah, it sure is pretty down here, Connie. You know, maybe someday we can come down and go fishing, huh? That river's full of catfish. Did you ever get a catfish dinner? Oh, they can be mighty good when they're small. Back, Connie. Connie? Connie? Yeah, he's dead, Connie. I'm all right, Marshal. I'm sorry about this, Connie. I'm sorry I had to do it. He killed your heart. I'll show you where his is. And the money. Then you can take me back to Dodge. To jail. All right, Connie. But you won't be in jail for long. 
ere have my word. Not for long. Let's go, Marshal. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Michael Ann Barrett and Jeanette Nolan, with Harry Bartell and Don Diamond. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week. As Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. The adventure just begins with Gunsmoke on CBS Radio. Still ahead tonight... Teen Opry, Tarzan, Gangbusters, and Stars in the Air. Yes, listen in for them all on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for your free convention handbook, write to Time, CBS Chicago 90, Illinois. This is the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Howdy, Marshal. Hello, Mr. Big. Can I give you a hand? No, no. This is the last match here. Hey, wait till the flies get to these buffalo hides in the morning. There'll be enough vultures overhead to keep the place in the shade for a week. <laughs> yeah. You know, you'll sure have your hands full by tomorrow night. Yeah, it looks that way. When these boys turn them hides into cash, they'll bite the corks out of every bottle in town. <laughs> And some of them look mean enough sober. Yeah. Well, you better bed down and get some sleep, Mr. Big. Uh, where are your boys? I don't know. Jeff had some trouble with the dry axle up near Pony Rock, and Boaz stopped to help him fix it, but they shouldn't be this long behind me. Well, if I see him, I'll tell him where to find you. You, you can tell Jeff, but Boaz ain't even going to hear you. Oh, why? What's the matter with him? Oh, he's riding higher than an eagle. You know that white buffalo you've been hearing about? The albino? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just Indian talk. Oh, you think so, huh? Well, if it is, Boaz sure shot himself a mighty scared buffalo. <laughs> white as Borat. Uh, that ought to fetch a price. Hey, anybody seen Marshal Dillon? Right over, over here, Chester. You better saddle up, Mr. Dillon. What's the matter, Chester? The Indian trouble. Two men dead and a couple of wagons burned up out there. I found this. 
A war rattle. Made out of buffalo toes. Arapaho. Well, they haven't been making any trouble. Well, Lee's did. I, I was topping the hill when I saw the wagons go up in fire. It was Indians, all right. I saw one ride off. That's funny. I never heard of Arapahoes attacking at night. How far out, Chuck? Ten mile, maybe. Toward Pawnee Rock. Pawnee Rock? Marshal. My sons are coming from there. Easy, Mr. Drake. There's lots of wagons in the church. <laughs> Marshal. I didn't see another wagon between here and Pawnee except the ones we had, but the Indians killed my boys. There's only one way to make sure, Mr. Big. Saddle up and ride over to my office. I'll be with you as soon as I can get my horse. I cut back through those button willows over there when I spotted the wagons being fired. We must be close to it, then. Just over there. Right down yonder. See him? Yeah. I see him. We rode up and dismounted. The last glint of hope in Mr. Big's eyes died. His boys were there, all right. And it wasn't nice to see. I'll kill him. I'll get him, please. I'll murder every red skin in the territory. We got to bring your sons in, Mr. Biggs. You know what the morning's going to be like. You don't want to leave them out here. Now, come on. Hey, look. Down there by the stream. Yeah, four of them. They're not saddle horses. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs. You yeah. recognize those horses down there? I, yeah. I know. Teams belong to Boaz and Jeff. Indians must cut them loose from the wagons before they fired. Doesn't that seem curious to you, Chester? In what way, Mr. Dillon? Why didn't they take the horses with them? Yeah. What are you thinking, Marshal? No burned hides in those wagons. So they stole them. Yeah, they stole them. But Boaz and Jeff both have their rifles there beside them, and the horses are left behind, too. Horses and guns are the first things Indians would go for. What are you looking for, Mr. Dillon? Those buffalo hides weren't carried off without wagons. Yeah, here. Marks the two other wagons here, and they're fresh. I didn't see any other wagons, only these. Well, they'd finish and gone before you got here, Chester. Well, yeah, but I, I'd have caught up to any wagons on the trail to Dodge. Did you go by regular trail? Well, no, I... I figured the Indian I saw wasn't alone. I didn't want to get bushwhacked further on. You didn't see any Indian, Chester. But Mr. Dillon, just as plain No as... Indian would leave guns and horses. This job was done by white men. It didn't take anything that could be recognized or identified. You mean that somebody's in Dodge by now with the hides my boys worked and sweated to get? I'm afraid so, Mr. Biggs. Uh, there'll be more than 300 buffalo hunters there by morning. It could be any of them. We'll find our right ones. Oh, how? The albino. Whoever killed your sons will have that white buffalo hide. <laughs> It was almost sunup when we got back to town, and more wagons had jammed the main street lining up for the unloading barns. I rode down the line, looking them over one by one. Howdy, Marshal. Some of the men would take their money, drink it up, and drift away. A few would stay long enough to be buried on Boot Hill. Then suddenly a wagon driver up ahead pulled out a line. Oh, hey, hey, wait a minute, Jim. Oh, oh, Take your hands off that seat. Now take my hands off as soon as you get back to your place. Oh, I'm tired of waiting now. Let go of that bit, mister. Don't do that, stranger. Get your hand away from that gun. Well, now, you know there's any law around you. There is, so don't try making your own. You got no right grabbing my team. I got plenty right when it's right going in in front of me, Marshal. That's a lie, Marshal. He cut Never mind. Hard. You both want to cool your heads out in jail? 
Now, what's your name? Tennessee is good enough. A lot of people from Tennessee coming into the territory. Most of them are pretty peaceful. That sounds like you're saying I'm not. You move pretty fast for that gun. Man can lose his temper. You lost yours four times according to the notches you've carved into that gun butt. But don't try for number five. Not here. How about you? What do you call? Charlie Kell. Charlie Kell, huh? They ever call you Chuck? No. Heard of a Chuck Kell a couple of years back. Come from Kentucky. Not me. Man I heard about was a gunfighter. So he never wore gloves. See, you don't either. It's pretty rough on the hands. Thanks, Marsha. I'll make sure to take better care of him. Yeah, do that. I'll be around a while, Marshal. Maybe we can have another talk. Anytime. They'd need watching. But what I wanted now was a white buffalo hide. Searching the wagons wouldn't do. There wasn't time. And the search had let the killers know that something in the hides they'd stolen could be identified. The time to find out would be when the buyers checked them. I got Biggs and Chester to cover two of the unloading barns, and I covered the third one. And then finally, daylight came, and the haggling started. John, you want to sell those hides? Better learn how to handle these skin and knife a little better. They're as good as any. And full of holes, they ain't. Give you four dollars a hide for the bunch. You gave that last fellow eight. <laughs> He looked tougher than you. <laughs> six. I'll take six. Four. Take it or leave it. You think you can rob me, mister? Watch your mouth, boy. Here, none of that. Let me go. Easy, son. Go. Let me have that gun just so you won't be tough. Here, that's better. Give me that. Give it back. You can pick it up at my office whenever you're ready to leave town. Yeah, you look like a city boy to me. Where are you from? St. Louis? None of your business. When something's got you beat, son, there's no shame to admitting it and going home. Sometimes that takes a real man. Don't tell me what to do. Why don't you watch your own job? Why don't you leave me alone, Marshal? I ain't got a white buffalo hide. What'd you say, boy? You heard me. What do you know about a white buffalo hide? What everybody else knows, that you're looking for one. Everybody in town knows that. How? Because the old man whose sons were bushwhacked all liquored up over at the other barn, shooting off his mouth. Don't go away mad, Marshal. <laughs> Mr. Biggs wasn't at the barn where I'd left him. I cut through an alley to Front Street and headed for the saloons. I never got to him. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? What's the matter, Chester? Old man Biggs. Where is he? I'm looking for him. Well, he... He was over by the barn. I was walking, drunk, going through the wagon. Yeah, I know about that. I was trying to get him to go back to his own barn, but all of a sudden, he took off. For where? I don't know, but there was one wagon he was watching in particular. The driver walked away from it with a package of some kind. That white hide? It could have been. I don't know. But Big sure thought so. He lit out after a fellow with blood in his eye. Which way? Down there where the boy's been hitching the empty wagon. Well, let's go. The old boy's drunk enough to make trouble. He's liable to kill somebody. Or get killed. Too late, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. It came from there behind that row of wagons. You stay here, Chester. Be careful, Mr. Dillon. When I rounded the corner wagon, Mr. Biggs was sprawled across a wagon tongue, his eyes dead and open, staring at the ground. And standing over him was Tennessee, a smile on his face, and his gun extended to me butt first. Looks like I'm in the mite of trouble, Marshal. He's dead, Tennessee. That's more than a mite. Uh, you take my gun for a while. You mean until after you hang? Wasn't figuring it to be that serious. Not when a drunk follows me out here and throws down on me. If you're figuring on self-defense, forget it. Look at his gun. It isn't even caught. Well, it's out of his holster, Marshal. That's enough. Law don't say I have to wait till he kills me. You have to make a jury believe that. No, you I... shouldn't have much trouble doing that, Marshal. 
What are you doing here, Mr. Kell? Oh, I just happened to follow Tennessee out here. Why? Well, you broke up our little argument in town. Thought I'd get him alone here. See if maybe he was still nursing a grudge he wanted to settle. But the old man beat me to it. Now, Tennessee here ain't exactly a friend of mine, as you know, but... I hate to see any man hang when he ain't guilty. Is that your personal verdict, Mr. Kill? That's right, Marshal. The old man threw down on him, and Tennessee had to kill him in self-defense. Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Which one of them had the package? This one. This is the fellow the old man was after. All right, Tennessee, where is it? I don't know anything about a package. Look in the wagon, Chester. See anything? Nothing here. I reckon you can give my gun back to me now. All right, Tennessee. Here. Thanks. But if you decide to use it again while you're in Dodge or any place else in Kansas, I hope I'm there when you do. Well, now, don't you fret, Marshal. I'm sure you will be. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, action, excitement, thrills. That's Gangbusters. Gangbusters helps to fight crime by fearlessly naming the criminals. Listen for it later this evening on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Just before sundown, we buried old man Biggs and his two sons up on Boot Hill. By the time the service was over and I rode down, darkness had fallen. And everything was going full blast. The town was roaring. Seemed like a good man, old Biggs. He was, Chester. So are his boys. Yeah, but there are too many men like Tennessee and Kell coming in, Mr. Dillon. They won't last, Chester. They'll keep coming, but they won't last. They'll take a gun and go against a man, but they won't sweat. They won't take root and build. We still going to look for that hide? Yeah. Well, just what do you want me to do, Mr. Dillon? Tennessee and Kell will be in town, but their wagons are back there with the other empties. Ride back and look them over. Well, they might have had somebody carry that package off for them. It might be, but they don't seem like partners, Mr. Dillon. From what I heard, you stopped them from gunfighting. It took more than one man to kill the Biggs boys, and more than one man and more than one wagon to cart the hides in. Well, you mean they stayed that trouble just for you? Just for me. After they heard I was looking for that white hide. Well, why do you figure that, Mr. Dillon? When gunfighters start for their guns, nothing stops them, Chester. They both started, but they both stopped. I reckon you better take a look through those wagons. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Uh, where will I meet you? I'll be checking the saloons. <laughs> One by one, I made the stops. The Long Branch, the Alafraganza, the Texas Trail. And one by one, they got quieter as I went in. As though each place was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. The last place was a Mexican hangout. A long, dark walk. Hello, Marshal. Can't see me, can you, Marshal? No. No, I can't see you, son. 
Too bad. Because I got another gun. They sell them around here. And I ain't going back to St. Louis. You'll fire once, son, and if you don't kill me with that, and I'll kill you. I'll gamble on that, Marshal. Marshal! <laughs> He lurched from the shadows into the street, staggered, and fell. And then he rolled over on his back, and his eyes struggled for a minute like they were trying to remember something. And then he went blank. Well, he is right about one thing. He wasn't going back to St. Louis. Well, what do you know? The marshal's real handy with a gun. Stay out of this, Kel. But I may have something to talk over with you later. Meaning what? If you don't know it, then you got nothing to worry about. I've been hearing a lot about how fast you are with a gun, Dylan. Anything to it? I'm still alive. Yeah. This your hobby, shooting kids? He was old enough to try to kill me. I don't like it, Marshal. That's too bad, Mr. Kell. The Chuck Kell I heard about would have loved it. They said he'd killed two kids under 16, one of them his own brother. No, you didn't hear the whole story, Marshal. The Kell you heard about killed a Marshal, too. You made the bid, Mr. Kell. You got a gun. Use it or I'll take it away from you. Come and get it. Anytime. Here it is. How you feeling, Mr. Dillon? I'm all right, Chester. Doc fixed your head. Wasn't much he could do for Kel, though. I hit him. If you didn't, he sure died for nothing. He was fast, all right. Boys say you made him look like a sleepy burro. Never even cleared his holster. And my head says different. You didn't get that from Kel. What do you mean? Tennessee was up the street with a rifle. He creased you. Huh? Where is he now? I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He rode out of town before I could stop him. I was the only one who saw him. I was coming up street to find you. All right. Let's get out of here. Did you find anything in the wagons? No, sir. But I found Tennessee's wife. Wife? That's right, Mr. Dillon. In a small wagon next to his. He's a squaw man. His wife, the Indian girl. Well, let's find her. All right, Chester. Which way? Edge of town, Mr. Dillon. Well, let's go. You talked to the wife? Yes, sir. Found out Tennessee and Kell were friends, all right. They left her here night before last and arranged to meet her here today. She said they were driving empty wagons when they left her. Ask her what tribe she belonged to? Didn't have to ask, Mr. Dillon. I could tell by her beads. She's an Arapaho. She was there, all right. Crouched by the wheel of a wagon. Her face was bloody. And she stared into a small campfire. Rocking back and forth without a sound. She wasn't beat up when I left her, Mr. Dillon. Where's your husband? He's gone. Gone where? He's gone. Tell me which way he went. I'll bring him back to you. No. You law man. Your husband had a white buffalo hide, didn't he? Tell me. No. Other man. Kill white buffalo. Then your husband took the hide away from him? Well, he buy. He buy hide. He didn't buy him. He killed two men to get him. 
He killed with Indian paint on his face. He left an Arapaho war rattle. He wants the blame to come to your people. If the white men think the Arapahoes are on the war path, the soldiers will come. No. Arapaho. Peaceful. Where's the white hide? What'd your husband do with it? He tell me. Buried. Where? Where's it buried? There. Back there. By tree. Go dig it up, Chester. And then stay with her till I get back. You going after him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, as soon as she tells me which way. All right, Mr. Dillon. You're white man. No good. Now tell me which way he went. You let him go. He not come back. I can't let him go. If I do, the soldiers will come after your people. He beat you and he ran away from you. Now he'll bring death to your tribe unless I get him. Where did he go? He arrived to where moon sleep. I rode east. Tennessee had had about an hour's start, but I figured to make up most of that before sunrise. The prairie was open and flat except for an occasional roll. And the Arkansas River would keep him from cutting south. His best bet for a fresh horse would be Kinsley, and I rode hard for it. It was just turning daylight when I rode in. Well, howdy, Marshal. Morning. Good morning. Got a place I can water my horse? Trough right there. Just let him loose. He'll find it. Thank you. Looks like you come a long way. Dodge. Now, the fella here just a few minutes ago been riding hard, too. He come from up Pawnee Way, though. Tall, dark, riding a vinegar roan? Yeah, that's right. You get a fresh horse here? I had to send my boy out to Corral to get one for him. He'll be back soon. You mean he's still here in town? Yeah. Asked about breakfast, so I sent him over to the Witter Hilliard's place. Uh, right over there, across the road. Thank you. I'll be back. Say, you after that fellow, Marshal? Yes? Understand you're serving breakfast, ma'am. Why, sure thing, Marshal. Dylan! That's right. Give me a clear way out the door. Or I'll kill you. Come by me, Tennessee. I'll come shooting. That's all right. But just be sure you get me this time. All right. <laughs> No, I... I'm all right, Marshal. He looks kind of dead. Yeah. Bad one, hmm? Huh? Yes, I'm. Gunfighter. Thief. Killer. What's your name, Marshal? Dillon, ma'am. Matt Dillon. I, uh... I'm sorry about... Marshal, when my husband brought me out here 15 years ago, Indians burned this place down three times. I'm used to killing. You want to carry him out? I'll go fix you that breakfast. Thank you, ma'am. It's a long ride back to Dodge. Go 
Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Joel Murcott, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Stan Waxman, John Daner, and Larry Dobkin, with Sam Edwards, Julian Bayef, Tom Holland, and Mary Lansing. Marley Bayer is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Something new in CBS Radio Newsroom coverage, World News with Robert Trout presents as a special weekly feature an interview with a crack CBS Radio News correspondent. This correspondent flies in from his post overseas to give you his authoritative eyewitness viewpoint on latest developments. Tomorrow afternoon on most of these same stations, World News with Robert Trout. This is Clarence Cassell speaking. And remember, from now to November, you'll find intensive, impartial campaign coverage on the CBS Radio Network. territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. That's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Sure is hot today, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Used to get hotter in Sweetwater, though. Texas? Yes, sir. It, but I wasn't there very long. No. <laughs> what'd you do there, Chester? Oh, I was a salesman, Mr. Dillon. Salesman? <laughs> well, what'd you sell? A lightning rod. Lightning? Oh. Well, now, there are good things to have, Mr. Dillon. Why, I had a line of well, lightning rods. Why, don't explain you... it to me, Chester. <laughs> Too hot. Well, I'll go get us some beer. Maybe that'll help. I don't think I want any beer, Chester. Well, then, why don't you just go take a CS, Mr. Dillon? I'll stay here in the office. <laughs> Why don't you just leave me alone? Huh? All right, Mr. Dillon. Hey, the marshals. Yeah, what do you want, Doc? A couple of cowboys been feeling their liquor over at the Texas Trail. That's what saloons are for, isn't it? Yeah, they were giving Kitty a bad time. Oh? She got rid of them now. But they're down at the end of Front Street now, making remarks and pestering the town ladies. It just might lead to trouble. Well, I'm not going to walk down there in this heat just to lecture a couple of hard-nosed cowboys. I'll go, Mr. Dillon. Oh, good, Chester. You go, huh? Just tell them to take it easy and leave the ladies alone. Yes, sir, I will, Mr. <laughs> Dillon. Hey, lady. You ever been to Texas? Real men down there. Not like these short dress Kansas. <laughs> All right, boys. Now, that's enough. Who's this? A preacher, maybe. 
<laughs> Boys, <laughs> Marshal Dillon sent me down here. And we're going to send you right back, fella. Mr. Dillon said you can have all the fun you like, but to leave the ladies alone. That's all dang trouble, these Dodge ladies. They've been left alone too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what they need is a couple of big-handed Texas men. Yep. <laughs> Look, now, now why don't you go over there to the Alphaganza? I I'll buy you both a beer. You will, huh? Well, that's mighty thoughty of you, mister. We just don't want any trouble, that's all. Sure we don't. And I got an idea how we won't have any. Wait till I get on my horse here. Stay with our friend a minute, Travis. Hey, mister, uh, I'll make a bet. What kind of bet? What do you mean? Any kind. You name it. Come on. Well, but I don't... Oh, hey, hey, I got him! Uh, he spilled his gun, Trevor. Pick it up and grab your horse. Yeah, get this rope off of me. Maybe it'll yeah. wear off, mister. You're going for a ride. Oh, drag him, Tobo, drag him. Let's go! Yeah. Chester, Marshal. What? What? Who got Chester? Several cowboys. The ropesmen dragged him out of town. Come on. Well, well, which way? West. I'm going with you. Hurry. Uh. Come on, right. There they are, but they're not dragging anything. They must have cut him loose. Now, there he is, but that's sagebrush. Chester. Chester. Get that rope off his feet, Channel. Look at him. He's bleeding all over. They tore him to ribbons. I'll stay with him, Marshal, if you'd like to. No, Shiloh. Go get our horses up. I want to get him back to the dock right away. All right, Marshal. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. Chester, I got you now. We'll be at the docks soon. Uh -huh. Easy, Chester. Easy, fella. Easy now. I'll uh, carry him when you get tired, Marshal. Uh -huh. I won't get tired, Shiloh. Not for a long time. Well, Doc? Yeah, he's in bad shape, Marshal. The worst is something's bothering his breathing. I don't know what it is. We'll just have to wait and see if it goes away. If he lives the next few days, he'll pull through. Oh, Doc. No, I, I know, I know, I know. But I'll stay right here with him. Why did I have to send him? Why didn't I go? Oh, and I don't blame myself, I Marshall. told him to go, didn't I? Yes, but... Uh, Doc, can, can I talk to him? No, no, Marshal, no. Not for a while. All right, then. Would, would you tell him this for me? I'm going after those men. I'm going to bring them back. Alive. Or at least half alive. In the street outside, waves of heat move back and forth, making things seem unreal. Like Chester lying up there at docks. That seemed unreal somehow. I walked down to the jail, and I went inside, and I sat there for a while. And then all at once, I got up and unbuckled my guns, and I hung them on a peg behind the desk. And I went over to the Texas Trail. I'm over here, Matt. Sit down. Matt, I heard about Chester. How is he? Doc doesn't know for sure. Uh. They were in here bothering you. Who were they, Kitty? I never saw them before. One was a kind of weasel-faced man. 
named Trevitt. And the other? Big man. Real brute. Named Stobo, I think. I see. What outfit, they say? Would it be the crow track? Yeah. The crow track's holding my herd up the river. <laughs> Thank you, Kitty. Wait a minute, Matt. Yeah? It's no business of mine to ask, but where are your guns? It would have been easier for Chester if they'd have shot him and killed him. But I don't see... So I'm not going to shoot them. If Chester dies, I'll see him hanged. Otherwise... Otherwise what, Matt? I don't know. But I'm going to bring him back and... And we'll wait and see. You're taking an awful chance. Maybe. Oh, Matt. Please be careful. Sure. Uh... Kitty. Yeah, ma'am. Look in on Chester once in a while, will you, maybe? Oh, of course I will. Don't worry about him. Thank you, Kitty. So long. Hey, uh, Marshal. What is it, Shiloh? I'll walk outside with you. M Marshal, I want to ride after those cowboys with you. No, Shiloh, I'm going alone. But we could use you here at the jail. Here? I'm going to take two prisoners. I don't know when or how, but I need a jailer when they come in. So I'll bring them in with you, and then I'll... No. Be the... That's something I have to do alone. Marshal, you're a stubborn man. But okay, I'll do it. Keys are in my desk. Uh, here's my horse. I'm going now. Yeah, uh, wait a minute, Marshal. You're not armed. I know it, Shiloh. Goodbye. Who's the trail boss here? Where is he? Here I am, and I don't need any rider. Maybe not, but you got two riders I need. How's that? Just what do you want, mister? That's the crow track outfit, isn't it? That's right. I'm looking for a couple of your men called Stobo and Trevor. They ain't here, mister. And where are they? Well, they come back this afternoon, picked up the gatherings and left. Didn't even wait to get paid off. I'm telling you this just because they're no good, and I'm glad they're gone. Which way'd they go? I wouldn't tell you if I knew, mister. I didn't think you would. Who are you, anyway? I'm a U.S. Marshal out of Dodge. That's so? <laughs> well, I don't know what you want them for, and I don't care, but... How are you going to take them, Marshal? Put salt on her tail? <laughs> <laughs> you ought to at least take a club if you're going after that Stobo. He's mean, he's big. Besides being a Texan. <laughs> We've hung Texans up here before, mister. Marshal. Yeah. I heard Stobo and Trevitt say they were heading west, following the Arkansas. Where are you from, son? Texas, near Waco. And what are you sniveling around and forming on these men for? That Stobo kicked me. Knocked me down and kicked me. All right, son. I'll ride along the Arkansas. But you ride back to Texas and learn how to fight your own battles. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the conventions start next Monday when the Republican Party takes over Chicago. CBS Radio's greatest reporting names and a corps of technical experts manning mobile units and studios covering the convention floor and corridors are all set to bring you history as never before. Whatever happens, wherever it happens, you'll miss nothing when you tune in the conventions on CBS Radio starting next Monday. Now... The second act of Gunsmoke. I 
cut straight down to the Arkansas and followed it west. I rode close to the water where I could use the sound of it for only my cover. After an hour or two, I spotted a hobbled horse alone. Stobo and Trebek must have separated. I got down and followed the animal's tracks as best I could in the moonlight until I caught the dying coals of the campfire on the bank ahead. To one side, I could make out the huddled figure of a man asleep in a blanket. It took a long time to crawl to his head where I saw the weasel face of the man Trebek. His gun belt lay on a saddle blanket in easy reach. I stood up and heaved it out into the river. And as Trevitt sat up with a snap, I kicked him back. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! You sit up again and I'll smash your skull, Trevitt. Don't kill me! Don't kill me! Shut up! Now, where's your rope? I told you to lie down! Now, where's your rope? Under my saddle there. You gonna lynch me? No, but you may hang legally if you live that long. Now keep your arms in that blanket and lie still while I get you roped up here. Who are you, mister? Yeah, that'll do it. Let's just say I'm a good friend of a man you dragged out of Dodge this morning. Stobo was in on that, too. It was his idea. He did it. Don't worry. I'll find Stobo. You going to leave me like this? I'll be back. You ain't even carrying a gun. Too bad for you, I'm not. Now, Trevor, I'm going to throw you across my horse and tie you on. He'll take you under Dodge right to the jail. When you get there, tell Shiloh who you are if you can still talk. And he'll give you a nice, clean cell. You're the marshal. I'll be back when I find Stobo. You can't do it, Marshal. I'll die on that, son. Ride like that across a horse. No, no, listen. Stobo's about a mile upriver. We had a row and I left him. See, I, I told you, Marshal. Uh, let me go now. Trevor, how would you like to go to Dodge behind my horse with a rope around you? No, 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 Marshal. Don't kill me. I'll pack you on now. <laughs> Tied Trevitt across my horse and started him off in the direction of Dodge, and then I forgot about him. Stobo was next. I rode west on Trevitt's horse. Dawn was just breaking when I saw him. Crouched behind a campfire. Cooking breakfast. His horse was saddled and stood nearby. I rode straight up, got down, and walked over. You lost, stranger? No. I'm not lost. Stobo. No tricks, mister. I don't see a gun, but no tricks. Relax, Stobo. I'm unarmed. Who are you? Matt Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Out of Dodge. You're a long way from Dodge, Marshal. Stobo, you and your pal had some... On with a friend of mine yesterday. You hurt him bad. Maybe you killed him. <laughs> you rode out here without a gun to tell me that? You're the craziest marshal I ever saw. <laughs> I'm going to shoot you, marshal, and bury you in the river. What do you think of that? I expected you would. Huh? But unless you want it on your conscience that you refuse to feed a man on the trail, you better give me a piece of that pork first. You're about the coolest man I ever saw, Marshal. Do I eat? <laughs> sure you do. Sure. You just stand right there across the fire and don't move. I have to shoot you before you've been fed. I know. It's too bad I... Only got one dish for your last meal, Marshal. A man can keep sassy on meat alone, Stobo. <laughs> yeah, he sure can. Well, looks about done. At least this here piece says you can't... All right, I got your gun, Stobo, so don't try anything. You burn me! You burn me! You Just a few coals, it won't hurt you. Now shut up and get on your horse. Oh, kill you for this, Marshal! You can't hurt me like that! On your horse! 
Come on now. Get up there. Now, you just sit there, Sobo. I'm going to throw a noose around your neck, so keep your hands down. There now. Now, you ride toward Dodge. And you do anything I don't like, and I'll jerk you off your horse and drag you the rest of the way. Now, ride. Jail's on the left. You see it? I see it. All right, pull up. Shiloh! Shiloh! Well, hello, Marshal. This other one? Yeah. Private, get here. More dead than alive, but he's here. It was rough, Marshal. Real rough. Yeah. Shiloh, how about Chester? Tell me. Doc ain't sure yet, but he's alive. Lock Stobo up. I'm going over to Doc's. All right, you get down. Walk straight, or I'll shoot you through both knees. Chester was asleep, but the doc let me take a look at him. Seemed to me he had more trouble breathing than before. But the doc said another day might see him out of it. And there was nothing I could do. So I went up for a steak and some sleep. And the next morning, I went back to the jail. Morning, Marshal. Everything all right, Shiloh? Doc looked over your prisoners. Trevor's pretty sick yet, but Stobo's all right. Got a few burns is all. Nothing could hurt that, Moose. A hanging might. Sure, but what if Chester pulls through? You can't hold us in, Marshal. There's no law that says... I don't like the sound of your voice, Trevor. But you can't Be hold... quiet. Don't worry, Trevor. There's nothing... You too, Stobo. Uh... Shut the door, Shiloh. I don't even want to look at him. Sobo's a mean one, but I feel kind of sorry for Trevor. And go cry about it someplace else. I don't feel sorry. Don't you take it out on me, Marshal. I didn't send Chester off to do my job. I, uh... Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry. Go get some breakfast, huh, Shiloh? I'll, I'll, I'll wait here now. Uh, I'll be back later. <laughs> Doc? Well, well, what is the doc coming? <laughs> Chester. He's going to be all right. What? You sure? Well, of course, Marshal. His breathing suddenly changed. The pressure's off somewhere. Oh, he's going to be fine. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> of course, he'll be in some pain for a while yet. But... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Doc, I'll, I'll come see him in a little while. I'll tell him for you, Mark. All right, come on, Trevor. Where to? Come on, I said. What's up, Marshal? I'll be back for you, Stobo. I'll get going. Come on. <laughs> Stobo did it. Not me. You, you can't do anything to Shut me. Shut up. Trevor, your horse is down at the National. Go get on it. You turning me loose? Get your horse and ride, and don't ever come back to Dodge. Not while I'm alive. Now go on before I change my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Sure, I'll go. you do with Trevor? Put a knife in him? I turned him loose. Now, come on, get out of that cell. Am I free, too? You will be in a little while. So the doc, Marshal Chester. Hey, uh, where are you going with Stobo? Going to shoot me in the back, probably. That right, Marshal? I'm going to do what I should have done three days ago when I sent Chester after you. Bring him outside, Shiloh. Let's go, Stobo. 
slow and easy. Bring him over here, Shiloh. You're gonna drag me, is that it? You try that. That's what I... you'd do, isn't it, Stobo? Don't try. Never it. mind. Shiloh, hold my guns. Here. What the? <laughs> oh, I get it. You're gonna fight me. Oh, Marshal, you're crazier than I thought. Why, I'll tear your throat out. If he wins, let him go, Shiloh. Maybe I will. I said you'll let him go. All right, Marshal, all right. Maybe you are crazy, but I guess this is your party. Come on, Marshal. <laughs> I'll make it short for you. Real short. Stand back, everybody. Get back, do you hear? You're big, Stobo. But you're stupid. You're ugly stupid. Why, you... I'll kill you! Give me my guns, Shallow. Here. He don't look too good, Marshal. I'd better get that doc. He's hurt, but he isn't dead. If he can't ride, throw him on a stage. We get him out of here. If I see him again, I'll shoot him. Chester, can, can I come in? Yes, Mr. Stella. My, what happened to you? I, I've been lecturing a couple of hard-nosed cowboys. One in particular. Oh, I, I see. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. Those two sort of got the drop on me. Yeah, it sure did. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I've been thinking, and, and, uh, yeah, what is it, Chester? Well, Mr. Dillon, I, I, I'm not much help to you here. Maybe I better just... That's uh, enough, Chester. Well, but I, I've been thinking Well, that... just stop thinking. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Now, look, Chester, I'm going to tell you something. I, uh, I, I need you here. You see, you're the only man in Dodge I can really trust. The only one. Yes, sir. Well, you you can trust me, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I, I, I know. And I'm thanking you, Chester. <laughs> but you, you're sure no help to me lying there, you know. No help at all. Well, I, I don't even stay here long. The doc says I'll be up and around again... Look, uh, Chester, I, I, I tell you what, I, I'll go get patched up and then we'll make Kitty come over and fix us some steaks and we'll, we'll have some beer too, huh? Well, what do you say? My, that'd be fine, Mr. Dillon. My, I'd sure like that. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Paul Dubov, Lou Krugman, and Georgia Ellis, with Don Diamond, Gil Stratton, and Jack Crucian. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. 
Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Meet Millie. This delightfully funny little secretary is heard from every Sunday evening here on CBS Radio. Audrey Totter stars as Millie, a gal with a one-track mind on the subjects of love and marriage, especially where the boss's son is concerned. Remember, you can now meet Millie every Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, tune in history starting next Monday. Hear the Republican Convention on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It had been some time since we'd had any real trouble. Anything more than throwing a few juiced-up cowboys in jail to sober up for a few hours. And I liked it peaceful for a change. And I hoped it would stay that way. Well, that morning I'd gone to take a few catfish out of the Arkansas. When I got back to the office, I found a note from Chester. Saying he's at the Alifraganza having a beer. Hello, John. Over here, Mr. Dillon. Any luck, sir? Oh, about a dozen, Chester. We'll have them for supper. No, oh, that'll be fine. Oh, I, I, I've been telling Mr. Carter here about you, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Carter? Robert P. Carter. How do you do, Marshal? Hello, how are you? Buy you a drink? Well, huh. thank you. Yes, I, I believe I will. Uh, I think I'll have a beer. Bartender? A beer. Yes, Mr. Sir. Carter came in on the stage from Denver last Saturday. Oh, you live in Denver, Mr. Carter? Oh, heavens no. New York, Marshal. I've only been west a few months, investing money in gold mines and cattle and the like. Mr. Carter's very rich. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Chester, I will be if Mother Nature holds out. His girl is coming in on the stage today, Mr. Dillon. Oh, is that so? My fiancé, Marshal. He met her in Denver, but she couldn't get ready in time to come here when he did. Ah, I see. I had to come ahead on business. Couldn't wait. We'll take the Santa Fe to St. Louis from here. They're going to be married in St. Louis, Mr. Dillon. Wow. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but is the stage always this late? He's worried, Mr. Dillon, with his girl on stage and all. <laughs> It'll be a long, Mr. Carter. You talking about the stage? Oh, hello, Shiloh. Shiloh says he's been sitting there by himself all morning, Mr. Dillon. Since last night, Chester. You know something about the stage, Shiloh? Only that it's carrying 50000 in gold out of Leadville. 
So? So maybe that's why it's late. What do you mean, man? Well, if somebody wanted that gold, they'd have to stop the stage long enough to get it unloaded, wouldn't they? Bandits. He means bandits. Now, now hold it, Mr. Carter. You're already bleeding that nobody shot you yet. Uh, what? But nothing, nothing, nothing. Just take it easy. The stage will get here, all right. It's off on a little late. Uh, but this man says it might have been held up. Why, there may have been a shooting. Well, now, now, he's just daydreaming. That's all. Wait, wait a minute. Listen, huh? Well, there it is now. Oh. <laughs> See, Mr. Carter, there was nothing to worry about. It got here all right. Yes. Hey, Marshal, come here. What is it, Jim? <laughs> Got held up, Marshal. What? Lost 50,000 gold. Where'd this happen? About 20 miles back near Cottonwood Draw. But Anybody shot? Another shot fired. He tricked it. But James! Marshall... Where's James? <laughs> Driver! Where's the girl who was on this stage? What's happened to her? That's what I started to tell you, Marshal. There's a tree across the road. We got down to move it. This rider got the drop on us. He's all alone. Never mind all that. Where's the girl? He took the gold, took the girl, too. What? He took Jane? You mean to tell me you let him take Jane? Well, now, mister, there weren't much choice. He held a shotgun on us. They're gone before we could do a thing. Oh, but this, this is impossible. Now, take it easy, Mr. Carter. We'll find them. You'll right. find them? You were off fishing when it happened. What kind of law is there around here, anyway? Easy, Mr. Carter. I took one of the team after Marshal, but I couldn't get near him. He had an extra saddle horse with him. Put her on that. I see. But I don't think he planned on kidnapping that girl. Where it was, he just looked at her and told her to come along. Did you recognize him, Jim? No. No, his horses are both sorrels. By no. heaven, Marshal, you better get her back here at once, or I'll take this up with Washington. I'll see you disgraced. Shut up, Carter. Chester, go get our horses and a couple of rifles. I'll get a few more details from Jim here. Well, don't you want a posse, Mr. No, Bill? there'd be too much shooting around that girl. Now hurry, will you? Yes, sir, I'll hurry, Mr. Bill. Mark my words. You'd better have Jane back here by nightfall, Marshal. You care to ride along, Mr. Carter? No. No, I, I'm, I'm not equipped for that sort of thing. I, I'll take care of matters at this end. Yeah. All right, now, Jim, now tell me first exactly what happened. Well, we just come down into the draw about 100 yards from the creek. The blood-red sun was drooping over the edge of the prairie when Chester and I reached Cottonwood Draw. We rode hard until night fell, and then we had to stop and wait for daylight. But with morning, we drew a heavy rain that washed out every track. We rode on anyway. For the next three days, we scouted a big piece of that country. But it was hopeless. Finally, we headed back to Dodge. Empty-handed. Bartender, bring me a bottle, will you? Sure, Matt. Where is she, Marshal? Is she all right? Carter, I'm... I'm sorry. What? You mean you didn't find them? Rain washed out their trail first morning. We, we never picked it up again. They could be anywhere. You came back without her. We did what we could, Carter. Now we'll just have to wait for word of some kind. You'll be seen sooner or later. Wait. Well, I won't wait. This will cost you your job, Marshal. I promise you that. Look, Carter, if it'd make you feel better, why don't you ride out yourself? It isn't my job to keep the law around here, Marshal. It's yours. Yeah. <laughs> Say, Marshal. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, what is it, Shiloh? Big Kate wanted to see you when you got back. Asked me to tell you. Big Kate? Oh, all right, thank you. Come in. No luck, eh, Matt? How'd you know, Kate? I can tell by looking at you. It's thousands and thousands of miles, that prairie. It'd been just luck if we'd found them. Nobody's blaming you, Matt. No? Hey, Carter is. And I suppose it's hard on him. His fiance and all that. Carter's no good, Matt. Well, I never liked him, but I suppose that doesn't matter. And I'll tell you why he's no good. 
Do you know something, Kate? Hmm. Carter's been drunk a lot while you were out. He was bragging to one of the girls last night. Bragging? What, about what? Not much, to my way of thinking. Well, go on. Well, to make it short, seems Jane's father got into a big deal with Carter up in Denver. Yeah. Carter got him tied up good and then threatened to ruin him. Oh, well, so what happened? He didn't ruin him. He took Jane instead. Yeah. Well, maybe she likes him. <laughs> you don't know much about women, do you, Matt? You think a boughten bride is likely to be in love with the man? So that's what I have to bring her back to. Well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> what can I do, Kate? You just have to wait and see what turns up. <laughs> I waited. I waited a week. Carter was drunk the whole time, telling everybody how he was going to fix me good. I'm not doing much about it, except stay out of my way. And things were fairly quiet. Chester and I spent most of our time in the office. Well, he sure fooled me, Mr. Dillon. Oh, uh, Carter? Yes, sir. He seemed like such a nice fella. And so rich. Uh, he's rich, all right. But poor in spirit. <laughs> You've been going to church again, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon, last Sunday. Oh, last Sunday. Uh, didn't it uh, rain last Sunday? Oh, I like church, Mr. Dillon. But I sure do hate to get all dressed up. <laughs> you the marshal? Yeah, I am. Here you've been looking for a man and a woman. You know anything, mister? My name's Chad Brown. Just rode in from Satana. Yeah? There was a man and a woman about 80 miles back on the trail. What color horses were they on? Well, as soon as they saw me, they rode all, so I didn't get very close. But both horses were the same color. I guess maybe so. Yeah. Are you willing to ride back with me, Mr. Brown? I don't know, Marshal. I've got an awful thirst. That woman's out there against her will. I'll go. I'll get our horses. Uh, no, 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 Chester. Uh, be better if you wait here this time. We'll be back in a few days. With luck. Let's go, Mr. Brown. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, Frank Fontaine now brings you comedy with four members of the Frank Fontaine family, guest stars, and a delightful cast of entertainers. Sunday nights on CBS Radio. Listen in for the Frank Fontaine Show tomorrow night. It's refreshing summer listening. So, just for fun, try the Frank Fontaine Show tomorrow night on CBS Radio. Now, the second act. Of gun smoke. Chad Brown and I covered the 80 miles in a day and a half. The outlaws' trail headed south for a few miles and then turned northeast back in the general direction of Dodge. It was hot and still. On the horizon, there were occasional flashes of heat lightning. And then in the distance, we saw the long, low cloud of yellow dust that spelled cattle. A Texas herd trailing north. The kidnappers' tracks led straight into it, and an hour later, we pulled up not far from the swing of the herd. A line of long horns stretched for several miles across our trail. We watched him, looking for a lag to ride through. All of a sudden, a rider came hallooing down on us. Hold up! Hold up there! Oh, oh, oh! You ain't aiming to cross that herd, are you? Have you seen anything of a man and a woman around here, mister? Was they mounted? Yeah, a couple of sorrels. It don't matter. I ain't seen nothing but cattle and cowboys for six weeks. Besides, these cattle are plenty uneasy. 
They've been dry since yesterday morning. That heat lightning ain't soothing to them. This herd's crossed the trail of an outlaw and a kidnapped woman, mister. That's so. Well, you just have to wait. You can ride around a draw back there, but you can't cut through this herd, mister. Look, I'm a U.S. Marshal out of Dodge, and I haven't got any time to waste. You think we well, can... Well, I possibly... sure appreciate your problem, Marshal, but I can't help you. I'm trail boss of this outfit, and I got 3,000 head of cattle here worth maybe $20 a head at Dodge. They're too nervy now, and I sure can't chance your touching them off by riding through there. I guess he's right, Marshal. Should be pretty risky from the look of them. They're moving too fast now. Yeah, I know. Just that I hate to lose the time. You got more time than I got cattle, Marshal. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But I won't attempt to stampede, mister. We'll ride around the drag. We'll see you in Dodge. The Alifraganza still running? Yeah, it is. Mostly on Texas money. Adios. We rode down along the herd and back up the other side about a four-mile detour. But we picked up the trail again and followed it till dark. Next morning, we found the outlaw still headed straight for Dodge. And all we could figure was that he must be new to the country and just plain lost. Naturally, he'd want to avoid asking questions of anybody. By noon, we were in sight of town, and during the last hour, neither Brown nor I said a word. Finally, we rode up Front Street and got down at the jail. We got him, Mr. Dillon. They rode right in here early this morning. Gave himself up, huh? Yes, sir. I got the man locked up in back, and the money is over at the bank. Oh, good. How's the girl, Chester? Oh, she's fine. A little tired, but fine. Yeah. Well, what's his story? Who is he? He calls himself Scott Cooley, but he won't say anything more at all, Mr. Dillon. I, I just gave up on him. I thought I'd better wait for you. Yeah, all right. I'll talk to him first, and then I want to see the girl. Where is she? I didn't like it, Mr. Dillon, but I didn't see what I could rightly do about it. What do you mean? What happened? Well, she sure didn't want to go with him, but that Mr. Carter came here and just the same as dragged her off. She went finally, but I sure don't like it. Well, they didn't leave Dodge, did they? Oh, no, sir. There's no train till tomorrow. They're at the hotel. Oh, all right. I'll go over there later, Chester. Hey, yeah, so you're Scott Cooley, huh? You're new around here, aren't you? Well, anyways, I never saw you before, Marshal. Well, I've tried hard enough to meet up with you, Cooley. You're in trouble, you know, bad trouble. Marshal, if you've got anything to say, just say it right out. <laughs> I got nothing to say. I'm just curious why you rode into Dodge, that's all. What do you care? I'm here. You got the money back and... Uh... And What? Oh, leave me alone, Marshal. Just leave me alone. You gotta talk sometime. Now, listen, Marshal. I'm ready to serve my time. That's why I gave myself up. But talk, no. I don't have to talk. Not for you. Not for anybody else. Mm-hmm. All right, Cooley. Have it your way. Marshal. Yeah? Marshal, you... You going to... See, Jane? Yeah. Why? Well, what are you going to see her about? Find out what happened? Yeah. Marshal, I don't suppose you'd let me out of here just long enough to kill Carter. Now, you mean the girl told you about it? I him. wouldn't care if I hanged for it. It'd be worth it to kill him. Mm-hmm. Tell me something... What makes you think what you did's any better? Why? Well, you wouldn't understand, Marshal. But you... Uh, you do what you can for her, will you? Anything else you want to tell me? No, that's all. <laughs> Oh, 
is it? Matt Dillon. What do you want? Open the door, Carter. I want to talk to the girl. Some other time, Mark. You want me to kick the door open? <clears throat> You're asking for trouble, Carter. Uh, how do you do, miss? I'm Marshal Dillon. How do you do, Marshal? I, uh, I know you've been through a lot, miss, but I have to get the whole story from you so as I can file the proper charges against this outlaw, Scott Cooley. You want to use me to put him in prison? Is that it? Well, he's committed two crimes, robbery and kidnapping. We'll want him up for both. Well, doesn't the fact that he gave himself up and, and returned the money help at all? I, I'm afraid I don't gather your drift. Then let it go at that, Marshal. We're leaving Dodge on the next train. So Jane won't be here to testify anyway. No? Is that what you have in mind, Jane? Oh, no. I mean, I don't know. Oh, please. She's upset enough. Marsha, leave her alone. If I want anything out of you, Carter, I'll knock it out. Now, shut up. You can't talk to me like that. Wait. Marshal, I'll, I'll tell you all about it, but first... Yeah? Well, not in front of him. Make him go out, and then I'll tell you. All right, Carter. Outside. Don't you order me around. This is my room. And... I'll throw you. Now, if I open the door and find you around, I'll throw you all the way downstairs. Now get it. All right, now. Jane, you can talk. Can I trust you, Marshal? Really trust you? Well, that's up to you. But I'll tell you this, I know about Carter. About you and Carter, that is. Then you, you know how I hate him. Yeah? But right now I'm curious about this kidnapping. What happened? Why did Cooley give himself up? Because we decided we, we couldn't live being hunted down the rest of our lives. Ah, so you were in on it with him, huh? No, Marshal. First time I ever saw Scott Cooley was when he held up the stage. I'd like to believe that. Well, very simple, Marshal. I love Scott Cooley. What? I love him. Oh, now look, Jane. Girls like you just don't go around falling in love with outlaws. Don't they, Marshal? No, they don't. I did. Then either you're crazy or you're lying to me. And if you weren't a woman, I'd throw you in jail right along with him. I'm a woman, Marshal, but I've no objection to going to jail with Scott. Now, then you admit you're his accomplice. No. I suppose it's hard for you to understand, Marshal. It is. Well, I'll try to make it simple. You see, Scott doesn't know why he took me with him when he held up the stage. He's never done anything like that before. It just seemed perfectly natural to him. He saw something he wanted and he took it. That's all. I'm afraid the court will look at it somewhat differently. Well, I, I suppose he'll go to prison for the holdup, but, but not for kidnapping. Why not? Because I'll testify that I went with him of my own free will. I almost wish you two hadn't ridden back to Dodge. Marshal. Yeah. You said you know about Bob Carter and me. Yeah. Well, Scott's been wild and, and he's done wrong, but... But he's never done anything really evil. Well, maybe you're better off with Cooley. If he straightens out. You know I am. Don't you, Marshal? It's no business of mine. I, I'm a peace officer and not a matchmaker. My job's to keep Cooley under arrest and get him up for trial. And that's all. Now, what you do is your own business. You can testify any way you like. I, I can't stop that. Oh, please. Marshal, help me. There's no one else who can. Yeah, who is it? It's Carter. Open this door. Huh. Well, gentlemen, there are four of us here, Marshal. We figure you've talked to Jane long enough. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have, Mr. Carter. You're leaving. Yeah, yeah, we're leaving. Are you ready, Jane? Oh, thank you, Marshal. Yes, 
I'm ready. Jane isn't going with you. I've just put her under arrest. Under arrest? I arrest anybody I think needs arrest in Mr. Carter, and I'm not in the habit of explaining why. There's a law about that. You're on dodge, Mr. Carter. Come along, Jane. You can't do this, Dylan. We won't stand for it. Ah, you're a fool, Carter. I know these three bums you got with you, and they don't want to draw on me any more than you do. You fed them some liquor and promised them more. For that, they'll do anything, anything but face me in a gunfight. Am I right, boys? Huh? Well, I take it I am. All right, now get out of my way. Huh? You go first, Jane. You stay here, Jane. Take your hands off her. <laughs> Just step over him, Jane. Mr. Dillon, I don't like to say anything. Well, then don't, Chester. But I can't help it, Mr. Dillon. This is the first time you've ever jailed a woman, and I just don't like it. <laughs> Good. What? I don't like it either, Chester. What's this all about, Mr. Dillon? Chester, Jane and Cooley are in love. My. <laughs> don't look so dewy eyed about it. Cooley's got to stand trial yet, you know. I want no part of this, Marshal. Now what, Shiloh? I never did like that, Carter. Well, what's he up to? Oh, sir, he's drunk and he's buying liquor for everyone. He's making a lot of talk. There's about 20 men with him now. Where? Texas Trail. Nobody likes it about this girl. Looks like they'll come over here and try to bust her out of jail. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Those horses still out back. Yes, sir. I was going to put them away later. No, leave them, leave them. Uh, now, will you get over to the Texas Trail and stall those men for a while? Huh? All right, Mr. Dillon. Come on, Shiloh. Not me. I'm going to bed. I got two months last night. Cooley? Mm -hmm. Come on up. What is this? Just Martin? hurry it up, will you? Let's go, Jane. Oh, no, no. Stay where you are, Jane. I don't You'll do like what this. I tell you, Cooley. It's all right, Scott. We can trust him. Yeah, but I don't know what he's Scott. got. Scott. Well. All right, Jane, if you say so. All right, now I'll back. Yeah, that way. Now, come on, let's move. All right, you take the gray horse, Jane. He's gentle enough. But hurry, will you? Sir, come here. Come on, boy. Where are we going, Marshal? We're going to Hayes City. Cooley's going to stand trial there. Yeah. They got the money back, Scott. They can't do much to you. I know. But there's that, that kidnapping, too. I won't testify. That's all. Jane, you're going to have to testify. You'll be in contempt of court if you... Refused. Then I'll lie. Anyway, I did go of my own free will. After a while, anyway. That's perjury. But you don't have to do that either. There's an easier way. How? Oh. Well, before I deposit Cooley in the Hayes City Jail, we might just make a little stop. What do you mean, Marshal? Stop where? We, uh, we're going to stop at the preacher's. You know, a married woman can't testify against her husband. <laughs> Come on, honey, let's ride. Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were John Stevenson, Larry Dobkin, and Patricia Walter, with Mary Lansing, Herb Ellis, Jonathan Hole, Jim Nusser, and Frank Gerstle. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week 
as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow, a new feature is added to CBS Radio's On a Sunday Afternoon program when Eddie Gallagher introduces the Main Street Music Hall with handsome Bob Carroll and pretty Eugenie Baird as your singing stars. On a Sunday Afternoon is heard on most of these same CBS Radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, daytime is a gay time with Arthur Godfrey on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. You gotta get welcome to Dodge City proper like. Hey, you there, mister. I said you. You address me, Mason? I reckon I am. You a preacher? Not exactly. You dress like a preacher. If you'll excuse me. Back up, fancy pants. You ain't no preacher. I figure I'm making you dance some for the folks. You think you can hoorah me? Dude, I said dance. Dance or the next shot will take off one of your toes. I don't think I'd like that. Doc, no. All right, so and put up the gun. Marshal, you got a wild and woolly town here. Marshal, you move aside. I'm going to make this grinning dude kick up his heels for us. I'd say that might be quite a trick, Thorne. Unless he's changed a lot since I last met him. Have you, Doc? Not for the good, Matt. <laughs> I was afraid. Well, you pacey faced tenderfoot. I said for Shut you. Shut up, Thorne. He's drunk, Doc. He's dead. You just don't know it yet. I'll take it good if you'd meet me later at my office. All right, Matt. To you. Well, that's sure a lot of talk. Now I'm going to shoot that dude's boot heels. Fire one shot and I'll pistol whip you. Thorn. What's that? You're kind of forgetting who's holding a gun, ain't you? Oh! I wasn't forgetting. Oh, my wrist. You broke my wrist. I doubt it. Now, let's go to jail. Oh, you can't put me in jail. I'm Thorne Finley. Move. Oh, you wait like he'll be Jack about this. And I will, too. Do that. He might be grateful to me for saving your neck. You pulled some fool stunts, Thorne, but you've never been closer to dying than just a minute ago. Do you mean from that fancy pants? Oh, I could handle six like him. That makes you a lot of men. I can name a dozen pretty good gun hands who can't handle one of it. What? That's Doc Holliday. There you are. <coughs> Salute, Matt. Salute, Doc. 
That sounds worse, Doc. Yeah, I got orders to go to Arizona. <coughs> Air's dry there, better for my lungs. Going? Thought I might. Wyatt invited me to visit him. He and Virgil and Morgan are the law down there. Some little mining town called Tombstone. <laughs> well, it sounds peaceful anyway. If it isn't, it will be by the time Wyatt Earp gets through. He is the peacemakingest man I ever met outside of you. <laughs> Matt, who was the teller head down at the depot, anyway? Oh, Thorne? He's just a spoiled kid. Kid? Couldn't be much younger than you. Sure, but Thorne never grew up. His father has coddled him and protected him and gotten him out of scrapes ever since he was a pup. He's never had to be a man. Not with Big Jack Wetner, isn't he? Big Jack. Big Jack Finley? Oh, you know him? I've heard of him. Well, that figures. He owns about half of Kansas. Star in a box runs more cows than he can count. Swings a lot of weight and dodge. Yeah, too much. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, somebody said that Doc Holliday had come into town today and he... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's all right, Chester. Why don't you shake hands with him? Don't mind if I shake with my left hand. It's kind of habit. Yeah, I know. Mr. Dillon has the same habit. He would. How about dinner tonight, Matt? Sure, sure. <laughs> How long will you be in Dodge? Not long. <coughs> Just till I finish a chore. Uh huh. That uh, chore have anything to do with Big Jack Finley? Might say so. I'm gonna kill him. Turn him loose. You, uh, forgot to close the door, Mr. Finley. You're going to turn my boy loose? Well, I'm going to have to do it for you. You got a writ of habeas corpus? Writ? Thorne didn't commit no crime. The charges are drunk and disorderly, disturbing the peace, and attempted assault with a deadly weapon. I was. You still need a writ. But man, Judd and Nathan does what I say, and you know it. Don't you think I can get a writ? I'm sure you can and will. You always do. Then what's the point, Dylan? It's just a lot of useless red tape. It's the law. Mm. Close the door on the way out. All right, Thorne. Didn't I tell you Big Jack would get me out? When are you going to learn you can't save the speech? The law can't touch a Finley. You ought to get smart, Marshal. Like you? Sure, like me. Hi, Big Jack. You okay, son? Fine. Anything else, Mr. Finley? Why, yes. Uh, uh, my boy here is a little boisterous sometimes. I know. High-spirited, you understand? Uh-huh. So? So I want to put a stop to all this nonsense of yours, arresting him every time he kicks up his heels a bit. Well, go on. Well, I'm offering you a job. Let's say, protecting my interests. Two hundred a month. And no work, naturally. <laughs> I see we understand each other perfectly. No work, of course. All I have to do is just shut my eyes whenever Junior here breaks the law, huh? I said we understand each other. There's no need to elaborate on it, Dylan. There's a big need. Only how do I explain to a person like you that some men don't wear a price tag? Huh? How do I explain how I feel about a so-called respectable citizen making the law his private doormat? <clears throat> hey, you're nothing but the stupid gunman I've always thought you were. I understand you took the part of Doc Holliday against my son. I kept Thorne from committing suicide, yeah. And you sided with a notorious killer against an important citizen of this community. Now I'm telling you, Dylan. Holliday. I don't want him in Dodge tomorrow. Doc may be a gunfighter, but he's clear with the law, Finley, and a better man than your son will ever be. What? Why, I... That hurts, doesn't it? You... I'm serving notice, Marshal. You run that killer out of Dodge City... Or I'll do it myself. Big Jack Finley. Cattleman and self-made king of southern Kansas. 
No better or worse than most of the men carving empires out of the West. Until love for his son blinded him to the fact that Thorne Fenley had gone bad. And from here on, I knew the war was on between Big Jack and me. So Big Jack Fenley's going to run me out of town, huh? No. Unless I do it first. Oh? I do something naughty, Matt? Well, you threaten a man's life. <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> and just between friends, man. Anything else, Doc? Not murder. Murder? I can give him an even break. Uh, with you, that's still murder. Uh, don't you think you better tell me about it? Mm-hmm. What if I don't tell you? Now, yeah, then my job's to warn Fenley and try to protect him. You're a tough man to be friends with, man. It applies to you, too, doesn't it? Guess maybe it does at that. Didn't realize how I put you on the spot by spouting off my good intentions. Sorry. Oh, forget it, forget it. <coughs> you want to talk to me? <coughs> All right. Remember a girl named Ruth Davis? Mm-hmm. Died in a riding accident a few months ago. I always wondered if it wasn't suicide. She lost her brother two weeks before that. No accident. No suicide. You sure? Sure. You know, Ruth and her brother ran the ranch alone. Mm -hmm. A man started pestering Ruth, and she hated him. Her brother kicked the man off the ranch. This fellow dry gulps Ruth's brother made it look like a robbery. You have any proof of this? Yeah. Ruth was afraid to go to the law, so she sent a letter to me. Here, read it yourself. She says the man was Finley and says she expects him to try and shut her up for good. Well, that doesn't mean it's Big Jack. I went to see Ruth's folks. They had her belongings. Among them, I found this. Mm. Watch chain. Engraved J.F. on the clasp. Jack Finley. You see why I've got to kill him, Matt? He forced Ruth's horse over that cliff, sure. But do you still think she died accidental? No. But who's responsible is something for a court to decide. Court. With Finley's money and influence, he wouldn't spend five days in jail even if he was convicted, which he wouldn't be. He doesn't own the court. Maybe not, but it's still the most powerful man in the state against a dead girl whose only friend is Doc Holliday. How do you think a judge will decide? Doc, I'm going to ask you a favor. Make it one I can give. I got an idea, but uh, you must let me handle it my way. Give the law a chance. All right, Matt, I can wait. Thank you. I'll keep this letter in chain for a while. All right, but if the law fails, I'll brace Big Jack Finley when he walks out of the courthouse. Then you'll be bracing two men, Doc. Finley and me. Fine day. Well, you're up kind of early just to bring me a weather report, aren't you, Judge Nathan? Huh? Oh, well, I I want to see you. Now go right ahead. You mind if I finish shaving? No, no, please do. Uh, just thought I'd chat with you about the about uh, the families. Uh-oh. Uh, yes, sir. It seems that Big Jack's very upset by your attitude. I'm not surprised. Feels you're a little rough on his boy. I am. Then his boy's a little rough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, perhaps Thorne is high-spirited, like uh, yesterday. Yesterday he was just plain high. <laughs> Tell me, Judge Nathan, how do you like being on Fenley's payroll? Uh, what? You know, you used to be a pretty decent person. Oh, uh, you can't talk to me like Yes, I can. I'm sending a copy of Thorne's record to the governor. Governor. And with it, I'm sending a list of the writs you've issued to get him out of jail and a copy of the court records. I've only tempered my justice with mercy, that's all. Thorne's been arrested for 18 offenses, convicted of 10, spent no time in jail, and paid a total of $15 in fines. I'd say you've been very merciful. Um, you said you were sending this to the governor. 
You haven't actually mailed it yet? No. You got an out. Not that I don't feel justified in any decisions I've made, but uh, such a report might cause undue talk at the Capitol. And ruin your political hopes. Well, my conditions are simple. Get off Finley's payroll now. Very well. And give me cooperation from here on, no matter who's involved. Do that and I shelve the report. I'll do it. Mr. Dillon, trouble's a making. What kind of trouble, Chester? It's Big Jack Finley, Mr. Dillon. He's rounding up his crew at the Alfraganza. They're going to ride Doc Holliday out of town on a rail. Did you cut yourself shaving? <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, don't forget, starting Monday, CBS Radio's tremendous news staff will start bringing you the complete coverage of the Democratic Convention in Chicago. As you found during the Republican Convention, CBS Radio never misses. So starting Monday, stay with CBS Radio all day and evening for the Democratic Convention. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Doc. Doc. What? W wake up, Doc. It's Matt. Oh. What's up? Trouble. Lots of trouble. Big Jack Finley's organizing a little citizens committee of his own hand-picked men coming to escort you out of town. On a rail? Yeah, that's the general idea. Here, take a shotgun. Yeah, I'll hide it under the covers, modest-like. Yeah. I'll wait against the wall here. Good. That'll put him in a crossfire. If it comes to that. There's enough of them. We're in a spot. Yeah, likely we are. You're risking your neck to save me some bruises. One I owe you, friend, Matt. It's my job. Still one I owe you. There he is. Wrap him up. All right, stop right there. I'll shoot the man who takes another step. You think you're going to stop us, Dylan? I think so. Me and Doc. Doc. Show him, Doc. Sure thing, Marshal. Look, boys, surprise. I sure do love surprises. Dylan, I've got a dozen men with me. Well, sure, about six of them will die, Finley, if you don't crawl out of here fast. And guess who'll die first, Big Jack? You there, Moncrief. I always figured you for some brains. Get your boss out of here, quick. You sure talking sense, Big Jack. Shut up, Moncrief. You showing yellow. Oh, but, man, there's nothing here for us to die over. Listen to him, Finley. That greener Doc is holding has 18 buckshot in each barrel. He'll get slaughtered if he triggers that thing. And I'm getting edgy, Finley. And me, if I get a coughing spell, I'm liable to shoot without meaning to. All right, all right. <coughs> this is twice you have made a Finley back down. You'll never get a third chance. Let's get out of here. Doc. Matt, when are you going to arrest him? When I'm ready. Not long. I hope not. Getting impatient to see that man dead. I, uh, got your message, Marshal. I hope it's important. It is, Moncrief. How long have you been foreman for Big Jack? Fifteen, sixteen years. You know him pretty well. Would he be the kind to kill a girl? No, of course not. Because he'd kill a man if he got mad enough, but he wouldn't kill no girl, Marshal. Well, I have proof that he did. A girl and her brother. But it doesn't set right. I'm hoping you can help. What's your proof, Marshal? A letter that names Finley as the man. Ruth Davis wrote it before she died. Ruth Davis. And this watch chain was found with her belongings. 
marks engraved on the back. I know. I uh, was with Big Jack when he bought this chain in Chicago. It was right after his wife died. Big Jack wear it all the time? Mm. You uh, rode the right hunch, Marshal. What? Thorne is your man, just like you figure. He had a yen for the Davis girl, but he kept it quiet. Because he didn't want it known, she throwed him over. But the watch chain. Big Jack gave that to Thorne on his 25th birthday. Whole ranch can testify to that. Mm. Good. All right, thank you, Moncrief. You, uh, gonna try and arrest Thorne? Why? If Big Jack believes Thorne killed that girl, it'll break his heart. Broke her neck. If he don't believe it, then he'll protect Thorne. And, Marshal, there's not enough lawmen in the state of Kansas to make Big Jack give up his son. I've heard of you, too, Judge. Wonder which has heard the worst. Uh -uh. What's that? Uh, why, I... Uh, Judge, I'm here on business. Oh, of course. Uh, come in, won't you? In my study here, so we won't be disturbed. Now, what is it, Marshal? I want you to swear out a warrant for Thorn Finley's arrest. Charge murder. <laughs> I'm sure. <coughs> All right, hold up your right hand. Oh, no, Matt, you wouldn't make me a lawman. If you go, you go as my deputy. I'm not letting you make this a private fight. And with my friends, if they hear I wore a star. All right, Matt, it's your show. You swear to uphold and enforce the laws of this community, the state of Kansas, and the United States to the best of your ability as deputy marshal, so help you God. All of that? All of that. I swear. Here, pin on this badge. All right, man. You know, I'm feeling this badge is going to cramp my style something terrible. We better breathe our horses going up through this pass. We've still got a good ride ahead. How far? Oh, about ten miles. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Matt? Will they fight? Well, Doc. Doc. Stay in your horse, Marshal. Grab some clouds. Keep those hands high. Your queen's on the other side of the pass behind you. That's being smart, Dylan. Queen will drop you if you touch a gun butt. You're handy at this bushwhacking, aren't you, Thorne? If Doc He's is... all right. My slug seems to have bounced off his thick skull. Good. Yeah, let's pull your teeth. Now, better you do it. With your left hand, reach down and across slow. Pull your gun out with your fingertips and toss it away. Nervous? Just cautious. Or maybe this queen doesn't exist, huh, Thorne? Queen! Queen's one of Dad's men, but uh, I pay him extra to work for me. Any more questions? I guess not. There's my gun. The rifle next. I, uh, I got a pen knife in my pants pocket. You know why Holiday came to Dodge? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you do. You wouldn't be riding with him. Well, he's not going to tell any stories to my dad or anyone else. Uh, you can't kill us, you stupid. Not planning on killing you. And what have you got planned? 
A queen's kind of a magician. He's going to make Holiday just disappear. Folks won't care much about one of his kinds. I would. I'd care so much I'd hang you for it. No. No, with Holiday gone, it's your word against mine. And you won't be able to approve a thing, Dylan. You sure of that? I'm sure. Otherwise, I'd take care of you along with Holiday. Now get out and start walking back to town. It's like I told you. Law can't touch a Finley. It was no time for heroics, so I walked. When I reached a turn, I cut back through the rocks, but it was too late. They were gone. And with them, the horses, guns, and Doc Holliday. Two miles up the road, I found my horse turned loose. With a mind full of cold hate, I raced on to the star in a box. On the front porch of the ranch house was one of Big Jack's men. Hold it right there. Out of my way, mister. I'm in no mood to shake hands. Where are you heading, law man? You don't hear well. <laughs> Dylan! Where's Holiday? Friendly? How should I know? Get off my ranch. And where's that prize son of yours? What? Trot him out. I want him. Do you now? What on earth for? Thorn, put that gun away. Oh, no. This is just in case the marshal loses his temper. I've lost it, Junior. Sure. Dylan, I've had all I'm going to stand from you. You just think you have. Where's Holiday, Thorn? Where'd Queen take him? Holiday? Why, well, I haven't the faintest idea. Where is Queen, Dad? The riding fence line, but... See, what... Marshal, we don't know where your friend is. You're under arrest, Dylan. What's that? Ask him to show the warrant. Here. Read it, Finley. What? Oh, no. No, th th that's not possible. The judge wouldn't issue a warrant without proof. He has proof, Thorne. This is a lie. Thorne couldn't be guilty of murder. No. Take a look at his face. Son. Daddy's trying to frame me. D don't let him get away with this. No, I won't. I won't. Get out, Dylan. Man, open your eyes. This is not going to help you. You heard me. I don't believe you, your warrant, or your proof. I believe my son. So get off this ranch. Get out of the state. You let me see you again, so help me, I'll kill you myself. Forget me. You're back in the law. You can't I'm do in my own law. You so do I. Doc Holliday. But you're supposed to be dead. Queen was supposed Queen's to be... the one who's dead. I carry a knife in my boot just for men like him. Thorn, God help me. You are guilty. He sure is. And if he knows any prayers, he'd better get them over with. No, Doc. He goes back with us as our prisoner. You're wrong, Marshal. I'll take care of my son. Dad. Dad no. You rotten, lying, murderous. Please, pup. please don't. I Dad. should have strangled Stand you in the cradle when you were. Stand down, 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 down. Friendly, look out! I threw myself at Fenway's bunk and was hit the floor, rolling away from Thorn as he raised his gun to fire. Then in the doorway, the blood-stained, terrible figure of Doc Holliday went into action. His pale hands blurred over his host. Uh, the roof, Thorn! Uh, uh, Ruth? Thanks, Chester. You sure you want to stay around a while, Doc? Yeah, we're good friends, man. But you're a peace officer. I guess I'm not a very peaceful man. <laughs> you could be, Doc. <laughs> no, I'm not going to change, and you shouldn't. Law needs men like you. No, if I stayed there, there's too good a chance I might cross you. Yeah. Then I'd have to meet you over gun barrels, and it's one thing I'm afraid of. So long, man. Good luck, Doc. My. I never would have thought Doc Holliday was scared of meeting anyone in a gunfight. Hmm. You don't understand, Chester. Doc's afraid because he might beat me.
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Harry Bartell as Doc Holliday, with Lee Millar, Nestor Piva, Ralph Moody, and Tom Tully. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Sunday evening, we invite you to join lovely Doris Day, Spring Byington playing a December Bride, and Audrey Totter as Millie. They're here on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. And in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Good morning, Chester. Matt, I've got to talk to you. Sure. Uh, Chester? Uh, You folks will have to excuse me. I I can't be puttering around the office all day. I'll be in the back if you want me. Yeah? Matt, he's here in Dodge City. I just saw him. He came in on the morning train. You mean Ed Beaudry? Yes. It's been four years, Matt. I'd begun to hope he'd forget. Hope he wouldn't find us. From what you've told me, Beaudry doesn't sound like a man who ever forgets. He's come here looking for Bert. To kill him, he swore he would. Matt, what are we going to do? I don't know. What's Bert think about it? He doesn't know yet. He's busy at the blacksmith shop. Matt, you've got to help us. You're the only real friend we have out here. It might make it easier if I weren't, Janie. I'm supposed to maintain law and order in Dodge. That's my job. Doesn't leave much leeway to mix in on personal quarrels. Well, there's no quarrel. It's just that Ed Beaudry's a hot-tempered fool. Bert never did anything to him. He married you, didn't he? A woman has a right to change her mind, Matt. Maybe Beaudry doesn't think so. Matt, you... You promised me once in Louisville... Yeah. Yeah, I know. All right, Jeannie, go on home and... uh... Don't say anything to Bert. I'll talk to Beaudry. Thank you. I'll never forget it. I... Goodbye, Matt. Janie. 
Chester. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll be right there, Mr. Dillon. Did Ms. Wells leave? Yeah. Fine couple of Wellses. Did you know them before they came out west? Uh, not Bert. I knew Mrs. Wells. I guess we better drop over to the Texas Trail, Chester. There's a fellow in town planning to do some killing. <laughs> A long time. Are you kidding? Hello, Chester. Miss Kitty? Uh, come sit down, Matt. Tell me about things. I can't right now, Kitty. We're looking for a fellow. Thought he might have come in here. Sooner or later, they all do. Stranger, Matt? Uh, yeah. He came in on the morning train. His name's Ed Bouldry. Oh, him? There. The bar, Matt. Third from the end, next to Tulsa Jim Nixon. He's buying Irish whiskey for everybody. Thank you, Kitty. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. Watch yourself, Max. Yeah, sure, Kitty. I'll see you later. All right, bartender. Set up another round of Jamesons for the house. Yeah. Your name, Beaudry? Oh, that's right, mister. Matt Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal here. I'd like to talk to you. Fine. Go ahead and talk. Uh, Tulsa, suppose you'll move on down the bar for a couple of minutes, huh? No, well, now, uh, dear Marshal, this man's a friend of mine. You're not very particular about your friends. Now, go on, Tulsa. Drift. Mr. Beaudry, you, uh, you came here to kill Bert Wells, didn't you? Did I? Well, here's some advice. Don't do it. Take the next train and get out of town. Is that official? Just what's the charge, Marshal? None. Yet. Murder, if you go through it. Oh, not the way I understand it. Murder's one thing. Calling a man in a fair fight, that's another thing. Beaudry, I'm the law here in Dodge, and I don't see it as a fair fight. Bert's a blacksmith, and he's not used to handling a gun. You are. And so I'm told. Who told you, Marshal? I don't know anybody here. And... Wait a minute. Dylan? Yeah. I heard Jeannie mention you. You knew her back in Louisville before she ran off. We'll leave her out of this, Beaudry. So that's it. This isn't official. You're just doing a personal favor for an old friend. Probably a very close friend. Jeannie always did have a weak... I warned you once. (laughs) All right, hold it. Now get up, Beaudry. That was a mistake, Dylan. Now I'd have to kill you, too. I'm not a blacksmith, Beaudry. I'll look you up just as soon as I've finished with Bert Wells. If you kill Bert, you won't have to look me up. See you come here. Uh, I wanted to talk to you, Bert. About what, Matt? Ed Beaudry's in town. Beaudry? Well, it was bound to happen sometime. Has he been bothering Jeannie? No, she just happened to see him get off the train this morning. She came and told me. She shouldn't have done it, Matt. It's not your problem. Maybe it is, Bert. I'm the law in Dodge, and the law doesn't like the idea of personal grudges ended up in a killing. What do you aim to do? I'll prevent it if I can. Well, I wish you luck. You haven't worn that gun for two years, Bert. Why start now? I've got no choice, Matt. You know that. You mean you got no chance? Now, if you let Beaudry call a showdown, he'll kill you. Maybe. Look, Bert, why don't you take to the prairie? Hold up for a week or so while I figure some way of running Beaudry out of town, huh? Would you do it, Matt? Hide out and let somebody else do your fighting for you? Well, what I'd That's do is... That's beside the point, Bert. Jeannie. There's a law against killing. And it's Matt's job to enforce it. If you went away, there wouldn't be any fight. Wouldn't be much honor either, Jeannie. Man can't run and still call himself a man. 
He can run from a mad dog. And that's what Ed Beaudry is. He never had any claim on me. It appears he thought he did. Matt, you know where Beaudry stand? I talked to him in the Texas Trail. He probably took one of the rooms upstairs. Like to walk over there with me? Well, if that's the way you want it. No, Bert, you... you... I'll get my hat. Be right with you. Matt, you've got to stop it. Yeah? How? I don't know. But there must be something you can do. Yeah, there is. The way it's shaping up, I can probably arrest the survivor. Still time to turn back, Bert. Afraid not, Matt. I should have had it out with Baudry back there in Kentucky five years ago. Jeannie wanted to run away and avoid trouble, and she was so beautiful it was hard to argue with her. Yeah, I know. Be hard on her if anything happened to you. Life's always hard on a woman, I guess. Worse out here on the prairie. Look out for her, Matt, in case I... Well, I mean, if anything... Mr. Dillon? Huh? Oh, what is it, Chester? Baudry left the saloon a little while ago. Went over to the livery stable to hire a horse. Huh? I think he's riding out to your place, Mr. Wells. He's been doing a lot of talking. Jeannie will be there alone, Matt. I better get back home. It won't be necessary. Here comes Baudry now. I won't draw unless he does, Matt. Heads up, Chester. Yes, sir. Just riding out to call on you, Wells. I decided you'd had plenty of time to look me up. No reason to, Baudry. Most men would figure they had reason. Somebody been in a local saloon telling their wife's history. What? Baudry, you... All right, hold it. Don't draw, Bert. Chester, cover Baudry. Just keep your hands still, Mr. Baudry. You're fast with that gun, Dylan. Fast enough, Mr. You make Baudry. a good bodyguard. Too bad you can't ride her 24 hours a day. I told you what to expect if you keep pushing this thing, Mr. Baudry. Now use some sense and get out of town while you're still alive. I've been in lots of towns, Dylan. I left them all alive. Wells, I've been planning to kill you for five years. Plans don't always work out. Listen, Will. You got till sundown. After that, I'm going to shoot you on sight. All right, Mr. Baudry. If you finish speaking your piece, move along. Why, surely, Mr. Dillon. See you later. Well, still a couple of hours before sundown. I think I'd like to spend them with Jeannie. I'll see you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Goodbye, Bert. I declare I, I just can't see any way of stopping it, Mr. Dillon. I can't either. I'd sure hate to be in Bert Wells' shoes. I'd hate worse to be in Baudry's. He'll never submit to arrest. Chester, I'm going to have to kill him. Why don't you relax, man? You're nervous as a cat. Yeah, and I'll stay nervous, Kitty, until I find out what's happened to those two. Baudry slipped out the back way just at dusk. The piano player saw him. Yeah. Bert pulled the same trick. I had a couple of boys watching the blacksmith shop, but he managed to give them a slip. There's nothing you can do now, man. Well. Another killing. And you in the middle again. Why, Matt? Why do you do it? It's a job, Kitty. Somebody's got to do it. But why you? 
There are other things in life if you look around for them. Well, maybe I will someday. Will you look my way, Matt? Well, Matt, I, I brought my kit. I'm all prepared. Ah, uh, where are the victims? No victims yet, Doc. You're jumping the gun. Well, I understand it's going to be a real showdown. The boys at the bar are offering two to one on Baudry. That's about the odds, I figure, if the shooting really starts. Oh, oh it'll start all right. Oh, and there's not a thing in the world can stop it. Dill? Chester, what are you doing in here? I told you to watch that street. Yes, sir, I know you did. The fight's as likely to start out there as any place else. No, sir, Mr. Dillon. I guess there's not going to be any fight. What? They just found Baudry lying in an alley down the block. Matt. Somebody sneaked up behind him with a hammer. He's sure dead. <laughs> We'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, what is the connection between the statue in the square and a pair of thugs who are definitely not on the square with the law? Tonight on Gangbusters, hear the complete details of this exciting case taken from actual police files. Remember, it's Gangbusters later tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. Don't miss it. Now... The second act of Gunsmoke. Showing around the house, Mr. Dillon. No. Not the shop either. He might have skipped out. Well, what about his wife, though? I don't know, Chester. I can't figure any of this. It's not like Bert to pull a sneaking trick like that. Hold it. No move. He's there by the tree, Chester. Yes, sir. Bert. Who is it? Who's that? Matt. Chester's with me. You better put away the gun. All right, Matt. I thought it was somebody else. Who, Bert? We, you know who, Baudry, of course. Guess I better take your gun. Official, Matt? Official. Well, I got no call of the law. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Now, why did you do it? What do you mean? If it had been a gunfight, the law couldn't have touched you. Now, the circumstances are all in your favor. But this way, they'll call it murder. And they'll be right, because that's what it was. Matt, what are you talking it's about? It's no use. You left the hammer lying right beside his body. It's got your shop brand carved in the handle of it. Whose body are you talking about? You mean Baudry? Yeah, sure, Baudry. Matt, you're making a mistake. I went looking for Baudry, yes, but I didn't find him. Then I come back here. I was afraid to leave Jeannie there in the house alone. I, I didn't do it, Matt. You're wrong. It's not up to me, Bert. It's the court's job. All I can do is take you in. The evidence is too strong, and I got no choice. No choice. I didn't have a choice either. We must have had a choice somewhere back down the line. When? Where was it we could have stopped and turned back? I'm a marshal, not a philosopher. Now, let's go. What about Jeannie? i got to tell her. Chester will take care of it. It'd be better if you'd do it, Matt. You're a friend. That'd make it easy. I'd rather not if you don't mind. Now, come on, let's go. Step inside. Four years we've been friends, Matt. I never thought it would come to this. Neither did I. You said you didn't find any money on him. It could have been robbery. I made to look like robbery. But either way, there's nothing I can do. Now, you better step inside. Ah. 
I'll, uh, I'll bring you some blankets and tobacco. If you want anything else, let me know. Wish I knew how Jeannie was taking it. She'll be all right. She's a fine girl. Matt. Matt, look out for her, will you? Bert, a man's job is one thing, friendship's another. This prairie country is rough and tough and wild at the best. And without the law, nobody could survive in it. And that means putting friendship aside sometimes. But the man still doesn't forget. Yeah, I, I'll look out for her. Thanks, Matt. I'll see you later. Get your prisoner tucked in safely, Matt. <laughs> what about Baudry? He's dead. Absolutely dead. Like I never saw anybody any deader. Blacksmith hammer makes a mighty fine weapon. Yeah, at least for sneaking up behind. I can't figure Bert doing that's not like him. Sometimes a man changes under pressure, Doc. Yeah, I can't figure it either. What would you say his chances are? Bad. Straws all point one way. Hmm, yes. Maybe somebody's been messing with the straw stack. Who? Yeah, that's a good question, right? Well, the court will ask it. Yeah, if he ever gets there. What do you mean? I just come from Texas Trail a while ago, and some of the boys are kind of riled up. They're talking real loose. No law against talking. Yeah, doubt if they aim to leave it at talking, Matt. They figure the evidence is a little on the weak side. A court might turn Bert loose. So they're saying it's up to them. Yeah, they're just mad because they've lost their source of free drinks. Well, maybe so, but you better keep your eyes open, Matt. Yeah, I know that fact, Doc. They hunt in the dark and pull down stragglers. And mostly they just talk. So don't worry. Bert's in jail, and that's where he's going to stay. <laughs> I want to see Bert. No visitors after dark. It's a jail rule. Rules don't have to be enforced. Mine do. Bert's a prisoner, same as any other prisoner. He's charged with murder. He didn't do it, Matt. It's not for me to say. But you know he didn't. You know Bert. You know he wouldn't do a thing like that. Sneak up behind a man's back in the dark. I'm not the court, Jeannie. I know. And they'll believe he did it. Yeah, the night train's coming in. Hope it's not bringing in trouble. The morning train did. Matt, I want to see Bert. I told you that you... Why, you little fool. <laughs> Give me the gun, Jeannie. No, I warn you, Matt, stay Give back. Give me the gun. No, Matt. So help me, I I'll... said hand it over. <laughs> You knew I wouldn't shoot. Yeah. <laughs> now, what did you hope to gain by I that? I don't know. Get Bert out. Maybe I don't know. None of this is his fault. Something's got to be done. Matt, you've got to help me. Please. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? I, I just come from the Texas Trail. I think there's going to be some trouble. Trouble? The bunch that hangs out around there are doing a lot of drinking and talking up the idea of coming over here to the jail. Oh, no. Well, maybe we ought to go over there and do some talking ourselves. Jeannie, I think the best thing for you to do is to go back home and stay there till morning. But... Now, don't worry about this. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, but, Matt, you can't handle that crowd alone. I've been handling things alone for a long time. All right, Chester. Uh, 
Those are Jim Nixon's, the one who's been agging them on, Mr. Dillon. Over there at the end of the bar. Yeah, he struck up an acquaintance with Baudry when he first got off the train. Guess he figures he's an old partner by now. Well, come on. Yes, Matt, Matt, wait. Later, Kitty, I got some business with the boys at the bar. That's what I mean. Tulsa Jim's been buying them drinks for the last two hours. They're in a real nasty mood. So? So be careful, Matt. That's all. Just be careful. Kitty, I'm the carefulest man you know. Sure, sure. We got the law here in Dodge. Supposedly. But what kind of a law is it to let a man sneak up behind somebody in the dark and murder him in cold blood? I don't know, Tulsa. Suppose you tell me. Dylan. Now, don't let me interrupt you. You were doing fine. Well, this is quite an audience you got. All the panhandlers, bums, and barflies and dodge. It's quite a collection. Well, calling names won't change the facts, Dylan. What facts? A friend of yours, Bert Wells, had sneaking, cowardly murder. That's for the court to decide, Tulsa. The court. They'll turn them loose. They work hand in glove with you. Dylan, we're not going to stand for it. All right, shut up. So you're not going to stand for it, huh? Well, just what are you planning to do? You'll find out in due time, Dylan. Go well, tend to set them up again all around. Uh, you've turned into quite a free spender, Tulsa. I never knew you to... A ah, double eagle gold piece. You mind if I take a look at it? It's good. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Where'd you get it? That's my business, Dylan. So you're the one who killed Baudry. That's a lie. I thought robbing him was just a cover-up, but it wasn't. There aren't many double eagles around Dodge. Baudry had a lot of them. Now you. Why would you get a pocket full of gold pieces, Tulsa? Wells killed Baudry. The blacksmith hammer was lying right beside him. Yes, where you left it. Hey. What does she mean? Tulsa Jim came into my husband's shop late this afternoon. His horse had thrown a shoe. He had plenty of chance to steal that hammer. She's lying. Where did you get the gold, Tulsa? I, well, I, I, won it, well, I won it in the poker game. Last week when, well, when the trail herd would... Tulsa, you're under arrest for murder. Oh. No, you'll never take me! Get out of All right, Doc. You better get up an inquest. Well, confound it, Matt. You, you never give me any chance to practice on live people. Yeah. You wouldn't know what to do with them, Doc. Well, I, I do get fewer complaints this way. Matt. Matt, does this mean that Bert's free? You shouldn't have come here, Jeannie. Yeah, he's free. Chester will go with you over to the jail and let him out. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for everything. You told me one time in Louisville that... Louisville? That was a long time ago and a long way off. So, uh... Goodbye, Jeannie. Goodbye, Matt. What's it all about, Matt? What? What's anything all about, kidding? Professor, what do you say? Well, let's have a little tune, huh? Why, well, sure thing, Mr. Dillon. What'd you like to hear? Oh, uh, how about that one of Foster's, uh, Jeannie. Jeannie with the light brown hair. You bet. You knew her before, didn't you, Matt? Yeah, I met her in Louisville one summer. Saw her quite a lot for a couple of months. And then I drifted out west. A man misses out on things by drifting. I told her then if she ever needed help to, to call on me. Well, she called, and you helped her. Yeah, I guess. Well, anyway, uh, that's that. Matt. Yeah. Yeah, Kitty. When are you going to help yourself?
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Tom Tully, Lynn Allen, Larry Dobkin, Georgia Ellis, and Barney Phillips. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. What are the tunes most people like best? For the answer to that question, listen to Robert Q. Lewis's Waxworks later tonight over most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for Broadway is My Beat, which follows immediately over most of these same radio stations. Roy Rowan speaking. On a Sunday afternoon, the music's delightful on the CBS radio network. and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wild Hog, that's you. Wild Hog, you there? Who are you? Put that spear down. Listen, Wild Hog and me are friends, big friends. You make much noise. You're a Cheyenne, ain't you? You must be with Wild Hog. What name, you white man? I'm Ord Spicer. Ord Spicer, you hear? You bother me and you'll be in big trouble with Wild Hog. No trouble. Tell these other redskins to put their spears down. I need more room. Come, white man. Are you with Wild Hog or ain't you? Much talk, come. All right. Any tricks, I'll shoot you first. No one around here. 
Where is he? Horse here, you walk. Blasted. Why can't he ride out like anybody else? I want to be in Dodge tonight. Come. It's me. It's Ord Spicer, all right. Yes. These braves of yours sure keep you covered. You can't tell one from another, except you, of course. They even thought maybe I'd run into the wrong Indians. No moon tonight. Oh, I recognized them as Cheyennes, all right, but you never know with... With... With what, Spicer? Nothing, Wild Hog. Forget it. You never know with Indians. Now, Wild Hog, you and me are friends. Don't get so touchy. I didn't mean nothing. We are not friends. I pay you. That is all. Sure, we're friends. You're about the most educated Indian I ever met, that's why. I learn only English from the white men. Nothing else. Well, you sure had a good teacher, pal. General Custer, many bitter moons ago. I was a scout. Don't matter. I never heard of him. He was killed. Well, that's nothing to do with me. You got the money, Wild Hog? Yes. Here. Five hundred dollars. Five hundred? Our deal was for a thousand. You will get the rest later. But I'm running a big risk for you, Cheyennes. This is mighty dangerous work, Wild Hog. It will be even more dangerous if we do not meet again, Spicer. Oh, Wild Hog, you can trust me. I'll be back, you know that. Yes. When? Ooh, two, three days. Where will I find you? Make camp near here. We'll find you. Okay. I'll get on into Dodge now. Goodbye, Wild Hog. Don't get drunk, Spicer. <laughs> Never touch it. Hey, bartender. Set out another bottle of whiskey for me and my friend. Uh, what'd you say you're called, stranger? Ord Spicer, friend. Mm -hmm. Here, let me fill your glass. Some time you got here, Dodge. You're sure easy with your money, Spicer. Nothing's too good for my friend. Say, what name you go by, anyway? You got a lot of money, Spicer. Sure, I got money. I'll have more soon. You must have hit it rich, huh? <laughs> sure, I hit it rich. Easy money, friend. Easy money. How'd you do it, Spicer, anyway? Friend, I live like a gambler. My life's chicken one day and feathers the next. Right now, it's all chicken. Yeah, but how'd you do it? You made out real good, Spicer. Brains and guts, friend. Brains and guts. That's all it takes. I know, I know, but, but how? You don't get money like that robbing old Indians. What's that? Huh? What'd you say about Indians? Well, it's just a way of saying it back home. Don't get on the prod about it. Maybe you talk too much. Maybe you ask too many questions. Hey, what's the matter with you anyway? Maybe you know too much. Look, Spicer, if you're hiding something, don't trouble yourself. I ain't interested in you, or your money, or your liquor. I don't like that. You don't have to. You bet I don't. Keep your eyes right on mine, Spicer. I want to watch you die. Spicer. Thank you. 
Ah, how's our prisoner, Chester? I got two, Mr. Dillon. You got two? Yes, sir. There's that Ord Spicer fellow you locked up, and then there's a drunk who tried to buffalo me after you went to bed. No? Uh-huh. Did you have any trouble with him? A little, Mr. Dillon. He tried to hit me on the head with his six gun. Well, you look all right. Oh, he didn't do it, sir. I bit his thumb and kneed him at the same time. <laughs> well, that's quite a trick, Chester. You must have been practicing. No, sir, I haven't been practicing. But I had it all thought out. <laughs> I see. All right, let's turn Spicer loose. I'll go get him, Mr. Dillon. About time. Where's my gun, Marshal? There it is, Spicer. And uh, don't use it around here anymore. You can't bother a man for self-defense. I just want you to stay out of Dodge. One kill at your limit here, even in self-defense. I ain't a fair to you, Marshal. Besides, this is a poor town anyways. You can have it. My, that man would kick a hog barefoot him. <laughs> yeah, he sure would, Chester. There's something real bad about him. Yeah, I don't know what it is, Chester, and I hope I don't have to find out. Well, we'll go away. Fellows like that got to keep moving. Seems like nobody wants him. Now, don't feel sorry for him, Chester. He got that way all by himself. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. <laughs> Marshal? Those graders get here yet, Jack? Yep. Come in on the Santa Fe yesterday, Marshal. Four of them. Uh, right back here. Oh, good. Beautiful guns, ain't they? Just beautiful. <laughs> You're a good storekeeper, Jack, but I only need two of them. Well, I can make you a good price on all four, Marshal. It wouldn't be any good if I don't need four, would it? Well, maybe not, but I never know. I got half a dozen 44 Sharps rifles, same shipment. Thought I'd be stuck with them forever. Well, with the big 50 out now, there ain't a Buffalo 100 use a 44 anymore. I don't see any 44s. Well, that's just what I'm telling you. Feller stopped in just this morning, took all six. Paid me $75 a piece, too. You sold six rifles to one man? That's right, Marshal. Was he a Buffalo 100? Well, looked more like a drifter to me. Had plenty of cash, though. You know his name? No idea. Nothing wrong with it, was there, Marshal? Been a holdup around here I haven't heard about? No, no. A lot of rifles for one man to buy. No law again, it, is it? What'd this man look like, Jack? Tall, skinny, kind of mean face. Mm-hmm. You wear one six gun with black grips? Yeah. Come to think of it, he did. You know him? Yeah. Lord Spicer. He killed a man last night. Well, now I heard about that shooting. What do you suppose he's up to now? Where'd he go? No. Packed the rifles on a mule and rode out of town. You going after him, Marshal? No, no. It's like you say, Jack, there's no law against a man buying all the rifles he wants. Seems strange, that's all. Well, let's settle on the price for those greeners, huh? Next day, Chester and I took the new greeners and rode out for a prairie chicken. We had a sackful within an hour, and we headed back to town, arguing on the way as to whether we'd bake the birds whole or just cut the breasts off and broil them. We still hadn't settled the matter when we reached Dodge, and we never did. The stage from Hayes City had arrived half hour before, bringing with it the bodies of two men found alongside the road. They were just laying there, Marshal, about five miles back. Both shot dead, but I thought I'd better bring them in anyway. Did you recognize them, Pete? No, Marshal, I didn't. The doc says there are a couple of riders from the T-Bar outfit. Yeah. He got them up in his office now. You bring in their horses? No sign of a horse, but there was an awful lot of tracks around. All right. I'll go see if Doc's found anything. Uh, hang around, Pete, will you? I may want some more information from you. Okay, if I do my waiting at the Alapraganza, Marshal? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. I'll put our horses up, Mr. Dillon. Uh, yours, Chester. I may want mine. Yes, sir. Sure. 
Just finishing up here. Be right with you. How'd they die, Doc? Well, they got half shot and then shot dead, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But uh, is there any way of telling if maybe they killed each other? Hey, uh... Ah, that does it. No, there is, Marshal, but I'd be mighty surprised if they did. Now, what do you mean, Doc? Well, they were cowboys, Marshal. Cowboys just don't generally carry buffalo guns. Here, take a look. What? I dug some of these out of each of them. Those are slugs from a sharps rifle, Marshal. Yeah, sure are. Mm -hmm. That one's the best I found, right there. Yeah. What caliber did you say this is, Doc? Oh, I'd guess 44. Yeah. Right from sharps. Mm -hmm. Not many 44s in use around here since the big 50 came around. I know a man with six of them, Doc. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. What do you think of that? I'll let you know when I get back. Come on, Doc. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, behind the famous creaking door to Inner Sanctum tomorrow evening, there lies one of the most hair-raising tales to date. Meet Raymond, your host on Inner Sanctum, tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> The stage driver rode with me back to where he found the bodies, and from there I rode on alone. It was an easy trail at first. There must have been more than a dozen horses running together. Long toward dusk, however, they suddenly split up, and I was faced with two different trails to follow. I made a gambler's choice and rode harder than ever. There was only an hour of light left to track by when my horse stepped into a prairie dog hole, snapped his leg, and went over hard. My head glanced off a rock. There was a shower of light. And nothing. That's him, all right. That's Dylan. He's a marshal at Dodge, I told you. I think he is more for this. Stop. Put away your gun. But you can't let him live. He'd kill us, all right. I'm going to kill him anyway. You'd die for it if you do. Okay. You're the boss. Yeah. But you'll wish I'd shot him. No. He's coming too now. Oh. We take care of him our own way. Fight mm -hmm. Cloud. Pick up his guns. Yeah, he isn't hurt. Just knocked out, that's all. Indians. Cheyennes. I'm no Indian, Marshal. Spicer. Yeah. Sure. No tricks now, Marshal. These redskins will shoot you to pieces. Yeah. Now those new Sharps 44s you bought them, huh, Spicer? It's no business of yours, Marshal. Not now. You're through. You're all the way through. Spicer, you're under arrest. What? I said you're under arrest. <laughs> now, Marshal, what are you arresting me for? Not that it matters much. For selling guns to Indians and on suspicion of murder. All right, so I'm under arrest, but, Marshal, I want to ask you something. Yeah. How are you going to take me in, that's all? Just how are you going to manage it? I'll worry about that. You sure will. Come on, Wild Hog, let's shoot him and get it over with. This is a man of much heart. I admire his courage. To stand with death on all sides and arrest a man. No, we will not kill him. Not yet. But you can't take him with us. White Cloud, give him a horse. Come. They gave me a horse, all right, with the T-Bar brand on it. 
But I was surrounded by six armed Indians and a no-good white who'd shoot me any time he thought he could get by with it. Wild Hog rode up ahead, leading the party northwest, apparently to rendezvous with a bunch that had split off from this one. Spicer stayed right alongside of me. Well, am I still under arrest, Marshal? You're still guilty, aren't you? Sure. I'll admit it. Don't matter, being as how you'll never see Dodge again or any other place. What are you doing with these Cheyennes here anyway, Spicer? I got a deal with Wild Hog, Marshal. Real good deal. Killing white men, part of it? <laughs> they don't need any help there, Marshal. They like to kill white men. Maybe they'll kill you before they're through. No, I'm too valuable to them. They like me. No? Now, why would they like you? Well, they didn't at first. But I talked them into it. Talked Wild Hog into it. He's a smart fella, that Indian. Saw right away what I could do for him. Like buying those rifles. What else did you do for him? Well, I stopped those two riders with the horses. Told them I was sick. Got them off guard. Those Cheyennes were on before they could move. It was real easy. You're kind of like a Judas sheep in a slaughter pen, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's it, Marshal. Pays better, though. I got $500 coming since we find a ranch or two to raid. I see. Pretty good deal, huh? You know, I think a lot more of these Indians than I do of you, Spicer. I don't like that, Marshal. At least they got an argument on their side. But you're just a renegade white. I'll kill you for that, Marshal. Now, shut up. All right, you've asked for it. Shoot me and Wild Hog will split you wide open, Spicer. Besides, he spotted the rest of his party up there. Huh? Oh, yeah. All right for now, Marshal. But I'll see you dead. I promise I'll see you dead. I was still alive two days later when we crossed the Smoky Hill River about 100 miles northwest of Dodge. There were 15 Cheyennes in the party. And day and night, two of them, by turns, never took their eyes off of me. They seemed anxious for an excuse to cut my throat. And I had to watch every movement I made. It looked pretty hopeless. Wild Hog was smart and he took no chances. But often he and I rode along together. Though always flanked by... My two warrior guards. Country is greener already. Better every mile. Why have you been raiding so far south, Wild Hog, if you like this land better? We are northern Cheyenne, Marshal, in the Bighorn Mountains. The army took us south to a reservation in the Oklahoma Territory. Oh, so that's it. You jumped your reservation, huh? Why should we live in a hot, flat land that has no game? But the army will be after you again. You've broken the law. Whose law? Ours or yours? All right, Wild Hog. But the Indian has a law against the murder. You've broken that twice that I know of. Cheyenne does not speak of it as murder to kill his enemy. Those cowboys weren't your enemy, Wild Hog. They weren't fighting you. The army drove us from our home in the mountains. The army took our horses from us. We are going back home now on other horses, that's all. That doesn't explain your killing. Those men were peaceful. Marshal, if I could, I would kill every white man in the country. But I cannot. The Indian nations cannot. The red man has always fled before the white man. Those cowboys weren't chasing you? We needed their horses. They didn't even have a chance to fight. You tricked them. Is it only the white man who was allowed to trick his enemy? I was young once, Marshal, but I have seen too much trickery and lies and destruction and broken promises. I'll admit that's happened, Wild Hawk. But you know, not every man is a liar and a killer. No. There are white men like you. And there are white men like Spicer. Spicer. 
Tell me something. Would you consider Ord Spicer guilty of murder? The Indian is Spicer's enemy, not his own people. Therefore, it is murder. Then you understand why it's Spicer I came after, and not you. Why not me, Marshal? You're the Army's problem, not mine. I expect to fight the Army many times before we reach the mountains. Yeah. What, uh... What are your plans for me, Wild Hog? I have been thinking. Yeah? I do not know yet. Well, what about Spicer? Spicer works for me. Why should I think about him? Then you're not as smart as I figured. You are right, Marshal. I do not trust Spicer. He is a traitor to his own people and only for money. I have rifles now and enough horses. I do not need Spicer. You're going to kill him? Why not? He is only another white man. You said yourself you can't kill all the white men. If you were free, Marshal, you would take him back and let other white men kill him. What difference how he dies? Makes a difference to me, Wild Hog. I'm a lawman. I may have to kill you, too. <laughs> You're a hard man to be friends with. I will explain to you, Marshal. It matters little about any Indian. A few more winters and not many of my people will be alive. I do not complain of our fate. Tribe follows tribe, nation follows nation. It is the law of nature. A white man's turn to be defeated and to disappear will come. It is just a matter of time. And so we may be brothers after all, Marshal. I'm not sure I believe all of that, Wild Hog. Of course not. Still, I recognize you as a warrior among your people, as I am a warrior among mine. Too bad we're not on the same side. As long as we are brave and willing to die, it does not matter. I ride ahead now. You stay with the others. That night we reached the north fork of the Solomon River and camped with the shadow of low hills not many miles ahead. Wild Hog ordered my guards to keep me some distance from the rest of the party. So I pulled up some buffalo grass and bedded down on it early. I watched the stars until sleep came. Next thing I heard was the sound of horses fading off in the distance. The two braves guarding me had disappeared, so I got up and Walk carefully back to where the Cheyennes were camped. There, a couple of horses stood tied to a bush, but they were alone. The Indians had left. I stopped for a moment to listen. And then, suddenly, I saw the figure of a man lying in the moonlight about 20 feet off. Spicer. Uh, uh, Spicer. Uh, now, there's no blood on you. You're all right. Come on a minute, man. Come on. Yeah. My hair. You've been knocked out, that's all. Now, come on, sit up. Uh, oh, don't you, Marsh. What, what happened? Where, where are they? Where's Wild Hog? They've gone. Gone? Gone where? Here, let me... Yeah. Where'd they go? They've been headed for the Bighorn Mountains. Best chance of running into the army if they travel at night. But they couldn't leave me, not here, not now. Looks like they did. Some brave club gin, they rode off, that's all. But I gotta go with them. You're still groggy, Spicer. And you're still under arrest, remember? You can't take me in, Marshal. 
Wild Hog will be back. He won't let you. Why do you think he left you here, Spicer? We're we're friends. Big friends, me and Wild Hog. You got no friends. You don't belong in anybody's camp. And I'm taking you back to Dodge anyway. That murdering Redskin. He's a better man than you, Spicer. He's brave and he's willing to die. Now, come on, we got a long ride back. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Larry Dobkin, Herb Vigran, and Jack Crucian. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Dark. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. <laughs> Remember every Saturday night on CBS Radio, Tarzan brings you startling new adventures. Listen for Gold of the Sudan later this evening. Lancy Cassell speaking. And remember, Robert Q's Waxworks brings you the top records and recording artists on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Report's finished, Mr. Dillon. Good. You better go on home now, Chester. It's getting late. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what about these new Dodgers? I'll just leave them there. I'll look them over. Before. What's the matter, Mr. Dillon? They got company at the back door. Come in. All right, come in, mister. Get in, I said. Get your paws off of me. What? A girl. Sure, I'm a girl. What do you think I am? I'll put that long rifle away and I'll tell you. Where'd you get that thing, anyway? Happy brought it with him from Kentucky, if it's any of your business, which it ain't by a darn sight. Uh-huh. What you doing hanging around in the alley? Get rid of him there and a little jaw about it. Uh-huh. I see. Uh, 
Chester. Mm, good night. Hmm? Well, but I'm not going it. To... Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Dillon. I get you. You and Marshall here? That's right, miss. My name's Hannah. Hannah Tolman. You arrest folks, don't you? Well, if they've committed a crime, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, then I got somebody for you to arrest. Oh, uh, who? Pappy. Why? Because I said to, that's why. Somebody's been trying to kill him. I figure about the safest place for him is in jail. <laughs> Wait a minute, slow down. Let's start at the beginning, huh? A few days ago, Pappy was bushwhacked up in the hills near our place. Oh, was he hurt? No. Slug just bounced off in his head a little. Yesterday, the bushwhacker tried again. He missed. Sounds like a bad shot. Sure. But if he keeps trying, he may get lucky. So you put Pappy in jail until I can run down this ambushing gent, okay? <laughs> you plan to cross guns with him yourself? I may be a girl, but I was barking squirrels while you were still trying to dent a tin can. <laughs> well, you better let me take care of it, miss. And as uh, for your father, I can't jail him without a charge. Sure, I know that. What kind of a charge do you want? <laughs> well, what kind do you have? Well, most any, I reckon. Ain't it enough that he's drunk all the time? Well, I can hold him overnight on that. What if he shoots up the town? That's five days for disturbing the peace. That'll do. Where did he do this shooting? We well, ain't yet. He's down at the Alphaganza slopping up booze with that other old buzzard, Jingle Bob. Oh, the swamper? Yeah, that's the one. You'd best be somewheres around the saloon in a few minutes. I got a feeling Pappy's about due to bust the law again. <laughs> Her story didn't make much sense, but there was something about the mountain girl's gleaming black eyes and the set of her pretty but stubborn face that made me go to the Alifraganza. At the bar, I ordered a glass of rye and watched two bewhiskered old-timers trying to outlie each other over a rapidly emptying bottle. Yes, uh, Jingle Bob. You just wait and see. Ed Tolman's gonna have the biggest den horse ranch in Kansas come spring. Uh, sure you are, absolutely. <laughs> and me, why, I I reckon I'll just buy up this here saloon. Oh, you're lying. Well, sure I am. Ain't you? What's my money was spending, ain't it? How many times I gotta tell you I'm getting rich? Happy, are you drunk? <laughs> If I ain't, I've been wasting a side of time. Now leave me alone, daughter. Go home where you belong. I'm going. Only come over to tell you, man, bet me ten dollars you couldn't shoot out that lamp on the first shot. What's that? Oh, give me that rifle. All right, hold on. That's enough of that. Stay back, son. What? What's going on? Now, go collect your ten dollars, daughter. Yeah, Pappy. But I think the marshal here's a fixin' to arrest you. Huh? Ain't you, marshal? <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. All right, come along, Jim. Come on. Wow, get your hands on. off me. Boy, I never... You jailing a man for, for having a little fun. Why, you'd never get away with this back in Kentucky. Jed, you're in trouble, aren't you? Who's trying to kill you? No, I reckon that's my business. Now, that's the law's business. I'll take care of myself, Marshal. Uh-huh. Back in the saloon there, you mentioned having money and getting more. So? From what I've heard, you and your daughter run a two-bit horse ranch up in the hills. That hardly figures to make you rich. So? Ah, uh, you thick-headed old... Look, all I'm doing is trying to save your skin if it's in danger. Now, why don't you help me instead of being... Reckon I don't want to. Well, that's plain enough. Morning, Chester. Morning, Mr. Dillon. You better take a look at this new Dodger. Huh? Wanted for robbery and murder... Vic Tolman. It's 
So that murderous gun hawk is loose again, huh? Broke out of prison last week. Yeah. If he's kin to Jed Tolman, he'll like to be heading this way. Yeah, likely. I'll give you a hunch, Chester. I think he's here already. You do? You know where he is? No, not exactly. But I expect Hannah Tolman may have an idea. That's where I'm heading. <laughs> Now, that's what I like to see. Uh, a man-sized appetite. <laughs> this wonderful corn pone. I'm a good cook. I've been cooking for Pappy ever since Ma died ten years ago. Huh? You take pretty good care of it. Somebody has to. Pappy's kind of shiftless. I reckon he'd starve if I didn't feed him. The only things he cares about are wild horses and booze. And in a pinch, he'd give up horses. <laughs> You know, you're quite a woman, Hannah. You're pretty, brave, and with more courage than most men I know. Too quick, Marshal. What? You're sweetening me up for some reason. Not that I mind, you understand. I'm partial to a strapping fella like you. And Pappy's always after me to get hitched up. Says it ain't fitting for me to be 22 without a man. Oh, you're still young. Not the mountain folk. I'm an old maid. And I'm agreeable for some sweet talk. Only I don't trust yours. What are you after, Marshal? All right, Hannah. I only want the truth. About what? Where's your father getting this money he's spending? I wish I knew. Who shot at him? I don't know, but I'm aiming to find out. Where's Vic? Where's he hiding, Hannah? Who? Vic Tolman, your brother. Or maybe he's your cousin. Brother. Where? I don't know. Hannah, be sensible. Vic's a murderer. Vic's my kin. We Tolmans don't turn on each other. If you shelter him, you're guilty of... Marshal, I reckon you just wore out your welcome. <laughs> A prisoner will stand up and face me. <clears throat> Jed Tolman, you've been found guilty of disturbing the peace. Sentence of this court is five days in jail or a hundred dollars. A hundred? Well, Judge, ain't that a much steep just for... A hundred dollars or five days. Uh, I ain't got that much on me. Uh, but I can get it if you let me go. Just for... a minute. Hey. 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 Hold her in the court. Now, what's the meaning of, uh, of this interruption? I want to pay this man's fine, Your Honor. That's your privilege, sir. hundred dollars. Pay the clerk. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dick Curry. Somebody's been turning over rocks. <laughs> well, I don't know him, but he's sure a friend. Looks like I ain't going with you, Marshal. Yeah, it looks like. But in your boots, I wouldn't be happy. Curry's one of the worst killers yet unhung. Oh, Matt, is that a way to talk about me? I'm clear with the law. Come on, Mr. Tolman. Go ahead, Jed. And, uh... Say hello to Vic for me. Uh, Vic? Oh, no. Mr. Curry. Is that true? Well, what's the difference who put up the hundred? Come on. No. No, not even it's Vic. No, you can't make me. I said come on. Marshal, don't let him take me. Oh, shut up and come on before Curry. I... Curry. Hmm? Stay out of this, Marshal. I don't think so. You paid his fine. You didn't buy him. He's going with me, Matt. Don't try to stop me. I can't imagine anything that would give me more pleasure. You don't like living, do you? Very much. Now, just any time you feel like it. No. Not here, Matt. I'll pick my spot. Yeah. I'll try not to turn my back on any dark alleys. Do that. And, Tillman, I'll be seeing you again. <laughs>
We'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, strength against aggression calls for guns, tanks, planes, and explosives in tremendous quantity. It calls for other things, too. Moral strength, based on equality of opportunity for all. And economic strength, which today can be based only on continued high output of civilian goods. America must produce, as she never has before, war material, civilian goods, and democracy. Only an all-out effort in all three directions will give us security against aggression. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Some uh, stud, Marshal? Why don't we play while we wait? No, thanks, Jingle Bob. You needn't wait with us. Well, uh, Jed's my friend, Mr. Dillon. Sure. Maybe I can't help him none, but at least I can share whatever the trouble is. Understand? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Jed here is a lying old ringtail drunk, but me, well, when a man is down to scrubbing saloon floors just to get the liquor that'll keep his nerves from shaking apart. He, he's grateful for any friendship that's offered. Don't move. Uh, Curry, get his gun. Yes, sir. <laughs> you recognize me, Mark? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Vic Tolman. There are Dodgers out on you. <laughs> You're a cool one, Dylan. Too bad we're on opposite sides of the fence. Yeah, it's too bad. Real pity. <laughs> you know, I'm going to enjoy this job. What job? Well, don't you know? Vic's taking his paw away from you. But you won't mind. You'll be dead. Curry, you stick here and take care of these two. Jed and I'll go on ahead. Oh, son. Son, I, I don't want to go nowhere. Now, Paul, don't rile me. You're going with me. None of you are going anyplace, Vic. Check. What? Will you reach high, both of you, and let go of that hardware? Now, you better do as he says. Because Chester's a little nervous with that shotgun. There's mine. Looks like the odds are with you, so... You might as well get rid of that spare in your boot, Vic, before you run into any temptations. <laughs> you got sharp eyes, Marshal. Law gets a lot of backing up tonight. Your mistake, Vic. Sometimes people just don't give Chester enough credit. Ah, chow time. Hmm. Beef steak, fried potatoes, stewed corn. Marshal, I must say, you run a nice jail, don't he, Curry? Mm. <laughs> don't mind Curry. He's a little depressed about last night. You still run a nice jail. Something on your mind, Marshal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple of things. Such as? Oh, such as your father spending money he hasn't earned, claiming to know where he can get more. Mm-hmm. Paul sure a terrible liar. Mm -hmm. Such as him getting shot at twice and refusing to talk about it. Or help me investigate. Paul's a little bashful, too. Yeah. Such as his being afraid of you. Hmm. I guess Paul's getting old, little daughtery. Yeah. Then, of course, there's you. Well, now you're on my favorite subject. Go on. Well, you're a killer and a thief, <clears throat> but you're cool and smart. Smart enough to educate yourself. I had lots of time to read in the pen. Lots of time. You're going to have more, but not much more. Because you're going to hang for those guards that you killed. Maybe. Curry, ain't you going to eat that? Mm-mm. Now, go on about me being smart. 
You're smart enough to know the most dangerous place for you to go after you escaped was here. Well, it looks like I ain't as smart as you think. It depends on what reason you had for risking coming here. Boy, that's your good coffee. First jail I was ever in where the coffee was fit to drink. Oh, thank you. Okay, Marshal. Now, just what was my reason? Reason was money. Money? Cash. It's the only thing that'd give you a chance to get out of the country. You're in for robbery as well as murder. How much of the loot was recovered? You know how it is, Marshal. Easy come, easy go. I spent it as fast, well, nearly as fast as I got it. So nothing was recovered, huh? No, it was all gone. It was all hidden, you mean? Hidden until Jed found it. Paul? Sure. That's his source of money. It's also why he was afraid to go with you. <laughs> like I said, too bad we're on opposite sides. You got brains and you use them. You want to fill in the details for me? I'll tell you this. You're right about my cash of money. I'd had it and be on my way to Mexico by now if Paul hadn't switched hiding places on me. You know, it hurts. Paul's turning against me. Yeah, yeah. The Tolmans always stick together. Except when money's involved. How about you, Marshal? Money by you? Sky's the limit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll figure it out. Well, <clears throat> been a nice chat. Won't take you straight. <laughs> Hurry, give me a hand. All right, back up, Curry. That's it. And tell Vic when he wakes up to take it easy. Or he won't live to be hung. Hey, Jingle Bob. You seen Jed? Sorry, Marshal. I don't know where Jed is. Been looking for him myself. God, I am cool. He must have left town last night. Yeah. Ain't you cool? I got an old jacket you can have. I'd rather have a shot. Better steal two shots. You got the jumps? Always got them, except when I'm full of booze. Funny, you won't believe it, but there was a time when I couldn't stand the taste of hard liquor. Made me sick. No, can't live without it. Yes, you can. Well, maybe. Let's say I don't want to. Let's say that... Here. Yeah. Go buy yourself a drink. Hey, hey, that's enough for a whole bottle. Well, uh, we change you. See you later, Marshal. Supper time, Chester. Chester. Chester, you all right? The prisoners? Gone. Hannah Tolman slipped him a gun. They made me open up the cell and then Vic slugged me. Well, I know where they'll go. Please, Mr. Dillon, take me along. It was my fault they escaped. All right, Chester. Ask Doc to put a quick patch on that head, then we'll go after him together. Starting to get dark. Yeah. Why'd we leave the road back there? I wanted to reach that rise, Chester. But we circled around to come up the back side. Does that have something to do with you bringing binoculars? Yeah, it does. Vic Tolman will know he'll be followed. I want to see what kind of a surprise he has for us. All right, pull up. You wait here. anything? No. Not yet. Now, wait. I knew now. Yeah, it's Curry, all right. He's holed up in some brush just beyond the turn in the road down there. Well, what do we do, Mr. Dillon? 
Uh, take the horses and circle back the way we came. Start up the road, but don't make the turn. I understand. Now be sure. As long as you don't make the turn, you'll be safe. But uh, I do want you to make some noise. Noise? Yeah, I want you to sing, whistle, throw rocks, anything. Just so long as it holds Curry's attention. It was slow work, crawling down through the brush, but finally I was only ten feet behind Curry's position. The gunman was holding a rifle trained on the turn. And out of sight, coming up the road, I could hear Chester. Well, he wasn't good, but he was loud. Run around the turn, blast you. All right, don't turn around, Curry. What? Now, you may have a point, but I like Chester. Bad singing and all. Now, lay the rifle aside. And unbuckle your gun belt. Now, careful. Yeah, sure, sure. Only don't shoot. Okay. Chester! Chester! I didn't mean no harm. I, I was only going to scare him. Yeah. Now, where's Vic? At the Tolman house. Waiting for Jed to show up. Uh-huh. All right, put your hands behind your back. Mm. I'm going to tie you up and leave you here. What? Leave me here? Yeah, we'll pick you up on the way back to town. It was dark when Chester and I were moving through the trees up to the Tolman shack. There was a light in the front. And through a window we could see the figure of Hannah Tolman moving around. Just a girl. Yeah, Vic's there. He just stand out of sight so Jed won't be scared off. Uh oh. She's coming out, heading this way. Yeah, there must be a well out here. She's carrying a bucket. Yeah, behind that tree, quick, and I'll take this one. What do you think you're... All right, now quiet down. We're not going to hurt you. Stop fighting. Chester, grab her legs quick. Yes, sir. I was saving these handcuffs for Vic, but I guess they'll do for you. There. Now, do you promise to be quiet or do we gag you? All right, have it your way. Chester, give me your bandana. Yes, sir. Here. Yeah, that should do it. All right, stay with her, Chester. I'm going for Vic. I was halfway to the shack when inside Vic Tolman became suspicious. Suddenly the lights went up, and the door opened, and a shadowy figure slipped out to stand, listening. Anna? Anna, answer me. Drop him, Vic. Who is that? I can't see. Matt Dillon. Throw down those guns. You're under arrest. Not this time. Vic. You were right, Marshal. I ain't going to live to... I ain't. Vic. Mr. Dillon, over here. Hey, yeah, uh, what is it, Chester? Who's that, Jed? <laughs> yes, sir. I caught him sneaking towards the house. He was carrying this bag. Here, let me see. Uh, That's the money. I, I was taking it to Vic. Is he? Yeah. You're too late, Jed. Oh, no. I ought to give him his money. If only he hadn't taken them shots at me. He didn't. Until he found out where the money was hidden, he was the last person in the world to want you dead. But, uh, I don't understand. He, he must no. be... No. Only the person who knew where you had the money would have shot at you. Nobody knew that. How could they? Who, who you could... talk a lot when you get drunk, Jed. You only get drunk with one person. Huh? You mean... You mean Jingle Bob? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. 
I was bragging. Told him all about finding it and switching hiding places. Why, that low-down snake. And him pretending to be my friend. Come on, Chet. I'll help you bury Vic. Then we'll get back to Dodge. We Tolman sure have had a bad week. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Joseph Kearns, and Junius Matthews, with Harry Bartell, Lou Krugman, and Peter Leeds. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Remember, America must produce as she never has before. She must produce war materials, civilian goods, and above all, democracy. Only an all-out effort in all three directions will give us security against aggression. George Walsh speaking, and remember, Gangbusters goes into action Saturday nights on the CBS Radio Network. just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. you to be uncomfortable. That's enough of that, Cam. What? Who said that? I did. I said it. Rice Stewart. The matter you turning yellow? And get this over with, Cam. Why devil? If that's what he is, that's why. Shut up. I'll take care of you in a minute. Rice, you got anything against my hanging this murderer? Just don't double him, that's all. Get it over with. I'll do it my way. It's my brother he shot, isn't it? And in the back, too. Rice. 
Rice, maybe you'd like me to turn this bushwhacker loose. Is that it? Oh, well, well, ask him his name. Nobody's even asked him his name. You hate this night. All of you. I was in on a lynching once, and I swore I'd never be in on another. <laughs> well, I guess the joke's on you, isn't it, fella? Look, I hear you laugh again, Cam, so help me. I'll shoot you. Maybe you shouldn't be here, Rice. How can you hang a man you don't even know his name? What do I care what his name is? So long as he pays for murder and Job. What's your name, fella? What do you care? You don't want to stop him. You just want it off your conscience, that's all. Tell me your name. It's Billy Saxton. That's my name, Billy Saxton. How's it sound? Billy, why'd you kill Job Powell? That's enough talk. What difference it make? He killed him, and that's all I need to know. Yeah, what do you care? He's gonna hang me anyway. Sure I am. Right now. Billy, I, uh, I, I got a rifle. I'll end it for you when we ride off. You won't have to strangle for long. Thanks, mister. Thanks. Get back, Rice. I'm going to slap that horse out from under him. You ready? That for you! Let's go, man. as conceal the hour of their death, grant that we may pass our days in the practice of holiness and justice, and that we may be able to quit this world in the peace of a good conscience. Amen. Amen. May Job Powell rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, boys. Thank you. Good morning, Cam. I'm sorry to be here about Job. You're late for the burial, Marshal. Well, I was out at Fort Dodge last night. I just heard about it this morning. Uh, preacher? We are in the valley of the shadow of death, Marshal Dillon. Well, if you're all through here now, I wonder if you'd read a few prayers over another man. We got him in a grave just over the hill with. Another man? Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 5-7. Who was this man, Marshal? How'd he die? He was murdered last night. I didn't hear about any murder outside of Job here. Where was this shooting, Marshal? It wasn't a shooting. It was a lynching. I just buried my brother, Marshal. Billy Saxton shot him in the back. Aren't you using the word murder a little loose around here? Only the law can hang a man without it being murder, Cam. The law's too slow sometimes. You know something about this? All I say is that he shot my brother and he deserved hanging. Hanging, maybe. Lynching's a different matter. What difference did it make? He got what was coming to him. He had a fair trial coming to him, like any man. For example, Cam, I'll try to see that you get one. What? If you're guilty of leading that lynch party. Well, say it out, Marshal. You accusing me? I got no evidence. And you won't get me. There isn't a man in the country who'll stand still for bushwhacking. Saxton got his due, and that's that. Maybe. All right, come on, preacher. Let's bury him. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9, 6. Show me the grave, Marshal. Why don't you just arrest Cam Powell, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, he won't admit anything, Chester, and I can't find a witness. Must be somebody who'll talk. Cam's a bigger man than ever now with Job dead. 
The others don't want to cross him. Mm -hmm. He owns a lot of land, all right. And Job also owned a piece of the bank. Cam will get that now. Ranchers always need money, so they won't talk. Yes, and maybe they're ashamed, too, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe. I saw lynching once, and not a man there could look you in the eye for a long time afterwards. You weren't in on it, were you, Chester? Oh, my gracious, no, Mr. Dillon. I was just a small boy. That was back in Waco. They hung a cousin of mine there. Oh, why? Well, sir, it's kind of hard to explain. He was about as honest a fellow as I ever knew, outside of some loose notions about other people's cattle. But, Mr. Dillon, I just don't believe that struck him as stealing. Why not? Well, because there wasn't anything personal about it, if you know what I mean. Well, I don't, but maybe you can explain it to me. Well, sir, it's just that there was all those cattle running loose on the plains, and I guess they seemed like a natural part of the landscape to him. He figured anybody could own them. Your cousin wasn't very bright, was he, Chester? I didn't know him well enough to say, Mr. Dillon. But anyway, they shouldn't have lynched him. No. No, they shouldn't have. And nobody's going to get by with lynching around Dodge if I have anything to do with it. No, sir. I heard Billy Saxton was at the Texas Trail last night. Maybe I can start there. He sure must have hated Job to kill him like that, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. I'll be back later, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> Hello, Kitty. Hello. Well, I can remember when you'd give me a smile. What's the matter? Nothing, Matt. Someone been bothering you? You might put it that way. Where were you last night, Matt? Why weren't you around? Yeah, Chester and I rode out to Fort Dodge on business. It was late, so we slept there. I, I thought this town could go one night without trouble. You sure thought wrong, didn't you? You're upset about the lynching. That's it. Aren't you? I heard Billy Saxton spent some time in here yesterday. I hate men. I think they're awful. Savage beasts. It'd be worse if it weren't for the law, Kitty. Now tell me about Saxton. He could tell you himself, Matt, if you hadn't picked last night to wander out of town. Oh, now, Kitty, this isn't like you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Matt. He seemed like such a nice kid. Where was he from? I never heard of him around here before. The Dakotas, somewhere. He was just a cow puncher looking for a job. No more a gunman than I am. Oh, you can't be sure, Kitty. He say he'd ever been in Texas? The Powells came from Texas, didn't they? Never really. Well, they never mentioned Texas one way or the other. What did he talk about? Horses, mostly. How he'd like to have a little spread of his own someday. And a woman. I see. And he talked nice about it. He wasn't like these hard cases around here. Anything else? <laughs> Cam Powell was in this morning. Told me not to talk about Billy, especially to you. No? Well, what'd you say? I told him I'm not afraid of him, but maybe you are. So why didn't he warn you against talking to me? <laughs> that pleasing. I also told him if I was a man, I'd kill him. Who else was in on it, Kitty? I don't know. One thing, though. Rice Stewart came in here last night. Must have been afterwards. He sat over there in that corner and got drunk all by himself. Real drunk. It's not like Rice. Right? No, but maybe he was in on it and couldn't stand himself afterwards. Maybe that's why he had to get drunk. Well, I'll go see him. Anyone who was there would be in trouble, too. Wouldn't they, Matt? Yeah. I have a feeling Cam really headed this thing, and if I can prove it, I'll have him up for murder. I'll keep my ears open, Matt. Thank you, Kitty. I think I'll ride out to the Stewart Ranch. 
Rice isn't a man who can lie with much conviction. Good luck, Matt. Yeah, I'll see you later. We'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, do you know how old the school building in your community is? If it's over 25 years old, the chances are that it's woefully inadequate to the present demands on it. Join with the groups in your community working for better school conditions. Remember, better schools build a stronger America. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> Hello? Anybody around? Get down, Marshal. He's coming out of the sun. Well, thank you, Miss Stewart. Ah. Got a pot of coffee in the stove, Marshal. Oh, thank you, ma'am, but uh, I'd like to find Rice first. Anything wrong, Marshal? No, I'd just like to talk to him. Rice come home real late last night. He was awful drunk. First time in years. If you'll forgive me, Miss Stewart, I better find him. All right. Guess I'd rather Rice told me about it himself. Must be something up. Cam Powell was by earlier. Hasn't been around in months. Uh, well, what'd you say Rice was, ma'am? Hasn't strayed far from the house today. He's coming in for coffee. <laughs> Think he's drunk a gallon already. <laughs> well, I'll be back for some myself in a little while. Sure, sure, Martin. Rice? Rice, you in here? I'm here. Who is it? Matt Dillon. Oh. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Rice. Can I uh, take a little of your time? I'd ask you up to the house, Marshal, but I think I'd rather talk to you. Uh, Miss Stewart already asked me in. She, uh, she hasn't heard about what happened in Dodge last night, has she, Rice? No. Marshal, she hasn't. How come you how come you didn't mention it to her? When I tell my wife it's my business, Marshal. <laughs> yeah, sure. But you know she's bound to hear about it later. Maybe she'll wonder why you didn't tell her right off. That's still my business. She said Cam Powell was here this morning. Anything wrong in that? You don't feel very good today, do you, Rice? I got drunk yesterday. Last night I got drunker. Is that what's bothering you? Well, I'm not as young as I used to be, that's all. You're a poor liar, Rice. I figured you would be. Yeah, I suppose I am. Look, Rice, I've known you for four years, and I've never heard a bad word against you. But yesterday you were a little drunk and got mixed up in something you're ashamed of now. Cam Powell's threatened you if you talk about it. Isn't that right? That's right, Marshal. Or have you decided what you're going to do about it? I uh, I don't know, Marshal. I just don't know. Well, then maybe I'm wrong about you. Maybe you're no better than Cam and the rest of them. Look, it's done with now, Marshal. Why can't we just forget it? We him? just can't forget a lynching, right? That'd make it too easy for the next one to happen. I'll kill the man that starts another one. And why are you going to let Cam get by with this one? Well, by heaven, I'm not. I should have stopped it then. I don't know what was wrong with me, but... But I'll face up to it now. What do you want to know, Marshal? Where were you when Job got shot? At the Longhorn. About six of us were having supper. Job went down the street for some cigars, and then we heard a shot out back, and we run through the kitchen and found the cook outside holding Billy Saxton. Mm -hmm. He'd shot Job when he passed the street end of the alley. Did the cook see it? Oh, she said he did. Then what happened? And Cam he went crazy when he found Job was dead. And, uh, I, I don't know, Marshal, but before I knew it, we'd slipped out of town with that boy. Cam hung him on that little tree about a half mile down the road. Yeah, I know. 
I cut him down. That cook, uh, that, that, that Hank, something or other. Uh, I remember he grabbed Saxon's gun when we run out back. I can't get it off my mind. Nobody ever even looked at the boy's gun to see if it had been fired. Cam just hung him on the cook's word for it. Mm-hmm. All right, right. Thank you. Uh, will you be a witness if I need you? I'll see you through now, Marshal. All the way. Oh. I feel better already. All right. Let's go get some of your wife's coffee, Rice. Yeah. Then I gotta get back to Dodge. It's good coffee, Marshal. <laughs> Chester? Chester? Chester, where are you? I'm out back, Mr. Dillon. I'll be right in. What? What's that you've got all over you? Paint, Mr. Dillon. White paint. Paint? Well, where'd you get it? Now, what are you up to now, Chester? I sent St. Louis for it, sir. I thought it'd be a good idea to make the hitching rail out back all white. Well, what for? Well, well sir, we might be in an awful big hurry some night, and that... Uh, all right, right really... Chester, all right, all right. Look, uh, I, I want you to go get cleaned up. I, I want you to have supper at the Longhorn tonight. Well, I sure do thank you, Mr. No, Dunn. no, no, Chester. I, I want you to go there alone. Oh. Yes, sir? It's for a reason. Do you know the cook over there, Hank, uh, something or other? That's Hank Ashford. He's not a very good cook, Mr. Dillon. How long has he been around? Oh, about a week. I don't think he likes cooking much. He don't seem to be very willing either. Well, it doesn't matter. I doubt if he'll be around for long. Why not, sir? I'm guessing that he'll be wanting to get out of Dodge fast after you let it drop real casual-like, mind, that I've ridden out to arrest Cam Powell. Is that so? You going to bring Cam in tonight, Mr. Dillon? No, no. You're just going to make Hank Ashford think I am. And don't let anyone else hear about it, though. Oh. I've got it, sir. You happen to know where Hank rooms? The Dodge house, Mr. Dillon. Uh, that's pretty fancy for a cook, isn't it? Yes, sir. All right, you go to supper about 6 o'clock. And I'm gambling that Hank Ashford will be packing his things at the Dodge house by 7. All right, Mr. Dillon. Oh, evening, Marshal. Evening, John. Uh, hope you're not looking for a room. We're all filled up. Texans, mostly. <laughs> well, that's fine. What rooms Hank Ashford got? There's 310, Marshal. Top of the stairs, straight down the hall. Uh-huh. Hey, uh, you been up to Anderson? Up to be in a mile of a hurry when he come in. He's here now? Went upstairs just a couple minutes ago. Yeah. Stop him up, Marshal. that gun lay where it is, mister. Here, I'll just put it in my belt. Less likely to get you in trouble that way. You're the marshal, ain't you? You leaving town, Hank? Yeah, I am. Why? I'm tired of cooking, that's why. You got Billy Saxton's gun up here, Hank? What? Or shall I tear your stuff apart and find it myself? No, no, it's, it's in that drawer there. Yeah. But I wasn't with that lynching, marshal. I can prove I wasn't. Yeah, I'm sure you weren't. Shells are here. Yeah, the barrel's clean. I thought this gun killed Joe Powell. It did. I cleaned it, that's all. Hey, you're pretty neat, Hank, for a hash house cook. Yeah. Catch this. Now what? And you handle that gun pretty well, too, for a cook. Look at the way you're holding it now. I don't want that gun. What are you trying to prove, Marshal? You're a gunfighter, not a cook, Hank. All right, Marshal. I used to handle a gun, but I'm looking for the peaceful life now. 
Any law against a man changing? No, but you're under arrest anyway. What for? I'll think of something. Let's go. wouldn't eat any breakfast, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, that's too bad. He says he won't be here long anyway. <laughs> they all say that, don't they? Yeah, he may be right. I see Cam Powell coming across the street for him right now. You going to let him go, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, we'll see. All right, Marshal. What's the bail on Hank Ashford? There's no bail at all, Cam. What do you mean, no bail? You can't hold a man like this. I'm not holding him. You mean he can leave? Any time. And what'd you arrest him for in the first place? Oh, let's say, uh, suspicion. Suspicion of what? Well, uh, drunkenness. He wasn't drunk. No, but he might have got drunk. You're pretty high-handed with that badge, aren't you, Dylan? You tell me, Cam. You ought to know about being high-handed. We're wasting time. Turn him loose. I want to get out of here. I'll get him, Mr. Dillon. Hank's a right-handy man to have around, huh, Cam? What does that mean? Well, he can cook, probably turn his hand to most anything. Sort of a jack-of-all-trades, isn't he? I wouldn't know, Marshal. Thanks for bailing me out, Cam. I didn't have to bail you out. You're free. Is that right, Marshal? That's right, Hank. So go on, enjoy yourself. <laughs> I sure will. Then I'll start by having a drink. Come on, Cam, let's see if the Alifragans is open. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. You think Hank shot Joe Powell, don't you? Well, that'd be my guess, Chester. Then why'd you let him go? No evidence. They lynched the only witness. But I've made him a little nervous now. They'll get real jumpy with the help of some liquor. Well, what good'll that do, sir? They just might hang themselves, Chester. Yes, with a prod or two from me. <laughs> Come on, I said, well, yeah. Are you still here, gentlemen? May I buy you a drink? What are you doing here, Marshal? Why do you want to buy us a drink? Yeah. Uh, bartender, uh, give me that bottle there, will you? Just Kim, yeah. Kim, I don't like this. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute, Hank. I'm too big a man in Dodge to get pushed around by any Marshal. Uh, I just want you to have one drink before you leave, gentlemen. Yeah. Just one. For you, Cam. And for you... Thanks. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, here's to may he rest in peace, Billy Saxton. You looking for trouble, Marshal? You're the one who's got trouble, Hank. What do you mean? You turned me loose yourself. Yeah, I know. But what about Cam here? What? You think Cam's going to let you go after... Everything you've told me? What you tell him, Hank? Nothing. He's lying. I told him nothing. <laughs> then what are you talking about, Marshal? Just that I've got about all the evidence I need, Cam. Won't you ask Hank? He can tell you. Go on. Hank, if you cross me, I'll see you die for it. You believe him, do you? Well, go ahead. You didn't have the guts to shoot your shut brother up. yourself. Shut up. Who are you going to hire to shoot shut me? Shut up, blast you. Shut it me up. Shut You're me drunk, up. man. Use your head. You've got to send enough trouble already. Shut I have. If you'd let me shoot that boy when he stumbled on me, we'd have been all right. Stop it. Stop you it. may be rich, Cam, but you sure ain't smart. I'm going to kill you, Hank. <laughs> well, draw on me and I'll have two pals tomorrow. All right, hold it, both of you. We've heard enough. Well, there you are, Hank. Marshal's heard all he needs. You're done for now. Yeah? <laughs> well, I shot a marshal in Trinidad once. Don't see why I can't shoot one in Dodge. Don't try it, Hank. Why not, Marshal? <laughs> Good riddance. You're under arrest, Cam. 
Hank shot Job Marshalls. You heard him say so. I heard him. But I'm still interested in who murdered Billy Saxon. And you're right back where you started, Marshal. Seems nobody knows about that lynching. I know about it. Right, Stuart. I'm not proud of it, but I was there. I witnessed the whole thing. Now, take your gun now, Cam. I guess you win, Marshal. Nobody wins this time, Cam. Now, maybe the next time anybody gets an idea about lynching a man around here, they'll think twice. Now, you lead the way. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Paul Dubov, John Daner, and Tom Tully, with Joan Danton, Ralph Moody, and Lee Millar. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. was the dust. The heat was bad enough in Dodge City, but out on the plain, it was the dust. The sun was a burning red-brown chip in the sky, and the sweat on a man never had a chance to drop. It was blotted and dried with dust. Doc, Chester, and I had ridden to old man Gore's place ten miles out. He'd had some trouble with one of the hands. The fellow had gone loco with liquor and had been shooting up the cattle. We found him, stripped naked nearby on his haunches, crying, drunk over a parched water hole. Doc had got him to bed and fixed him up some. And now we were heading back for Dodge. Darn horse. Seems he's just bound to stomp all the dust and canvas in my eyes. <coughs> Maybe the marshal will buy you a camel, Chester. This keeps up. We'll all buy camels. I remember the time back in Waco when I was just Doc, a small... Doc, Chester, boy. you see something ahead on the side of the trail there? Um, yeah, maybe. It looks like some poor calf strayed off and dropped. I don't think so. Uh, it looks like a man. Come on. Chester, get the water bag. Yes, it's there. Let me have a look, Marshal. Yeah. Let's see. Heat. Is he all right? Well, it depends on how long he's been lying here. Here you are, Mr. Dillon. Now. Open up his shirt, Marshal. Chester, get some of that water on his wrist. All right. It looks like an Easterner, huh? Sure not dressed for this country. Oh, no, that's better. That's better. 
Try to get a few drops in him. All right. Now, not too much, Chester. <coughs> not in his nose, Chester. His mouth. Well, my gracious, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon, but he moved his head. It's not so easy to... Hey, look, he's awake. Mm. You're all right, mister. Just take it easy for a bit now. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. What did he say? Oh, it's out of his head, Chester. For this relief, much thanks. Forget it. Chester, get around the other side and shade him from the sun. Yes, you the sun. I begin to be a weary of the sun. I don't blame you. Uh, what happened? My wagon shed a wheel, I fear, along the high road. I know not where I am. Uh, you're about four miles out of Dodge City. Uh, Kansas. Kansas. Uh, I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. You better get him to town quick. He's in a bad way. He's delirious. Uh, you think you can make it on a horse? We'll take you into... We'll take him into Dodge. And he passed out again. We tied him across Doc's horse. Doc and I doubled up and Chester rode behind. The stranger was a tall, skinny man with a face like a friendly mule. Big hands and thin wrists stretched out from his sleeves. He had no papers on him, nothing. And until he woke up, we wouldn't even know his name. Doc settled him down in the back of his place, and he was still asleep when Chester and I rode out to where we figured he'd left his wagon. It wasn't hard to see when we found it. What color wagon would you call that, Mr. Dillon? Puce, Chester. Puce. I guess so. Seems to be some writing on the side there. Yeah. Oh, Irving Henry... Thespian Supreme Disciple of the Immortal Bard. Mm. I should have known he was a religious man. Uh, he's an actor, Chester, the Immortal Bard. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, wrote plays, poems. Ah, ah, oh. ah but... You think he let the horses go, Mr. Dillon? Well, I was wondering that. Seems to me he'd have ridden for help instead of trying to walk. Horses couldn't have got out of the harness themselves. Well, let's take a look at the wheel. I wish we could wait till the sun goes down. It's going to be awful hot work, Mr. Dillon. <coughs> eh, it's not too bad. The pen fell out. Must be another in the box at the back. Take a look, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. I'll prop the wheel up here. Yeah. Mr. Dillon? Hey, yeah, can't you find it? Will you come here a minute? Uh, what's the matter? Take a look in there. It took a second or two to get used to the darkness inside the wagon. And then I saw the hand sticking out from behind the trunk. You didn't have to be the doc to know that it was a dead hand. The body was of a man about 40. He was dirty. And in a greasy, torn waistcoat, I found a pocketbook with his name. Sam Matchett. And that was all. Below his left shoulder and his back was a patch of dried blood. And in the middle... A bullet hole. We got the wagon wheel on, hitched up our horses, and drove into Dodge. Doc? Oh, that's you, Marshal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, be right out. All right. Get that fella's wagon fixed up? Yeah, I brought it in. Is he awake? Oh, I haven't looked in the last half hour. I was making coffee. You want some? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, it's a funny thing about coffee when it's hot weather like this. Drink it scalded and it makes you feel cooler outside. Uh, look, Doc, I got to see that fellow. I want to ask him a couple of questions. Oh, that's so? I found a dead man in the back of his wagon. You don't say. You better take a look. Chester's bringing him in the side. 
Oh, sure, sure, sure. You want to go on back? Uh, yeah, thanks, Doc. <clears throat> Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry, wake up. Yeah, what? Oh. Your name, Irving Henry? Oh, Irving Henry. What is this place? Now, you got to listen to me for a minute. We found your wagon. Ah. Uh -huh. Did you let the horses go before you sat on your own? Of course. I could not let them remain to die. Well, how come you didn't take one to ride? I have a loathing of horses. I cannot bear one under my body. <coughs> there is a carafe of water beside the bed. Would you be good enough, uh, Mr. Uh, uh... Uh, Dillon, Matt Dillon. I'm the marshal here in Dark City. Here you are. Oh, my thanks. Now, what were you doing with a dead man in your wagon, Mr. Henry? A dead man? A dead man shot in the back, lying in your wagon. This is very midsummer madness. I won't argue about that, but I'll thank you to answer my question. Oh, but it is impossible. It isn't true. I say it is. You lie in your throat if you say that I'm any other than an honest man. Look, mister, I didn't say you weren't honest. You're an actor. And you got a fine way of saying things, but murder's murder. I don't care how you say it. Now, I'm asking questions, and I want straight answers. Your pardon, sir. What you tell me... In truth, if, if it were played upon a stage, I would condemn it as an improbable fiction. I swear to you, I know nothing of a body. Did you come through Hayes City? Yes. Yeah. Do you know a man there called Sam Matchett? No. You had no trouble in Hayes City? No. What are you doing in these parts, Mr. Henry? Uh, I'm... I am touring the provinces. An actor... Eating the bitter bread of banishment. And my talents are not taken for their worth in the East. And therefore, I bring the immortal bard to the hinterlands. And now, sir, that the interview is ended, pray give me leave to depart. I'm sorry, I can't do that. You'll have to stay until we get this thing cleared Mr. up. Mr. Dillon, Doc would like to see you. Ah, all right, Chester. Stay here with Mr. Henry, will you? Well, sure, Mr. Dillon, sure. If, how are you feeling by now, Mr. Henry? Would you like some more water? These evil men live in glass. Doc. Right here, Marshal. Yeah. Fill me cup, Father Boy. What What'd you find? Well, there's one thing. This man didn't die right away. I mean, not right when he was shot. Is that so? No. More likely bled to death. Inside. Uh-huh. Uh, you think he might have been able to climb up in the wagon after he was shot? Well, he might. There's another thing. Yeah. You see the way he's dressed? Now, you take a look at that. Help! Help! Come on. Come on, Doc. Come on. 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 Chester. What's he's the matter with him? Chester. He's my gun when I was pouring him some water, Mr. Wait. Dillon. He must have gone through the window, Marshal. I, I tried to get it back. It went off. Take care of Chester, Doc. I'm going after him. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, do you know how old the school building in your community is? If it's over 25 years old, the chances are that it's woefully inadequate to the present demands on it. Certainly thousands of schools all over America are unable to meet the needs of a greatly increased enrollment. And all our school children will suffer unless all of us work actively to improve conditions. Join with the groups in your community working for better school conditions. Remember, better schools build a stronger America. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. When I went out of there, I didn't know how badly Chester was hurt. There was a lot of blood on his head and over his face. 
It was nearly dark outside, and the street was empty. It was supper time. I could see the women through the windows getting food ready. The kids were inside, too. Sure looked peaceful. But with Henry out with a gun, well, that wasn't a good thing to have running around loose in Dodge. You see a man run down the street, Miss Fletcher? Well, no. Well, you better get inside and lock your door. Don't come out again. There's a killer loose. I walked the length of the street, listening, waiting. And when I got to the end, there was nothing. He hadn't taken a horse, I'd have heard that. And in a way, I was sorry, because if he'd tried to hide and dodge, there'd be no way to get out of shooting that wouldn't get women and kids hurt. A breeze came up, and swirls of dust flew around, and then settled as the air became still and hot again. I went back to Doc's place. Did you find him, Marshal? No. How's Chester? Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Dillon. Just creased my head, more mess than hurt. Oh, good, Chester. Uh, look, you want to go home or you want to work? I want to work. All right. Go down to the office, get yourself another gun, and round up some men, as many as you can. As long as Henry stays in town, we're in trouble. Now, keep your eyes open. Meet me back here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Take my gun with you, and if you see him, watch out. All right, I'll get going. Yes, sir. Now, Doc, I'm going to have to make you a deputy, too. Well, <laughs> well, maybe instead of digging out bullets, I'll be putting some in. It's not funny, Doc. Now, come on. All right, we'll start here. I'll take this side, you take the other. Get the men to go through their houses and tell them to look for their horses. Tell them what's happening. By 10 o'clock that night, as far as we could tell, Henry hadn't left town. There were plenty of places for him to hide, though. We had 50 men out searching. Chester and I were working along back of the express office. There were a couple of houses there we hadn't covered. You wouldn't think a man like that would be a killer, now would you, Mr. Dillon? I never saw a man yet couldn't be, Chester. Depends on your reasons for killing, I guess. Now, let's take a look behind these boxes, huh? You think he could have got this far? Yeah, he might. A lot of back streets to sneak around in the dark. That's Miss Cullen's place there, isn't it? Yes, sir. Looks like she's still awake. Light burning back there. Yeah. <clears throat> Seem a bit cooler to you tonight, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, a bit. Oh, uh, evening, Miss Cullen. I'm sorry to get you up, but we're looking for a man, a stranger around. He's tall, thin. You seen anyone about tonight? No. No, I haven't. Uh-huh. Uh, how, how's the kids? Oh, they're fine. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Fine. Uh-huh. Well, you keep the place locked tight, Miss Cullen. Don't let anybody in tonight unless you know who it is. All right. Good night, Mr. Dillon. Good night, ma'am. Well, now, that's strange. She didn't even say hello to me, and I know her better than you do, Mr. Dillon. Chester, round up the others. Get them over here. I don't know why she... He's in there with her. I think he's got the kids in the sleeping room. Oh. Sent her out to get rid of us. Now, I'm going to try and get in. Don't do anything when you come back. Just put the men around the house. Yes, sir. I 
had seen Miss Cullen make a move with her head, and her eyes set the rest. When I told her to lock up, I shook my head, and I hoped she understood. I wanted that front door to stay open. As soon as I can. He was in there, all right. I could hear him. I wanted him alive. But I wasn't going to risk hurt to Miss Cullen or the kids getting him. I did what you asked. Don't hurt the children, please. They will never know this night. And in the morning, when they will Look there. You said you locked the door up. No, don't. Don't. I shall keep the pistol turned to the girl's head now. Someone is here. They try to take me. Who is it? Who? Mr. Dillon, go away. Please. He'll kill us. You lied. You lied. Oh, tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. Listen to me, Marshal Dillon. Throw your pistol in here, and then come in with your hands before you. I have no stomach for child killing, but I will not hesitate to do so. Now, give me the gun, Henry. No. You won't be able to get out of this. I must. There is living to be done. You know, that fancy talk isn't going to help either. Now, why don't you climb down? What happened to Match it? Nothing happened to Match. Why'd you kill him? I didn't. In five minutes or less, there'll be 50 men or more around here. Now, what are you going to do? I don't know. If you didn't kill Match it, you'll get a chance. I'll see to that. There's no use going on this way. Give me the gun. I cannot. It is my prop of salvation. No gun is salvation to anybody. Put it down. You must tell the men to go away, Marshal Dillon. I'll have to take one of these children with me for my protection. No! <laughs> Shed a tear for me, madam. I have the greater need. You do a lot of talking, mister. I'd like to see you turn the gun away from that kid's head. That'd take more than talk, wouldn't it, though? I have no skill with such a weapon. Why should I match with you? I want to live. You're going about it the wrong way. The smallest worm will turn being trod upon. Meaning? You gave me no choice when you brought me here. Would have been better to have left me lying in the dust. You don't understand me. You don't know. Well, why don't you tell me? What good would it do? It depends. My life has been the theater. As a boy, I, I was a student of Shakespeare. <laughs> he would look at me. <laughs> Who would accept this face for Hamlet? This ill-shaped body for Romeo. <laughs> His speech has become my speech. But, and the fools only look. They cannot listen for laughing. There have been ugly men before you, or... Hasn't been cause for murder. Why'd you kill Matchett? In New York, there was a man, a gross, stupid man, who fancied himself an interpreter of the bard. He, he took me, me, as his apprentice. And together we 
set out for the tour, I would play only the voices. Never Richard. Never Henry. Never Leah. Only, only the voices. Whilst he, stumbling, drunken, he muddled and tore to a tatter the, the words that I should have spoken. You killed a man because you wanted to play a hero. How easily murder is discovered. Yeah, sometimes, I guess. It was yesterday. We were leaving Hayes City. We played there for two days. And it made me a laughing stock. It was night. And he became drunk and, and threatened to leave me in the next town. I made him stop the wagon and taking up a pistol, I shot him. He did not die at first. And when I saw what I had done, I, I wanted him to live. And I put him into the wagon, and I drove on, hoping to find a doctor. Then, as, as the night passed, I saw that he had died. And I was afraid. The wagon broke down? Yes. I, I put my purse into his clothes and took his name for mine. How I've hated the name of Sam Matchett. But you wouldn't understand. I wouldn't. Well, what now? I want to live. I want my chance. You've done a murder. I can't let you go, you know that. Don't make it harder. I lost my husband two years ago. I know what it is to be alone. You've been alone, haven't you? I'm sorry. But you killed someone. We may pity, though not pardon, dear. <laughs> I'm going now, Marshal. If you walk out of there with your gun, you're a dead man. Death's a great disguiser. I must have my chance. Don't do it, Matchett. They'll be killing. Madam, forgive me. I would not have harmed your children. Matchett, put down your gun. Let me go my way. Please. There are a lot of men waiting for you out there, Matchett. You know what'll happen if you open the door. Don't do it, Matchett. the rub for in that sleep of death what dreams may come match it He knew he was going to die. The minute he opened that door, he knew it. And maybe he wanted to, because he fired first a single shot. We buried him in back of the church, and I found some words in a book to put on his grave. He that dies pays all debts.
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Hans Conrad was featured as Henry, with Mary Lansing as Mrs. Cullen. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Roy Rowan speaking. Remember, gangbusters going to action Saturday nights on the CBS radio network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Palace, Marshal. I see you received my complaint. I got it, Mingo. Where's Stanley? Where do you think? Upstairs. Brandy? Naturally. She always does mother him when he's in trouble. <laughs> be careful, Marshal. He might be dangerous. <laughs> well, Marshal. Got a sweet word for Dixie? Yeah. Move. Oh, it's not very sweet. It was to the point. <laughs> Say hello to Jim for me, huh? Go away. It's me, Brandy. Matt. Come in, Matt. Join me in a drink? Where is he, Brandy? In the next room. Cried himself to sleep. Save it, Brandy. I gotta take him. Oh, why, Matt? Jim Stanley never did a mean thing in his life. He's no bad man. He stole money from Mingo's roulette table and he threw a bottle at him when he was caught. Mingo's present charges. Stanley can clear himself in court. Huh. Against Mingo's witnesses? Do you bring Stanley out or do I go get him? Go get him. But I wouldn't be proud, Matt. Stick to running dance hall, girls, Brandy. Let me run the law, huh? Stanley? 
Stanley. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's you, Marshal. I was sleeping. I want you to come with me, Jim. Come with you? Sure, Marshal. You better get up. Come on. Mm. Come on. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, where are we going, Marshal? Would you like to visit my ranch? I got a new coat. The prettiest little sorrel you ever saw. Jim, she... what? we're going to jail. Jail? Me, Marshal? Do I have to? Yes, Jim. I've never been in a jail. I'm sorry, Jim. No, no. I, I can't go in there. Oh, Marshal, I ain't never been locked up before. Please don't make me. I have to. I... Didn't mean to do it. Honest, I just lost my head when I realized my money was gone. I wouldn't have kept those chips. I know that. I I just grabbed them. I don't know why. They were there, and I just grabbed them, and then Mingo started in on me. Kept saying things, bad things about... Take it easy, Jim. I wouldn't have cared, except that, well, Dixie was there. He kept yelling at me that I was a thief right, right in front of her. I tried to make him stop... And he wouldn't. Then something happened. The bottle was there. You threw it at Mingo? No. No, I just threw it, Marshal. I was crazy. I I didn't mean to hurt nobody. I believe you, Jim. (sighs) Marshal, uh, will you ask Dixie to come and see me later? Yeah, sure, I'll ask you. Thanks. I just want to tell her not to blame Mingo for all this. She might say something or give up her job. Don't worry, Jim. I don't think Dixie's going to give up anything. He won't eat his dinner, Mr. Dillon. He just sits there staring. Yeah, poor devil. He won't really be convicted, will he? Well, I hope not, Chester. Mingo's the one who ought to be in jail. Look, Chester, this isn't exactly my idea of justice either. A shady gambler against a simple-minded horse rancher. Hello, Marshal. Goodbye, Chester. Hmm? Oh, Goodbye. I'll run along. You stay put, Chester. Oh, now, Marshal, I want to be alone with you. I sent for you to come and visit Jim Stanley, and you better be nice to him. (laughs) Most fellows are tickled pink if I like them. They say I'm pretty. You're pretty enough. Hmm, That's that's better. I knew you liked me. I said you were pretty. I didn't say I liked you. Oh, now that's nasty. Would you like to hear what I really think of you? No, don't bother. I get the idea. You're Mingo's girl. When I feel like it. Then why do you have to tease a man like Stanley, drive him to drinking and gambling and trouble like he's in now? He's sweet. He thinks I'm beautiful. Yeah. But even men like him wake up. Stick to Mingo. drop in and see if your prisoner was all set for trial tomorrow. Mingo, I want you to withdraw those charges. And let that potential murderer go free? (laughs) No. You got back the chip Stanley took from your table, and his assaulting a man like you is ridiculous. He doesn't even wear a gun. A bottle constitutes a deadly weapon. Look it up. Why are you doing this, Mingo? Why pick on a man like Stanley? Let's say I don't like him always slobbering over Dixie. She's private property. For that greedy little vixen he had sent Stanley to prison, knowing that it'll probably crack his mind completely? That's his problem. You don't understand, Mingo. I don't like to see people pushed around. Well, don't cross me, Marshal. I already have. 
People get dead that way. Yeah, so I've heard. Now, just who are these witnesses of yours against Stanley? Ned Cole, Saginaw Henry. Both on your payroll. Dixie. Some of the other girls. All working for you, huh? Jim Stanley's as good as convicted, Marshal. There's not a thing you can do about it. Here, man. Drink this. Ah, uh, thanks, Brandy. <clears throat> You know, all you need to do is stop fighting yourself, Matt. You're mixed up. Yeah, that's sure true, Brandy. You know, it's funny when when it's something you can fight with your fists and your guns, it's easy. But how do you fight a deal like this? You've got to clear Jim somehow. Yeah, with those witnesses against him, Jim can't win in court. Technically, he's a criminal. Oh, criminal, my foot. He admits the crimes. The judge will have to sentence him to at least a minimum jail term. We know there are witnesses who can prove he's innocent. Now, a smart man would find a way to make him talk. I've been thinking about it. Well, I, I, I'll tell Jim you were asking after him. I, I think he'd like that. Mm, he's Dixie's. Hm. I had me a man once, Matt. I traded him for a bottle of brandy. <laughs> Paid a stiff price for my name. You're not through yet, Brandy. Oh, sure. <laughs> I play mother to everybody. Take everybody's troubles on my shoulders. Help salve my conscience. <laughs> Don't ever hurt a person, Matt. You never get through paying for it. Well, I, I better be going. Where? To try to get some of those witnesses to talk. Hello, Saginaw. Huh? Oh, it's you. I've been looking for you. And you've been looking for trouble. Well, you're beginning to sound like your boss, Mingo. It's late. What do you want? I want to read you something from this book. What book? This law book. Oh, so? First law I see says that uh, anyone giving a drink to an Indian is liable to fine up to $500. I saw you buy an Indian Pete a drink only last week. Pete's a stable boy. He ain't no savage. Law doesn't say savage. Says Indian. Pete's an Indian, so technically you broke the law. You can't make. Next any... one says any man that disrobes in a public place is guilty of committing a public nuisance. Carries a fine of a hundred dollars. Look, what the devil is all? This... I saw you breaking a horse down in Harrison's Corral a little while back. You took your shirt off, and that's disrobing in a public place. Technically. You can't get away with this, Dylan. How much you make a month, Saginaw? Fifty, seventy-five. Uh-huh. Well, the way it looks, I can get you fined on enough of these laws to keep you broke for about five years. Five years? Then we can start all over again. You're, you're bluffing. I never even heard of these well, laws. Well, look for you... yourself. Here. If you witnesses are going to send Jim Stanley to jail on a technicality, then a lot of you are going to jail the same way. Well, laws may be there, but they ain't fair. All right, Saginaw, if that's how you want it. Come on, let's go to jail. No, no uh, wait. Well, then start talking. Well, Dixie shilled Stanley into losing his money, and, and me and Ned Cole egged him into grabbing a couple of chips when the wheelman wasn't looking. On Mingo's orders? Sure. Stanley looked down at the chips we swiped, and uh, he reached out to hand them back when Mingo jumped him. What was Dixie doing? I'm trying to keep from laughing. Yeah, I'll bet. And then what? Mingo rode Stanley hard to make him break down in front of Dixie. And finally, the poor lunkhead seemed to go crazy. He yelled and tossed a bottle at the bar. Not at Mingo? No, missed him by ten feet. Stanley was just working off his mad by busting the bottle. 
paid for it. I guess he had the right. Yeah, I guess he had. First, I think Mingo was just deviling Stanley, and then he got the idea to press charges and send him to jail. We got orders out of testifying. Uh-huh. Oh, thanks, Saginaw. Uh, Marshal, uh, I'd like you to know something. Yeah? I'm glad I told you about Stanley, because framing him into prison isn't my idea of something to be proud of. It shouldn't be. Ah, oh, good evening, Chester. My, what are you so happy about, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> everything, Chester, everything. Is it about Jim Stanley? It is about Jim Stanley. He's going to clear himself in court tomorrow. Come on, let's go tell him. Well, gracious, that is good news. He couldn't have taken much more of being locked up. <laughs> I know. Hey, Jim, wake up. We're going to break... Jim. Mr. Dillon, he's, he's gone. Both window bars are cut. Yeah. And here's what cut him. A hacksaw blade. And look yonder, there's another. Oh, that fool. Why couldn't he have waited one more day and he'd have been free? Jim Stanley didn't have those hacksaw blades on him, Mr. Dillon. I know I searched him good. You searched Dixie good? Hmm? Oh, mercy, no, Mr. Dillon. She's a girl. He didn't have any other visitors. No, sir. Mingo's going to be awful mad when he finds out his girl helped Jim Stanley get away. Come on. You going to arrest Dixie, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. First, I got to find her. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Sunday on CBS Radio, hear both sides debate the issues on Pick the Winner. It's a program that brings in the top people from Democratic and Republican camps, standing their ground and delivering their views on the biggest questions of the campaign. Don't miss Pick the Winner, Sundays between now and November, to be fully informed when it comes time to vote. And remember, straight through election time, make CBS Radio your election headquarters. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. aren't you, Marshal? Where's Dixie, Mingo? Dixie, she's gone. I don't know where she is. You're lying. No, well, I swear she disappeared hours ago. I still think you're lying. Dixie's here someplace. No, he's telling me the truth for once, man. Dixie's gone, all right. Are you sure, Brandy? Saw her ride out of town. With Stanley? Yeah, Matt. The two of them. Dixie and Stanley? Dixie passed him some saw blades. He cut his way up. That rotten double cross and hellcat. She's your girl, Mingo. I'll be the laughing stock of Dart City. Good. I hope they laugh you clear out of Kansas. <laughs> if it's the last thing I'll do, I'll find her. Both of them. Finding them is my job, Mingo. Go ahead. But you better beat me to them, or you'll be arresting them dead. <laughs> They stopped here, all right. Probably changed horses and got some supplies. That wasn't why Stanley came home. Look, Chester. What? Water in the stock trough is right up to the top. And the barn's open. Feed pulled out where the stock can reach it. Even scared to death, Jim thought about his animals first. Mr. Dillon, you think Mingo's trailing Stanley and Dixie, too? Uh, perhaps. It's one good reason why we'd better catch him quick. Come on. Come on. Still no sign. Uh, looks like we've lost them for good now. What do we do? Go back, Mr. Dillon? Well, we can't let Mingo find them. 
Sure, but the way they've been zigzagging back and forth for the last four days, we don't have a chance in a thousand. I'm not so sure, Chester. Hmm? You know, there's a certain pattern about the way Stanley and Dixie have been moving. I don't think they're trying to leave this section at all. Yeah, we have been getting closer and closer to Dodge with every circle lately. And not only to Dodge. Mr. Dillon, you got an idea? Yeah, maybe. Come on, we'll ride back to Stanley's ranch. You think they came back here? I will soon find out. But from what we saw here before, I'll bet Stanley's not the kind to stay away from his ranch for very long. I'm hit the dirt. Get out Behind the drop. Yeah. It's Jim Stanley. There's his horse. Yeah. All right, keep your eyes open. Stanley! Jim, it's Matt Dillon. Let me talk to you. You go away, Marshal. I don't want to hurt you, but I ain't going back to that jail. Well, you go away now. I'll kill you. Jim, listen to me. I've got a witness. You better leave quick now. Please, Marshal. Mr. Dillon, I'm getting wet. It's better than getting shot. Keep your head down. Yes, sir. Sure he is wet. Stanley's in a good position. Closest cover for us is the barn. That's across 50 yards of clearing. That's a long run. He could pick us off before we made 10 feet. Yeah. Jim! I'm not leaving until I've talked to you. Leave me alone, Marshal. Can't you leave me alone? I'm coming to talk to you, Jim. No! No, stay back! I warn you! Mr. Dillon, don't do it. That's a crazy man. That's a frightened man, Chester. I'm coming unarmed, Jim. I don't think you're a murderer, but if you are, this is your chance. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Stanley's shot sliced across my side like a branding iron. It was all I could do to ignore my fear and keep going. But somehow I reached the ranch house alive. And I opened the door. <laughs> Jim Stanley stood there holding his gun. Jim. I, I, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I, I was only trying to scare you. I'm not a killer. I, I never shot anybody in my life. Honest, Marshal, I can't even shoot a rabbit. I know that, Jim. I, I'm afraid... I've always been afraid of things. I try like to be like other people, and it only seems to bring trouble. You can stop being afraid of the law and jail right now. That's all over with. You, you mean that, Marshal? Really? Really. But, but I shot you. Did you? No, I don't recall. Oh, but Mr. Dillon, shot hit your side right, right there. You see it? It's bleeding. Now, Jim, listen to me. You didn't shoot me. Oh. Well, all right, if, if you say so, Mr. Dillon. I say so. Here, I'll take that rifle. Now, let's go back to town and get this business settled, huh? You've been good to me, Marshal. Forget it, Jim. There is one thing, though. Dixie. Oh, she brought me hacksaw blades. I know that. She said you were going to hang me and that, that I had to escape. She kept saying uh -huh. it. Oh. She was riding with you. Well, where is she now? Oh, she left me last night. 
I was glad. I was nearly wild listening to her talk about you and prison. <laughs> even swore I'd kill myself before I'd go back to jail. And I'm glad you didn't mean it. Oh, I meant it at the time. Oh, I was sure scared. <laughs> you feel better now? Oh, yeah. Yes, I know. Everything's just going to be fine. Ah, ah, ah. The rifle slug splashed the side of Jim's face with red, and he crumpled into the dirt. From the water trough, Chester opened up and drew the fire of whoever was hiding in the hayloft of the barn. I could see a gun barrel poking out from the side of the hayloft. I picked up Stanley's rifle. Bingo. Mr. Dillon, are you all right? Yeah, Chester. But Mingo's dead. Well, how about Jim Stanley, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, he was scared more than hurt. He should come to any minute. Well, my goodness. Oh, this looks like a sure enough war's been happening around here. Where have you been, Dixie? Oh, sure now, Marshal. A, a girl's got a right to look after her uh, investments. Uh, my Mingo and Stanley both dead. Well, now that's a real shame. Hmm? Oh, but Jim's dead. Uh, Chester, a... you said investments. The only investment you've made is prison time for helping Jim escape. Me? Well, how are you going to prove anything, Marshal, with Jim dead? But he's your Chester, only... why don't you go look after the horses? But Mr. Dillon... Yes, sir. It's a right good thing because I'm going to be terribly busy, you know, taking care of poor Jim's ranch and money and, and of course, the funeral and everything. Why should all that concern you, Dixie? Because I'm Jim Stanley's widow. What? I married him three days ago in this city. It was such a sweet wedding. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And... Now all I have left are some memories. And, of course, this little old ranch and Jim's money. Dixie, there's something you should know. Hmm? You also got a husband. Have you heard enough, Jim? Enough. Jim! When I, I saw you fall... You're... You're bad, Dixie. Oh, no. Jim, you, you mustn't pay no mind to what I said. I, I was upset with... Didn't I come back just to be with you? No good, Dixie. Jim's on to you now. Jim, are you going to let him talk to me like that? He's my friend. And I don't like you now, Dixie. Oh, that's too bad. I'm still your wife. Marshal, can she make that stick? Well, by law, you have to support her, Jim. Of course, I don't say how. Marshal, you stop putting ideas And, of in... course, she has to take care of your house for you, Jim. Clean it, do the chores, cook for you. Cook? Me? Cook for him? He can <laughs> make you, Dixie. It's his right. All oh, right or not, I'd like to see him try. He can do it, Dixie. Yeah? Well, I can't if I'm not here. And I'm leaving right now. You want to ride into town with us, Jim? No. I think I'd rather stay here for a while, Marshal. If it's all right. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll fix it. But in a few days, when you feel like it, come in and see me, and we'll help you get that divorce taken care of. Divorce? On grounds of desertion. She just deserted you, remember? Chester and I are your witnesses. Oh. Well, thanks, Marshal. I sure do. Thank you. So long, Jim. Goodbye, Marco. Bye. Come on, Chester, let's go. Yeah, he's had it too rough out here on the frontier, hasn't he, Mr. Dillon? Uh, Jim Stanley, I mean. It's addled him, sort of. Yeah, I guess that's it, Chester. <clears throat> Men like him need looking after. Yeah, we got all kinds out here, Chester. Come on, let's get back to town. Go. 
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner and Michael Ann Barrett, with Paul Dubov, Vivi Janice, and Bill Lally. Harley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow's speakers on Pick the Winner, representing both the major parties, will be Harold Stassen, Republican, and George Ball, Democrat. Listen for this important program, Pick the Winner, tomorrow and every Sunday from now to November. This is Roy Rowan speaking, and this is the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. There it is. Yeah. Wonder if he's in. We'll soon find out. Look him over close. You've got to know how he stacks up. Yeah, I know. Hope he doesn't recognize us. He won't. Come on. Morning, boys. Morning, sir. Are, uh, are you the marshal here in Dodge? Yeah, that's right. My name is Dillon, Matt Dillon. Uh, Thompson's our name. I'm Jim. This is my brother, Will. Hey, I'm glad to know you. This is my sidekick, Chester Proudfoot. Pleased to meet howdy, you. Howdy, howdy. Hey, Mr. Dillon, we're after some information. Huh? What kind of information? Well, you see, Will and I just brought a trail herd up from the Pecos country, mm -hmm. around 2,000 head. We're holding them downriver a few miles. Oh, toward Walnut Creek? Yeah, I guess that's what they call it. You see, we plan to drive them on up toward Wyoming and put them on grass for a couple of months. We got to thinking we might sell them here if we could get a fair price. Well, you shouldn't have any trouble. The market's good right now. So we've heard. Well, the only thing is, we we don't know any buyers here. We were wondering if you might have an idea or two. I see. Well, uh, let me see. I suggest you go talk to Clem Bates. He runs the bank down the west end of Front Street. Mm. Clem Bates, huh? Yeah, he'll know of any buyers that happen to be in town. Might even buy the herd himself if it's in good condition. Well, we'll go right down and see him now, Mr. Dillon. And uh, much obliged to you, sir. <laughs> Forget it. Coming, Will? Yeah. Been a pleasure talking to you, Marshal. Thank you. Same to you. Goodbye. Well, he seemed like a couple of nice men, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. A couple of strange ones, Chester. Wonder what they're here for. Why to sell a herd of cattle? You heard what they said. Chester, when's the last time a trail driver came in here and asked me where to sell his cattle? Well, I don't recollect that one ever did before, but all the same. Of course they... not. They go to the bank or one of the saloons. They don't come to the jail. Then why do you figure the Thompsons did? Well, I got an idea they might be sizing me up. I think that's the kind of information they wanted. But why? I don't know. 
Maybe they're planning something they think I might interfere with. Uh, what do you say we ride out to Walnut Creek and find out if they really got a herd, huh? All right, Mr. Dillon, whatever you say. That older one, Jim. You know, there's something familiar. I can't quite place it. Thompson Brothers, huh? Well, come on, Chester, let's ride. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, oh. Well, they got a herd, all right, Mr. Dillon. Yes, yeah, so they have, Chester. Well, let's drop in on them, huh? Come on. Smoke's coming up behind those willows. Must be their camp. Yeah, I guess so. These cattle are carrying a Circle Bar T brand. I never heard of it. It's like the Thompson brothers, Chester. I never heard of them either. At least not by that name. Camp looks deserted, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I... Right, right way out! Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody coming out of the wagon there. Yeah, he must have been asleep or... <laughs> well, well, well. You fellas better turn them horses around. Hello, Houston. Dillon, I... I didn't recognize you. Well, now that you have, why don't you put the rifle down? Well, sure, Marshal, I... I got no quarrel with you. You used to figure you did. Well, I... How long you been working for the Thompsons, Houston? Just a couple of months. I ran into them down on the Pecos. I got out for the drive. Did you know them before that? No. No, I just happened to run into them, and I heard they was looking for riders. Riders? I never knew you to hire out for anything but gunslinging. Why don't you let bygones be bygones, Marshal? A, a man can change. Maybe. Now, you take me. I, I don't hold no grudges. You run me out of town last year, and I was pretty sore about it, but, but not anymore. I'm, I'm willing to forget it. If you do, you'll be making a mistake, Houston. Now, look, Marshal. I told you to get out of Dodge City and stay out. That still goes. You understand me? All right, Marshal. That's the way you want it. I'm not in Dodge City. Not yet. They don't seem to be in here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, we'll wait, Chester. They will be sooner or later. Well, it was a real dull day up until now. Uh, well, hiya, Kitty. Good to see you, Matt. Uh, Chester? Hmm? Uh, you're on your own. What? Uh, uh, stick around, though, huh? All right, Mr. Dillon. See you later, Miss Kitty. All right, Chester. You like a drink? Not now, thanks, Kitty. I, uh, I was looking for a couple of strangers in town, the, uh, Thompson brothers. Oh, yeah. They were in earlier. Seem very pleasant, quiet, real polite. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. People aren't always what they seem to be, Kitty. Well, are they mixed up in something, man? No, no, no. I don't know. Well, then what do you mean? I don't think their name is Thompson. And I don't think they came here to sell cattle. But they brought a herd in. Yeah, I know, I know that. But I'm pretty sure I've seen that older brother somewhere before, somewhere, sometime. You're suspicious of everybody, aren't you, Matt? <laughs> Are you going to start that again? All right, all right. <laughs> but you got the wrong attitude, you know. You miss a lot that way. Yeah? Yeah. Someday you're going to miss... Over here at the Oh, bar, there they man. are now. I came in with Clem Bates. Uh, will you excuse me, Kitty? Sure, Matt, sure. When you're through, come back. I'll be here. All right, Kitty, I'll see you. Hiya, Clem. I just bought myself 2,000 head of the finest cattle that's come north all summer. Yeah, they are in good shape. I rode out that way this afternoon. Marshal, we want to thank you again for putting us in touch with Mr. Bates. We're as satisfied with the deal as he is. How about a drink, Matt? Uh, thanks, Clem. Later, maybe, huh? Uh, Mr. Thompson, do you know that you've got one of the crookedest gunslingers in this part of the country working for you? 
No, I didn't know it. Who do you mean? Man who calls himself Houston Jack. Houston Jack? Is he back in town? Well, not back in town, exactly. I ran into him out at the trail camp. I ordered him out of Dodge a year ago, Mr. Thompson. The order still stands. That's funny. He didn't tell us he'd ever been in Dodge. Well, I thought maybe he didn't. That's why I figured I'd better let you know about it. I'm glad you did, Marshal. Of course, with the herd sold, we'll be paying the boys off tomorrow, and that'll be that. Then back to Texas. The sooner the better. Well, meantime, there's nothing to prevent us from having a sociable drink or two. Holly, set him up over here. Mr. Dillon. What? Oh. Uh, will you boys excuse me a minute, Sure, please? go right ahead. Sure, Marshal. What are you going to have, Will? Yeah, what is it, Sammy? Could you spare me a dollar, Mr. Dillon? I need a drink off a bed. Oh, Sammy, you know what always happens? First it's one drink, and then it's ten. And I always end up by having to run you in. Oh, not this time, Mr. Dillon. I... Well, what's the matter, Sammy? Them fellas you're with, you know them, Mr. Dillon? Well, their name's Thompson. They're brothers. Huh? Oh, no, that's not their name. Well, then what is it? I... Got to get out of here, Mr. Dillon. Wait a minute, Sammy. What the devil are you talking about? No, no, no nothing, Mr. Dillon. Honest, I... Just remember something I... Uh, I, I got to go right now. Well, how about that drink? Uh, some other time, Mr. Dillon. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll remember it. Oh, go, uh, goodbye, Mr. Dillon. Here, what's wrong with Sammy, Matt? Did he smell a drink somewhere? <laughs> yeah, he must have. I don't know what you said to him, Marshal, but he sure went out of here looking like he'd seen a ghost. Well, Sammy's seen a lot of different things at different times. Maybe he did see a ghost. I can't figure where he got to, Mr. Dillon. And I looked in all the places he usually hangs out, but there wasn't any sign of him. Well, the ways of a drunkard and the ways of a woman, Chester, they're beyond all human knowledge. Yes, sir, I guess they are, Mr. Dillon. There's one thing certain, though. As blurry-eyed as he is, Sammy recognized those Thompson brothers. And that's more than I can do. Well, maybe there's nothing to recognize. Maybe you just think you've seen them before. Yeah, maybe. Well, there's no use going back to Texas Trail. That's one saloon Sammy will stay clear of. I just don't know where to look, Mr. Dillon. I'll swear Wait, I... wait a minute, Chester. Hmm? Oh, Thompson's coming out of the saloon. No, I mean across the street. There's somebody by the corner. That... By heaven, that's Sammy. Yes, and he's got a rifle. I got you, boys. Sammy, you fool! Over there for the corner. Come on, Chester. He must have been crazy, Mr. Dillon. He must have been out of his mind. Yeah, I guess. One side. Let me through here, please. Let me through. Sammy. Mr. Dillon, I... I used... could use that drink now. Thought I'd get the reward. I... <laughs> Sammy? Is he dead? Yeah. We sure hated to do it, Marshal. We had nothing against this man. Didn't even know him, in fact. But I guess you saw what happened. Yeah, I saw it. He threw a rifle on you, tried to kill you. You couldn't do anything else. I can't figure it, Marshal. My brother and me didn't have no quarrel with this fella. Well... Sammy drank a lot. He wasn't always in his right mind. But you won't be held. It was out and out self-defense. Thanks, Marshal. Thanks a lot. Come on, Will. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Well, it's too bad, Mr. Dillon. Sammy never meant no harm to anybody. He did to the Thompsons, Jeff. And I can't figure it. Why did he do it? Because he recognized them, I guess. Say, did you see them draw after he fired? Yeah. Yeah, I saw them. They're fast, Mr. Dillon. Matt. What? Oh, Kitty. I heard him down the street calling for Doc. 
He's hurt. Sammy got himself killed. Oh. Poor little guy. Yeah. Matt, you got trouble, too. What do you mean? Houston Jack's in town. What? He's over at the saloon now, looking for you. Matt, he says he's going to kill you. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, adventure on your mind, then keep tuned. The Gene Autry Show is straight ahead on most of these same CBS radio stations, bringing you the Melody Ranch Gang and Gene Autry songs. Tarzan's straight ahead, too, tonight, involved with some fanatic headhunters in darkest Africa. There's another true police case on gangbusters this evening. And Broadway is my beat offers mystery fiction that's packed with excitement. They're all ahead tonight on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. I just can't figure it, Mr. Dillon. I never thought Houston would have the nerve. Well, it's like a lot of things tonight, Chester. None of a figure. Mr. Dillon, you don't suppose he's going to set you up for the Thompsons? No. No, they got their horses and left. They're not in here. Well, we'll soon find out. Come on. <laughs> Watch the boys at the tables, Chester, and keep them off my back. Huh? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Hey, I wanted to leave Congress at that time. I'll tell you one thing for sure. There wasn't that chinhorn marshal that made me do it. You notice he's staying plenty clear of me. Uh... Hello, Houston. Dillon, you got nothing on me. I told you to get out of town, didn't I? I know, but you, you... You still got... I told you to stay up, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, but you had no right. What do you think you are? Why'd you come back? That's my business. Mine too, maybe. You're under arrest. Stay back, Dylan. I'm warning you. You can't keep backing off forever, Houston. You'll have to stop sometime. I said you're under arrest. I heard what you said. I got ears, Dylan, and I know I'm going to hurt. He's bolting out the door, Mr. Dillon. He's getting away. Be careful, Master. He could be waiting outside. Well, you drew, Mr. Dillon. Why didn't you shoot? Because you didn't draw. You can't. There he goes. Well, oh, come on, Chester. <laughs> Can't be far ahead of us, Mr. Dillon. Uh, he's heading for the ranch camp. I still can't figure it, Mr. Dillon. It just don't add up. Justice, I hope me if you say that once more, I'm... I'm... What's the matter, Mr. Dillon? Pull up. Hubba. Oh, oh. No. What are we stopping for, Mr. Dillon? He's getting farther away every minute. Chester, I owe you an apology. You're right, it don't add up. Well, it's... Just the way of talking I have, I didn't intend... No, no, no I mean it, Chester. Everything Houston Jack did tonight, it doesn't add up at all. He knew I'd jump him if he came into town. He's tough, but he's not that tough. He's not the kind of a man to force a gunfight just for a chance to show off. Yeah, but there wasn't any gunfight, Mr. Dillon. No, he turned tail and ran. That's not like Houston, either. You'll be a laughing stock from here to the Pecos. Well, it's like I said, it just don't add... I forget what I was going to say. Just to suppose that Thompson's wanted to get us out of town for a while, huh? You mean they put Houston up to that Dido so as we'd chase off after him? Well, there's only one way I know to find out. Come on. 
Dodge is kind of spooky this time of night, Mr. Dillon. Pretty, though. All shadows and moonlight. Yeah. Man could do a fair job of shooting tonight. My. Sometimes I think Kitty is right about you, Mr. Dillon. Meaning? No heart. Maybe not, Chester. Uh, no offense, Mr. Dillon. Oh, forget it. forget it. You know, Chester, there's something about moonlight connected with those Thompson brothers. I wish I could remember what... Chester, hmm? don't, don't look. Just ride straight ahead. Keep riding. There are four horses tied over there by the bank. Uh-huh. So that's it. One of them's been run. He's wet. I can see it in the moonlight. Houston must have circled back. Him and the Thompsons. Yes, but what about that fourth horse, Mr. Dillon? It's probably Clem Bates. They'd have to have him. The vault's locked at night. All right, around the corner now. Mm. They may be watching from the front windows. The Thompson brothers... I wouldn't never have figured him for a bank holder. Yeah, well. All right, we'll leave the horses here. Slip back to the side address. Yeah. Ho, ho. Well, what about that moonlight now, Chester? Well, I guess it's bright enough a man could... A man could do a fair job of shooting tonight. Sign of life, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. They're in there, though. Side door's open. Mm -hmm. Maybe one other sort of kind. I came from the door. Come on, Justin. All right, get fight against the wall. They'll have to show themselves to fire at us. Say, Mr. Dillon, I think they shut that door. Yeah. Let's move in easy. Here, sir. It's shut all right. I'm going to try the door. If it opens, flip a couple of shots in. Yes, sir. bolded. All right, cover me, Chester. Here it goes. I think I hear him running inside. Yeah, one more. They crashed out through the front window, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, come on. Oh, there's Clem on the floor. They must have laid him out. Easy, Chester. They may be waiting outside for us. There they go. They're making a run for it. Yeah, come on. Let's get out through this window. Mr. Dillon? Uh, Mr. Dillon? It's all right, Chester. Uh, Nick's a rib, I think. I'm, I'm all right, though. I thought for a minute there that they'd... Yeah, yeah, I know. Looks like one of them stayed behind. That shot came from the corner of the livery stable over there. Maybe I can... What's the matter, Dillon? You're supposed to be good. It's Houston, all right. He's back at that old stone well. Yeah. Stay here and keep him pinned down, Chester. I'm going up on the roof through the trap door back here. All right, Mr. Dillon. Watch yourself. Yeah. Throw a shot or two at him. Keep him busy, huh? Yes. You got to do better than that, Dillon. I will, Houston. Don't worry about that. Now, if I can just get 
this open with a... There. Now... South corner there. And I put me right over him. And then I. Wait a minute. Moonlight night and a bank. So that's who they are. Houston! Dylan, where are you? Up here. You're under arrest. Drop your gun. I'll drop it. Last chance, Houston. Your last chance. All right, then. So long, gunslinger. I reckon that did it, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Moonlight's real bright up here, Chester. All right, Chester, I'm coming down. You froze. I don't... No, no, no. Mr. Bates is coming, too, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's not bad off. They must have slapped him with a gun barrel on the way out. Clem. Clem. Clem, can you hear me? Matt... Who, who am I thank you? Uh, Chester, get that chair over there. Yes. Here you are. All right, give me a hand with it. Easy, girl. Come on, Mr. Bates. There you are. Now, what happened, Clem? Are they trying to make you open the vault? That's right. It was those Thompson brothers, man. Yeah, I know. They fooled me plenty. Thought they were fine fellas. I've been drinking with them all evening. Well, you never know, Clem. They get away with anything? No. I was about to give in and open the vault when you rode by. That got him kind of upset. Well, there's no harm done then. Houston Jack was long overdue for killing. We gonna go after the Thompsons, Mr. Dillon? Where, Chester? They could have gone in any one of a dozen directions. There'd be no chance of trying to track them till morning. Somehow, I don't think we'll get them even then. I think I ought to get something done about this head of mine, Matt. It's... It's giving me fits. Yeah, I'll go with you, Clem. I got to tell the doc about Houston. Chester, I guess you better go over to the depot and wake up Mr. Hightower. Have him put a wanted bulletin on the wire. For the Thompson brothers, huh? No, Chester. I've recognized them finally. Their name isn't Thompson. Well, what name do I put in the bulletin, Mr. Dillon? Just say, wanted for attempted bank robbery in Dodge City, Frank and Jesse James. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Vic Perrin, with Paul Dubov, Joe Duvall, and Lou Krugman. Parley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Sundays in the daytime, CBS Radio brings you a unique series of political debates, a program called Pick the Winner, on which the major parties select their highest authorities to discuss important election issues. Tomorrow on most of these same CBS Radio stations, hear another major election issue debated. Here, Pick the Winner. And don't forget, to make the full use of what these programs tell you, register so you may vote this fall. 
This is Roy Rowan speaking. Remember, every Sunday we extend a cordial invitation to great music on the CBS radio network. Thank you.